Hooray! All right. Does anybody here speak Finnish? Does anybody here speak Finnish? Because I could use some help with, with the following song. Um, we, we, have, we have lyrics. I'm going to pass around. There's not enough for everybody, so take a couple and, and share, like, two or, two or three persons to, like, some lyrics. Take the lyrics. Here's a lyrics for you. Whoop, wrong one. There we go. You want to sing with us, Tim? I'm trolling, though. Okay, let's go. Happy Groundhog's Day. Does everyone have their lyrics? The one and only Tim. <laughs> <laughs> you break it, you bought it. <clears throat> All right, so. Good morning, uh, Thursday. I think we'll get the slides up at some point. <laughs> uh, unless everybody wants to turn around and gather around the screen in the back. So we're going to talk about time series concepts, uh, day four of Super Week. I do have two kind of not related at all to this topic uh, things that I want to hit on. In the interest of time, I'm just going to hit on the one that I personally is kind of the most important to me. Um, and then I hope I get time to kind of slip in the other one at the end. So before we dive into the, the main topic of the, the day, for a lot of you know and were involved in last year when about this time at Super Week, I was beginning to kind of plan, contemplate a trip with my oldest son to travel around parts of Europe for a couple of months this past summer. And this was a great crowd to tap into with sort of tips and ideas. Um, I'm not saying I was planning it. My son was planning it. I was really just a data collection device, so anytime somebody gave me a tip, I would pass it along to him. Um, 
the, the last thing I wanted to do was get tips on traveling around Europe from Americans, um, because, yeah, because I, I know how that will go, that it's like the one place they went to. You gotta go there, it was amazing. So, uh, the Super Week community came through in a way that, like, wildly beyond my, my, my best possible dreams. So, uh, looking back on where we went, it would have been a fantastic trip. My son is amazing, we had a great time. It would have been great even without the Super Week crowd. It literally was probably 40% uh, enhanced for a number of reasons. And it was the generosity really of this community, the analytics community, the Super Week community in particular. Um, I was looking for tips. Instead, we wound up with like multiple time tour guide uh, hosting at his flat for a uh, wine tasting, extending our stay in Lyon with Simone. Uh, Lucas, like, met up with us, went on a hike, we had dinner, then he went and took a business trip, then he came back and met us with us again. So that was amazing. Uh, Magic, I got to see, he's not here this year, but I've gotten to know him through Super Week. Uh, Fosca, uh, turned out she met up with us in Bologna. Um, and all of these, you should be nervous if you're a parent saying, I'm on a trip with your, my, my child and I'm going to introduce them to people I know through work. That sounds like the most crappy dad move ever <laughs> to pull. And my son's girlfriend was with us. She came for 10 days. She stayed for three weeks. So uh, Simone and uh, Lucas both got to meet Lucy as well. And I kept coming back into the room uh, after like Lucas and I had gone out. He was, had kept his bike in the flat and was leaving. And I came back and I came around the corner and they were, it's like they stopped talking. And I was like, what, what did I miss? And my son kind of sheepishly, he said, Lucy wants to know, how do you know these people again? Because they're so generous, they're so fun, they're so interesting, and I don't think, I've gotta be in a tiny, tiny percentage of people who get to have an experience like that. Um, even, there were a few people, Robert and Julian, both uh, for parts of France and, and Croatia, gave some great tips, so they were kind of instrumental as well, even though they both made sure that they were not around uh, when we were actually there so I didn't get to see them. So that to me, I mean, I'd never planned that. When, when I left Search Discovery, my last day of work, I was talking to my manager, Super Week came up, and she said, I made some comment about going and talking to analysts. She was like, Tim, these are just your people. And I was like, okay, you, you know me, you're my manager. And uh, you guys really are. So for all of you, if this is your first time, if you've been before and you're making uh, connections and thinking these are like neat people, is this just like the weirdness of being kind of isolated somewhere? Uh, no, these are, we're fantastic people. So thank you, Zoe. I never would have known this sort of thing would have come out of, uh, of my Super Week connections. It had nothing to do with analytics, but it was amazing. So thank you. So that probably further blew my uh, timing on this session, but I I just feel it's important to say. So now on to the exciting topic of time series, uh, time series analysis. So let's kind of think about time. We live it, we are in the moment. Uh, we, we process time, it is so built into what we do that you know this presentation, you know in your mind, you have a mental filed away, this should be about 40 minutes. You are at Super Week. You know that Super Week, it's five days. We shift units of time very, very smoothly, very, very fluidly. The job that I just left, I was at that job for five years. We all can kind of internalize what does that mean? Almost for everything. I mean, there are some things like Yehoshua's intros, when you say how long do those last, they sort of feel <laughs> infinite, time stands still. But uh, for the most part, we're very, very comfortable with time. And that actually makes it kind of tricky. It's is, is digital analysts, it is almost all of our data has time as this really, really, really key component to it. So we think we just get time. And I remember at some point in my analytics career, I actually realized, oh, wait a minute, there are all these other data sets out there that yeah, they have timestamps here and there, but time is not as integral to the data as it is when we're looking at behavioral data. So, when we talk about time, we think of a line chart. So what is the best practice data visualization recommendation? If you're visualizing time series data, it should be in a line, line chart, unless there's some specific reason not to have it as such. The thing is, um, it rarely 
looks quite like this. We're all thinking like, yeah, if our data was just kind of this flat little noisy thing, it would probably be pretty easy to uh, analyze. So in digital analytics, often, depends on the organization, but I feel like more websites than not have this like weekly cycle, dips on the weekend, good for humanity. They're getting out and staying off the digital world with, on the weekends. And a lot of times it has a trend to it. And the trends can be much messier than this. It'll go up and down over time, plus we have anomalies, plus we're trying to change the metrics. So we're trying to make the metrics move. So the data gets a lot messier. So if you're starting to think, is this whole presentation gonna be a bunch of line charts? Um, yep, it is. <laughs> um, so, so it goes. So that's the time element. But on the other side, we want to have statistical rigor. And so how do we combine statistics with time? And if we think about the definition of statistics or a definition of what is kind of statistics or statistic, statistical inference, it's fundamentally about trying to make estimates or inferences about a population from a sample. And I think this definition has gotten this industry into a lot of trouble because we've thought, oh, well, we have the population. When digital came out the, the, for years and even still, hey, guess what? We're tracking everything. We have every interaction for every user tracked. So we don't need to estimate the population. We have the population. A little commentary about all of the hand wringing around privacy and how do we hang on to as much data as possible, I think arguably is nested in the fact that that's because we just have a deeply held belief that we have to have all the data. We have to have the population because that's how we do our jobs. And now we're starting to find out that that can be kind of tricky when having all the data causes a lot of problems uh, to try to actually maintain it. So let's think about the population in the context of time. So we experience time all the time. So this, this, is a, this is a timeline. We know that there's the past, there's the present, and there's the future. So when we're looking at data that is time series data, what is the population? And if we take the definition of, well, we've been tracking all of that data from the past, so that's our population, right? Maybe. Uh, but if we're just looking at the past, then don't we really care about the future? How can we affect the future? So, so maybe the population, the true population, should actually also include the future. We don't have that data, but that may be the population that we're trying to make inferences about. It may be that from a decision-making perspective, that's the only population we care about. We can't make, do anything about the past, so we can just use that data, but we really care about the population of the future. I actually don't have the answers to what the population is. It probably is situational. If somebody has a, look, this is the way to think about population in the context of time series data, please share it with me afterwards, because I've grappled with this for about four years now. Regardless of what our population is, uh, the sample, we can't sample from what, you know, our sample, we can't sample from the future. There is no data existing yet. So what is our sample? Well, our sample is actually a little bit easier because 99% of the time, our sample is some finite point in the past to now. It could be just yesterday, it could be last week, it could be the last month, the last year, but that's our sample. So that's definitely not our population, I don't think. So if we think about a sample to a population, ideally, if we had something, if we wanted to know for some reason how many Hungarians like broccoli, then if we designed a study and said we are going to do a random sample, we're not gonna go ask every Hungarian, but if we went and do a random sample of Hungarians and asked them, then we can use that sample to estimate the population with some degree of uncertainty. But our sample is not a random sample. It's kind of the convenient sample, and it's kind of the best sample that we have. And it's fairly representative. If I said I wanted to use this sample to uh, make inferences, if I took last week's data and I wanted to use that to make an estimate about next week, assuming there's not some major external, external, externality or me rolling out a campaign or some other factor, I'd probably be okay. But if I tried to use last week's data to make an estimate for a week that's three years from now, we know that that's silly, because the farther we go into the future, the more things have changed. So now you're alarmed that I'm just gonna kinda navel gaze and try to think big thoughts about time. 
And I'm kind of done with it for now, but hopefully if that, any of that resonates, you're thinking, okay, wait a minute, there is something to this time. There is complexity, and it does mean that if we're using an imperfect sample, we probably need to be really careful with what it is we're actually doing with that data and how we're actually using it. And it's a complicated topic. If you look at advanced degree programs in business analytics or statistics or data science, there is typically an entire course that is required on time series analysis, advanced college level course on time series analysis. It is rarely in the first year of the program. It is kind of an advanced topic. So we clearly can't cover all of that. I'm not, I'm not actually qualified to cover it. So we're gonna hit just a couple of specific topics. The first one is gonna be stationarity, which when I pitched this topic to Zoli, I didn't think there was any Matt Gershoff involved in this. When I started developing the content, I thought, yeah, I, don't, I, I usually wind up referring to Matt Gershoff, but it's not like a thing that I have to do. Then, son of a bitch, if I didn't start working on the content, and I was like, okay, think back, how did you learn about stationarity and why it matters and where is it important? And I was like, God, it was a conversation with Matt Gershoff. So I don't remember the total specifics. I remember a little part of it where I said, well, I'm trying to do this. And he said, well, yeah, 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 because that time series data is not stationary. And I was like, huh, huh, Matt with his big words again. But I thought I can, I, can, I can parse that one out from context. That we think about time, there's kind of movement of time to the past, to the present, to the future. So it's, the data is kind of moving. So I was like, I, I got this one. Figured it out from context clues. And I played that back to him. And he was like, no, that's not it. Tried to explain a little bit more. I didn't quite get it, but from future, kind of as tends to happen with Matt, he plants the seed and then it kind of grows and you start noticing it. So non-stationarity is a really actually important topic. So kind of A, this, this definition, which seems pretty good, a little, little wordy, but it's a, statistic, it's, a, it's a time series where the statistical properties do not depend on the time at which the series was observed. So what does that actually mean? Well. You can actually start recognizing non-stationary data pretty easily. There are three characteristics that can uh, break stationarity. We're only gonna hit two of them. The first is that if it has a varying mean. So what does that mean? It really means the data is trending up or down or up and then down. Because if you think about it, if you just picked an arbitrary window on this data set and uh, calculated the mean, you'd get one mean. And if you picked another arbitrary time period, you'd get a different mean, they're different. So, a varying mean means the data is trending. The other is it can have a varying variance. This is kind of an extreme example, but we've seen this in our data too, and we tend to think like, well, that's a little odd. Um, what's going on with that data? The same idea, if you take one arbitrary time period, have some measure of variance, variance, standard deviation, whatever, and you use the same measure in a different arbitrary time period, then you'll get a different measure. And those varying things, we're starting to use statistics, statistical uh, measures, and if they're varying in time series data, that should give us a little cause for alarm, or at least caution, that we need to sort of proceed with caution. So if we go back to this first chart we looked at, this is a stationary time series. If you kind of grab the window at any point, it's gonna have roughly the same mean and roughly the same uh, variance. What about our weekly cycle? Is that stationary or non-stationary? And this was, I thought, well, that seems non-stationary because it's clearly varying. But this is actually a stationary time series. Assuming you're picking a, a large enough arbitrary window, the, the mean, you know, if it encompasses the same number of kind of weekends and weekdays, the mean is gonna stay roughly constant and the variance, even though there's high variability, it's going to stay roughly the same across different windows. So it's a little tricky but once you kind of internalize what it means, you can look at a data set, this is why we like to visualize the data, and say, do I have a stationary data set? If so, proceed with caution. What do I need to do about that? So, with that, my favorite uh, kind of stationarity trick, and I didn't come at this, I didn't learn this because as a, this is a stationarity thing, it was only later after I'd learned first differences and read more about it, I was like, oh, stationarity comes into play with this. And it's pretty cool. Quick show of hands, how many people are like, familiar with first differences? Okay, this is what I kind of was hoping for. Every hand didn't go up. I did a sample of one last night with uh, Simone Breton, and I felt, felt pretty good. He wrecked my confidence on a later topic, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, 
So first difference is a really, really simple idea. And it actually deals with stationarity in a, in a way. So if we look at this data set, or these two metrics, and this is kind of based on a real example, just simplified, and we've got the, a marketer has come to us and said, look, we have a, a measure where we just have a macro measure of social media engagements with our brand, and we also separately in our digital analytics data, we have a measure of orders. And it looks like they, they're, they're moving together. These look to be correlated. And I know correlation is not causation, but hey, Tim, uh, I just want to run this by the analyst. This seems like an easy one. It's a quick question. Are these correlated? And I look at it and say, they look correlated to me, but if I'm checking correlation, uh, I really sort of prefer a scatter plot. So let me take that data set and make it a scatter plot. Same data, each point is a day. It's the exact same data. And I'm like, yeah, visually, clearly this looks, uh, these are correlated. Uh, but I want to I want to play the role of an analyst, so let me let me quantify it a little bit. Let me go ahead and throw the R squared on there, and I can explain like 0.84. That's yeah, that's a pretty strong correlation. It matches the visual. So yeah, they seem like they're correlated, right? And I, the, the me, a, a younger, earlier me, has uh, has said yes, and I'm now a little embarrassed. I might have been right, might not have been right. Don't still have those data sets. Because the me of now would say, well, maybe. Or I would say, guess what? Dolly 2 does not handle uh, specific word prompts into a cloud. So the closest I could get to maybe was may. <laughs> so I was pretty excited that, that in the first day or two, there were people pulling chat GPT into their, into their sessions. Actually, the first one that it happened in, I was sitting next to John Lovett. I was like, yeah, how many people are going to use chat GPT in their presentations? He's like, well, I am. I was like, oh, okay. But I was like, ha no one's using Dolly 2. And then Vlad and Lucas and uh, David kind of wrecked that for me yesterday. And I think they did a better job of it. But um, this is the conference where we're going to use generative AI in our, in our presentations. So that may be, why maybe? It seemed like it's such a clear story. But if they're actually correlated, then it doesn't just mean, it's a subtle difference, it just doesn't mean when one is high, the other one is likely to be high, and when one is low, the other is likely to be low. If they're correlated, then it could also be implying that when one moves up, the other one moves up. So when one goes up, the other one goes up. When one goes down, the other one goes down. That should happen in general, not perfectly. We're not expecting perfect correlation. So we could look at that as well. And that's where first differences comes in. It's actually looking at the change from point to point. And we're only gonna have one table that we're gonna look at. But calculating first differences is super, super easy. You might have already figured out how the math works. We basically, just to show one example, we're gonna take the 21st to the 22nd. We have two values. To calculate the first difference for December 22nd, we just subtract the value of December 21st from December 22nd, that is the difference. That is the change that occurred to get me to this point. So simple spreadsheet math. Like so simple, you're like, is that it? Yep, that's it. But let's look at what happened to that data with that change. So if we go back and we're just looking at orders, we're gonna come back and add the other metric in here in a second. But this was just our orders data that was trending upward. If we plot that second column, the uh, first difference column, it's, it looks like this. The, the scale is a lot smaller, um, but now we have actually a stationary data set. So this is not that doing first differences is, will always make your data that's non-stationary stationary. It is not first differences is the only way to make non-stationary data stationary, but that's kind of what's happening. And if you, if you think, if you look really closely and said, what's the mean of that stationary data set? It's gonna be a little bit above zero because the data is trending upwards. So now I have a stationary data set. And if I go back to my, my data, I can calculate that first difference for both metrics. And this is really trying to say, are they actually moving together? Not just when one's high, is the other one high? So if instead I make a scatter plot with those columns, the first differences, everybody sort of think, what do you think that scatter plot is going to look like? It looks like this, which now, not so sure that it was correlated. 
I can throw an R squared on this, uh, and it's actually zero. That will not always happen. That's the reason you do this operation. I have gone through and done first differences, and I still wind up with an R squared that says, yeah, there is some relationship here. This is an example, though, where the data really looked visually to me like they were correlated. But then when I applied this, I had to say, well, wait a minute. Let me think about what's really happening with that data. And, and, it, and it depends on what you're expecting is kind of the response. Uh, and I, I know we're using kind of lagging. You might use a lag function to do this for first differences. This is not about like lagging indicators and leading indicators. You have to think a little bit harder about it that that's, that's not what this is. You can do second differences, so you can kind of skip a level, or third differences, but first differences is kind of the, the core of what we usually work with. And the interpretation is that they're both moving with time, but they're not really moving with each other in this scenario. If you're familiar with, it's been around for over a decade, Tyler Viggins Spurious Correlations site, you know, the ice cream and drownings. Once you kind of internalize this idea, you can start looking at those correlations, and a lot of them, not all of them by any means, but a lot of them you'd say, aha, a first difference would actually um, undo the apparent correlation of this. And then you look at other ones and say, oh, first differences, I think this would still have some correlation. So what's going on with that spurious correlation? I think it's pretty cool. Like, I've, once I discovered it, we almost kind of went to a client and gave them a completely wrong answer when uh, our head of data science was like, you might want to run first differences on that. And we said, I'll get back to you as soon as I Google first differences. Uh, no, he actually explained to us how to do it. And I was like, well, that's super easy. I feel horrible that we didn't know about that. But then you start poking around. It is kind of, you have to be kind of deep into much, much more complicated topics when it talks about differencing. But it's pretty easy to check and can kind of make you think about the time piece of the data. So now we're going to shift gears. This is, uh, this is where Simone gave me uh, a little bit of a heart palpitation last night. So I'm racked with uh, self-doubt on this because I actually talked about this next topic five years ago. And I thought, look, I saw the show of hands of who the first time attendees were. It's like half the people. And literally, I will be the only person who remembers anything that I talked about five years ago. And Simone was like, didn't you talk about that five years ago? I'm like, son of a. So there are at least two of us. So I apologize if you uh, remember this. We're going to talk about decomposition. <laughs> Fun fact, Dolly 2 does have some content uh, moderation built into it. Uh, if you try a prompt that includes the word gruesome, uh, it will say, nope, I don't know what you're up to, buddy, but I am not going to generate that. So I went through an alarming number of prompts to try to get decomposing puppies and then realized <laughs> that maybe something with flowers in it was probably OK. So we're not talking about decomposing organic beings. Of course, we're talking about time series decomposition, which um, is just a really, really cool idea. And I hope there are people here in the room who are like, yeah, I know what that is. But it's really uh, another way to kind of think about time and have the intuition of our brain match up with what we're actually seeing in the data and use statistical concepts. So if we take this data series, and we say, I would like to describe that with some basic statistics. Can you give me summary numbers about this? So I could calculate the mean. And that doesn't feel right, because why is it lower below the mean at one point and higher above the mean later? It's like, can't it just like tilt the mean? That's what we want to do. If we could just tilt that line, we'd be in better shape. And that's the right intuition. That's the right instinct. We're going to talk about how we actually do that. And then we said, well, and how variable is the data? And I may do the same thing and say, well, let me just calculate, I don't know, standard deviation, do plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviations. And that feels weird, because the fact is, if I asked anyone in this room, gave you just the data set, and said, can you project out for another couple of weeks um, what you think the data is going to look like, you'd think, well, I would know to draw a couple more kind of oscillating values. So this doesn't feel right that this is the representation, the summary of what's going on with this data. And time series decomposition kind of takes that intuition that, that that's not right and says, how do we actually formalize what we're doing with it? So what we do with decomposing a time series, and there are, there are multiple different techniques and there are little subtle ways to tweak it here and there, but they all fundamentally say you take the time series and you break it down into three buckets. So we're going to take our time series, that's the same time series, that's our original time series, 
The first thing we're going to do is say this has that weekly cycle to it. And in statistical terms, that's, that's a form of seasonality. It's a weekly season. So we say let's pick out and figure out what recurring seven values are most capturing that data. So this looks kind of similar, but it's actually the exact same seven values. Every seventh value is exactly the same on this series, and that's our seasonal component. We take that, we subtract it out from the original, and we have the data that's left. And for that data that's left, we say, let's kind of apply some smoothing to it. And there are different techniques. You can do just a moving average. You can do exponential smoothing. There are various techniques for smoothing it. And you get what's called the trend component. And this is a simple, it's just going up. But that, that means even if the data was going up and then kind of down and then up, this smoothing, it's still called trend. So it's not trend like a straight line trend necessarily. In this case, it is. And we take those values and subtract them out from our original. And what we have left is what's left, formally called random, or noise, or error, depending on how you're looking at it. So now if I take any given day and I add up those three bottom components, it's going to total what's in my top chart. Why would we do that? Well, conceptually, I started thinking about those top two components as being kind of like a smarter mean. It's basically the mean because it's kind of a set way that we're describing the data just in more of kind of a lightly modeled form as opposed to a single number, which means that it's the, the what's left component is really our variance. So if we go back to our original chart, and remember when we said just a mean with some basic uh, calculation of standard deviation, it felt wrong. But if we take that time series decomposition and we take those first two components, seasonality and trend, and overlay those, yeah, that's, I mean, this is a pretty clean, a pretty stable data set. So our mean runs pretty close to being right on top of the actual values. And if I said, what's the actual variability around it? Well, I take the what's left component and do a calculation of variability and make that as kind of my little bands. And now I've got something that feels much, much better. So you can imagine if I'm trying to find anomalies or if I'm trying to model the data and do some sort of forecast, this gives me a much, much tighter thing to work with than just saying, yeah, we think that next week you're, you're, we estimate just whatever the overall average is. I can get to a much, much more detailed level. So I love me some time series decomposition. Show of hands, how many people like totally remember me specifically talking through this topic five years ago? Simone? Two, three, four, okay, okay. That's good, okay, I don't feel too bad. Everybody who raised their hand, I don't mind wasting your time. Uh, <laughs> you were due for a refresher. Um, okay, it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, and, and various, any, any statistical sort of platform can do that. Time series decomposition, super common, lots of, lots of resources out there to kind of understand the what and the how of it. This is going to be a little bit of a leap, but I'm going to say that idea of trying to kind of get a tighter model of time series data, it's, it's kind of a, let's take that one step farther with a different technique. So we're going to introduce the B word, Bayesian, um, which I am not equipped to fully talk about Bayesian things. I know two things about when you're doing things Bayesian. You, you're supposed to say, ah, priors. And then the other thing you're supposed to say, ah, Bayesian, so there's no p-value. Unfortunately, we're going to talk about a p-value in this, and I can't fully understand uh, what's going on. But we're going to talk about Bayesian structural time series, which are also pretty cool, not remotely new, but I've started thinking of them as kind of time series decomposition turned up to 11. If you guys weren't hanging with Johnny Five yesterday, I don't know that a, this is Spinal Tap reference is going to get you, but that is a kick-ass Dolly 2 representation that Christopher guessed right there. And for the four of you who actually get that, you're old. Um, so, but this has also been around for a while. As a matter of fact, Mark Edmondson, back in seven years ago, stood up GA Effect. And it was a shiny app that you could log into your, your universal analytics, and it would apply this exact technique to your data. And I saw this, and I was like, that looks fancy. I don't understand it. And then over time, slowly, I started to understand what was going on. Really, it's only been in the last year that I've actually been using this technique, not this tool, 
uh, I, don't, I suspect he's not updating it for GA4, but it's been around for a, for a good long while, and it's actually pretty, uh, really powerful. And what it's doing is it is best used to kind of estimate the impact of an intervention. So we're gonna use the term intervention, which starts to sound a little bit like statistical speak, but an intervention is just, I did something. I redesigned the landing page. I rolled out a campaign. Um, I, I did something in the, with the intention of actually impacting a metric. I added a consent banner to the form. We actually, you, that's a very specific example of where we used it. And I wanna estimate the impact of it. So where does this happen? The most common in my experience is when the product team or the marketer says, we wanna know the impact of this thing and we didn't run it as an experiment. Maybe because it didn't occur to them, maybe because they didn't want to, maybe because it just wasn't worth the investment, but they say, I still wanna know what the impact of this thing was. So can't you just do a pre-post analysis? I will claim that most marketers, when they ask, hey, can you do a pre-post analysis? In their head, this is what the data looks like. It was super stable, and then we did this thing, and there was a big step function. And you can just pick, you know, pick a week or two before, a week or two after, do the average, and you're all set. We're analysts, so we know, well, get over yourself. The intervention was probably a lot smaller. Um, but I could, still, I could still work with that. But I hate to tell you, but the data is a lot noisier. So it's going to vary based on when I pick. Do I pick one week or two weeks? I could, I could pick all of these. I could pick one week and two weeks and one month before and after and then average them together. Like, oh, this gets messy. That's again, our brain and our intuition being on the right track, but we can actually use specific tools and techniques for doing this. Oh shoot, I forgot, we also have the, the little cyclicality to it. It starts getting kind of hard to you say, if I looked at that without that vertical line saying when the intervention was, would I really have suspected that there had been an intervention? And this is where kind of modeling the data ahead of time um, can actually be kind of useful to, to pull into this. So, that's what causal impact is the R package that uses, you didn't think I was gonna get through this without talking about R. Uh, causal impact is a package that uses Bayesian structural time series to kind of compare the historical data to model a counterfactual and then you compare the result to the counterfactual. So we'll run through this pretty quickly. We start with the, Robert, you're supposed to be waving at me, I'm on the wrong side of the stage right now. So, okay, back over here. Also getting my steps in, Robert's sitting still, so that step challenge is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm catching up with him. So we start with our data, we just ignore everything after the intervention. And we use this Bayesian structural time series technique, which kind of runs simulations. If this looks very similar to the time series decomposition mean, conceptually, intuitively it is. It's taking a completely different approach, but it is building a model and saying, how can I model what that data looks like? And oh, I've got a model, so bonus, I also get a measure of the variability. How, how good, how tight is that model? So that's great. Now I can take that and I can extend that out into the future. So I'm modeling the future. I'm saying, what do I think would have happened if we hadn't had the intervention? So I'm estimating the counterfactual. Then I go back and take my actual data and overlay it and we can kind of look at it and say, well, yeah, the, the time those data points are falling outside of that confidence band, it's happening more than I would expect. So I think I am seeing an effect, but uh, it turns out that this is, this is tough. It's matching our intuition that, that it's, it's not a huge effect necessarily, but we can start to actually think about what that effect is. There's another way to look at it, which if that's a little bit hard to interpret, what if instead we took that mean, our estimated line, and said let's make that a baseline and then just compare that to the difference, like what the actual values were. And this one's a tougher one uh, to kind of get to, but it's, it's sort of, it makes sense when you think about it a little bit. So that's the same dotted line, I've just made it zero, and then I've just looked at the difference between the dotted line and the orange line, and it looks like this. And so now I can start to say, okay, yeah, it does, look like I'm seeing the intervention. Um, I'm seeing the, the effect of the intervention. And then, for reasons I don't fully understand, we typically take that confidence and we air, uh, band and we put it around the actual instead of around the, the model. I don't fully understand why. I don't think it actually matters. But you start to get a sense. It's the same thing, telling you the story of how, how much above and kind of with what confidence. Then we actually do get measures that actually quantify 
Like, what does that actually look like? Well, we get this thing called a posterior tail probability P. Shit, it's Bayesian. And there are discussion threads saying, I thought Bayesian didn't have P values. And kind of the, my understanding of the response is like, well, it's not really a p-value, but it kind of is a p-value and kind of interpret it like a p-value. So if it's a really small number and you have that, yeah, this, this Bayesian structural time series is saying that, yeah, it does look like we're seeing a, an effect in this longitudinal data analysis. And it can even get to both telling you this is kind of the effect that we're estimating and here's kind of the confidence around that. So you can go back to the marketer and say, we think kind of this is the effect plus or minus this. And they may say, well, that seems like a really, really wide range. And then you say, well, let me talk to you about Bayesian structural time series. No, don't do that. But we do want marketers and business users to start have some, having some intuition around uncertainty and the scale of uncertainty. So I think that's actually a good thing. There's actually more with this technique. So we could do all of that really with time series decomposition with some other uh, techniques. Um, even this next thing we could do with that. So there are lots of techniques for for taking this basic approach, but we can actually introduce covariates. And covariates can be really, really useful very quickly. Um, there's sort of two characteristics of a covariate in this context that are really important. The first is that the covariate, the one or more covariates we use have a stable relationship with the metric of interest, <laughs> meaning they have some like valid correlation, basically, of some amount. And the second, which is really critical, that we do not expect the covariate to be impacted by the intervention. As an example, we redesign the PDP and we expect that to increase, improve the conversion rate. So really we expect that to increase the number of orders. Great. Um, we do this whole thing and we get an estimate of we redesigned it, what did it look like? We can make the model tighter, potentially, because we know our business, sometimes traffic is up here, sometimes it's down here, sometimes it goes back up. So if we just look at orders, there's, we're not accounting for the fact that the raw volume of traffic to the website. So we could use sessions as a covariate and say, does that tighten up the model? Does that make the model better and that confidence band narrower? Because we wouldn't expect a redesign of the PDP to impact the actual volume of traffic to the website. And this doesn't have to stay within in our digital analytics data. We've done this where we've looked at like external factors of like what is demand? What are new home starts? And I wanna use that as a covariate when looking at the impact of SEO on a website that builds new homes. So it's, it's another like really cool thing. You can go way down in the weeds um, with this and you gotta be careful. It's, it's not a silver bullet. It's not the, that's always the tendency with the new technique that becomes our hammer and everything looks like a nail. And you can get into trouble if you uh, apply this and say, I found something that looks amazing. It's like, well, maybe you didn't do it quite right. Uh, it's not the silver bullet to, uh, to, to solve all time series issues. So quick review. We talked about population. Maybe had you think about what is, what is actually, what is the population, but hopefully I convinced you that the sample has some weaknesses to it, and that means we need to proceed with caution when we're working with the sample. We talked about stationarity, uh, which constant mean, constant variance, and constant covariance, but we didn't really talk about that. We went through first differences, which is don't jump to correlations. There's some clever wordplay right there. And went through time series decomposition, which was a, a review for five people, but maybe it was uh, well, I'm sure others of you knew about it. You just hadn't heard about it from me. Um, and then we talked about uh, Bayesian structural uh, time series there. So really the big conclusion is time's important, but it's also hard. And I'm hoping you came out of this saying, huh, I think I have a slightly deeper understanding of time and I might actually wanna try a technique or two. I'm gonna give one recommendation um, and this, uh, this deck, there's the short URL. This book, Forecasting Principles, uh, actually has enormous, it's a free, you can get it free online as an ebook. So uh, it's, a, it's a great resource, goes into ARIMA, goes much deeper into differencing. Um, I don't think it actually covers Bayesian structural time series, but it's a great book. Um, I'd love to connect with you as well. I, I have a podcast, I'm watching, where's, where's Rick? Where's, where's Simo, Juliana, all you other, 
you just keep it clean on your podcast because we want to stay the top. We can, we can own that explicit analytics podcast. Do whatever you want, but I'm watching you. So that's all I have. I have one more thing. Can I have two minutes to talk about that? And then you can come back and say we don't have time for questions. Sure. You've been so well behaved. Yeah, I, I'm speechless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So one other thing, uh, if you're... live at the studio with Superweek TV. And in this segment, we are gonna talk about analytics, implementations, project management, basically getting the job done, defining what the job is and what that means, and really just going through and, and sharing some of our stories and experiences with this area here. And so I'm joined in the, in the studio with Monica from Incubita and Fred Pike from uh, Northwood Software. And so thank you so much for joining me. And let's talk about this. So this, this is a good one because I had an idea of how I was going to go here. And, and actually, there are some good clarifying questions as to what is implementation? What does it mean? Because it could mean the world. Yeah. It could mean everything that you do. And it could mean a very small part. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. And let's just talk about the idea of implementing. Um, is there a difference between implementing a broad strategy versus implementing a tool? And what has it been, what's been your experience in this space? In this area? Okay, so that's a very loaded question. <laughs> yeah. um, implementing a broad strategy has just so many components to it that, I mean, it's starting with defining the strategy and then talking with the stakeholders and there, there's just very many components to it. So I think that implementing a tool is something that I am more comfortable with mm -hmm. and um, I normally go about it. It definitely starts with the strategy um, but uh, then it goes through the selection uh, process of the actual tool. Um, and when it comes to actually once you picked a tool, uh, then um, the strategy is to obviously do a bespoke implementation mostly for the client if they're not, um, if they're not 
at scale, if they don't have 10,000 websites, then you'd normally go through a bespoke implementation for the client. So <laughs> I don't know if that actually answers your question. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, and, and I think it's a good distinction because, you know, there's, there's people who provide the services and there's clients, right? So there's companies that need this and there's people who provide the services. A lot of times service providers get pulled in at the very end. So a strategy yeah. has been set, a tool may have been selected, and then they look mm -hmm. for the best in class vendor to implement it, right? And so, so would you say that it's that most of the time that you get pulled into something, they've, they've pretty much picked or chosen what yeah. platform they're gonna use and they're saying, hey, we want the best of the best to implement this. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. Is that similar for you, Fred? Do you ever get involved with selection or are you brought in after the tool selected for your expertise? Um, we are involved in the strategy upfront often, but, but there is there's rarely, in terms of the analytics implementation, there is rarely a decision around that. It's Google Analytics. I mean, so we, we don't do Adobe Analytics. Um, I've, I've played a little bit with PeeWeek Pro, but everything we're doing is Google Analytics. So that tool is an easy choice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the choice has been made to a right. certain extent, right. and it's like, okay, how do I implement this effectively. So let's talk about this, the, this idea of implementing effectively then. And I'll start with you, Fred, but um, what if, if somebody chooses you, knowing that you know this product inside out, what do they lean on you to do? Is it to map what their desires are to what the tool is capable of doing? Is it more around, okay, well, these are the pretty standard, these are our things that we always implement, let's do it. Um, how, does that, how does that work to the point where you're, you're giving them the best version that they can be of Google Analytics? Yeah, there's, there's, two, there's two ways we approach that. One is that we do have a standard set of things that we implement. Um, so our best practices, our years of experience with it, we know what we're going in. But that, that really only addresses part of it. I think, I think what's really important is to understand what their needs are. And I, and I really like to start not with the implementation. As I said, we often do the strategy also, but what are we trying to get out of this at the end? What's important to you? What are the metrics that you really care about? Um, and so, so that goes into the whole implementation process as well. And I find it's, it's um, maybe it's just because I'm not a great implementer or something, but I always find it, it takes me like three attempts to really hone in on it. So I'll, I'll, I'll listen to them, I'll implement something, we see the, the data coming through and it's like, oh, you know what? It'd be slightly better if we tweaked it this way. And hopefully we've done that in the, like a QA environment potentially or something. Um, but I think it's rare to 100% get the implementation right from the start. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're not looking at the, at the data that's coming through and making some adjustments to that, I think you're failing as an analyst, actually, or as an implementer, because you, you need to see what that data looks like, how they react to it, and when they go, oh my gosh, I never realized this correlation or whatever, then you dive in a little bit deeper, you might start tracking some other things or adjust the implementation. Yeah, so you, I mean, definitely touching on a lot of different aspects that go into this, right? It's more yeah. than just, you know, for a long time, I think people looked at an implementation purely as code, just yeah. getting, right. getting some code on the site, collecting the data, and that was, that was a really big part of it. That's actually gotten, in some, in my opinion, a little bit easier. Oh yeah, um, and, and the thing yeah. that's difficult is how do you, make sure that what you're collecting is useful and, and more useful to the organization. So, right. yeah, is that, is that a similar experience for you? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. We go through a similar process when we normally come in once the tool's been picked and normally it is Google Analytics, but the way that I like to lead my project is I start with a kickoff workshop. So I get as many stakeholders in the room um, as possible and I get them to ask business questions. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be I need to track this, this button. It's just what questions do you want to answer? And one of the questions is always if you could have anything in the world uh, answer to any of your questions, what are these questions? Mm -hmm. So even those that we won't be able to answer, I just note it down and then my implementation is driven by the answers to these questions. So I always write them down. It's one of the tabs of one of the sheets that I provide to the client. Um, there is the question in one column, there is the answer in the second column, and it's always yes, no, partly. Yep. And then there is the third column has the rationale. So if it's a yes, how we're going to do it. If it's a no, then why we're not going to track it. And if it's a maybe or partly, why maybe, why partly, and how the part is going to be answered. And in this way also, I really like this way of functioning because if they decide, oh, we're not going to implement a bunch of things that you're recommending, I'm saying that's okay, no problem, it's your business decision, 
this is what you're not going to have as a result of mm. not implementing it. Yeah. So this is the way I think about it. And nice. much like you said, then tweaking the implementation and implementation for me is never done. Yeah. It's always a living thing as well. So we're trying to do it in a way that we can easily hand it off to the client. So simplicity needs to be a part of it. Um, the client has to just be able to take it and run with it. If it's too complicated, too many moving components, too many dependencies, then we, I mean, we can do very complex implementation, but the cost to the client of running it, training people on it, if someone leaves and they need to hand it over, that's then high. So we yeah. try to balance the need against the business. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've noticed is that when you do it open-ended like that, what do you want to see and here's the opportunities, do you ever see that things get brought into the mix that are not analytics or like not website analytics? Like, like I want total sales. I want to have this right. in there. Yeah. Um, do, do any of you get pulled into sort of becoming the data hub for a company or do you try to stick it just at the analytics piece? Like if they're, if they're asking you, hey, can you help me pull in all these other things? You know, it's a completely different discipline really to be able to pull data from all these different places. Do you stop there or do you try to give them what, they, what they're looking for? Or does it depend on the size of the client? Yeah, I mean, it would depend on the size of the client. It would depend on the project. It would even depend on the, our relationship. I am I'm generally trying to stick to the scope because mm -hmm. from an agency side, scope yep. creep is yes. definitely <laughs> not yeah. an easy thing to manage. But mm -hmm. I will always be willing to help them and direct them to the right you know, to the right people, to the right departments. I, you know, if I think that client needs to do something internally because it's better for them, I will advise them to do it internally. Most of my clients, I say, you know, it's great that you're taking us, but we shouldn't be your analysts. You yeah. should have an analyst in house who basically asks us for help, we guide them. But, you know, we're never going to be your analyst in house fully as if you had someone working for you. Yeah. So even though it's not necessarily directly, you know, we would earn more money if we were. Yeah. But I think it's not in the interest of most companies that we're working with. There are cases where I think that works, but. Yeah, most yeah, of the yeah time. I think that's a, that's a different and interesting line. And that's actually the next thing I wanted to talk about. And I'll start with you, Fred, but it's really around this idea of what roles go into this whole analytics world, like roles that are at your company, but then also roles on the client side, because this is a big important piece here, is that depending on the sophistication of the client, some of them don't have an in-house data person. Right. They, look at the, they look at the tool or the implementation as a one-off thing. It's like, hey, just make sure this thing works and then we'll figure out what to do with it. But then they never actually use the data. So, so you, we already defined some roles. It's the, the technical tagging, it's the, the project or the getting the project done, making sure you don't go out of scope, and then an analyst. But what other roles are there that, that need to be present in order for this to be successful and, and, and a, a part of an organization? Well, those three roles for sure. I, I mean, I think the um, we often feel like we we are we are supplementing the client staff. So they they may have data analysts, but but we are really providing help to them. And we often are are more knowledgeable, more technical on the things that, that we've implemented than the, the than the client staff. Um, I, I think the. I'm not. I, I'm struggling a little bit. I'm not really sure what other roles there are besides that. But but I think it's it's regardless of what the roles. What we're trying to do is listen to what the client is struggling to achieve, struggling or not struggling, um, and then trying to find the best way to get that yeah. to help them with that. And that can be diving into their ERP system or whatever. And I agree, it's a different it's a different project then because we don't want it to be part of the original implementation. But we, we are not interested in a one-off, one-time integration or implementation. Yeah. You know, we really want that to be the start or the continuing continuation of a relationship. So. Yeah. Excellent. Do you have any, any roles that, that, that we might have missed down there or any of the roles that you see the, that are going on there for an ideal situation? And this can be on the client side, too, like that they're interested mm -hmm. in it, they make it work, or even involving other disciplines that, that benefit from analytics. Yeah, I mean, for me, the the thought that really sparked uh, for me when you asked the question is it's not just um, the roles, but it's the interest that the yeah. client needs to have. Yeah. And something that we've talked so many talks here, it's not just about the implementations, but actually using the data to then drive action. Mm -hmm. So I think 
I find that this is the biggest challenge, working with clients that we're so focused on implementation and getting that right and getting that done, but we sometimes miss like, okay, now you have these business, question ans business questions answered, now you need to drive action. I think that Adam Greco as well at some point mentioned that, um, yeah, it's, it's not even, you could write down not just the questions, but also what actions are you gonna take as a result of the yeah, implementation? Right. Right. That could be a step further as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think there's an aspect of this. It's almost like building a house. <laughs> and I, I just built a house like last year and there's a lot of people involved, a lot of time, a lot of different roles to get there. You know, you have to have somebody frame the house, you have to have put up the walls, put up the outside, inside, finishing touches, like they're all different pieces. And then once you get the house, it's like handed over to you and it's like, how do I use this? Like, how do I do this? Like, you, you know, what do I do in this new place? So you need to take time to, to do it. But also you have a lot more excitement during the building phase than you might once it's done. Sometimes the, the done part has this lull. And so I think that's, yeah, there has to be a, a continuation on this, right? And so yeah. that is one thing where if it's treated as a discrete single project, it's over, well then it's on their thing. But if you add training or some kind of check-ins, then I think that's one, as a service provider, it's an opportunity for additional revenue from the client or to stay with them, but also it, it makes sure they use it. So mm -hmm. it seems like it's not just a one-off thing, right? It, it, it keeps on going. Yeah, it's definitely not a one-off. And, and I mean, Universal Analytics was never a set it and forget it though, even though a lot of people put it up like that. But GA4 in particular is not. There is so many changes coming to it all the time. And, and um, I, I think if, if you're just gonna have it be a set it and forget it, it's, it's not gonna succeed long-term. It really isn't. Well, I mean, it also depends on the size of the business. If you're a person, a one-person business, it's, your needs are going to be very different. I mean, we're probably talking to groups of analysts, so they're working with bigger organizations. But, you know, I have many friends who run their own business. I'm not going to tell them to spend time fixing their analytics yeah. because that's not where the value is for them. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that, too. It sounds like it's small data. <laughs> <laughs> there you I go. coined this, this term a couple of years ago called small data, and it's basically that idea is like based on the size of your company is how, what you get, like what you bring mm -hmm. to the table. And, yeah. and it's not until a little bit later that even you have the luxury of a consultant. Yep. You know, very small right. businesses do not have that luxury of having a consultant, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so it does, it, it, it's varied and, it, and it, it depends on and is based on the, the size of the company and their ambitions. Mm -hmm. And so, but I do think that the ones who leverage data are going to get there faster, right? So yep. if you don't, if you don't have any connection to this, or if you don't use it, then it'll stall the growth yeah. in the first place. Yeah. yeah, it's needed to verify whether your ideas are working. I mean, there's so many companies with such great tactics on social media growth. We've seen so many um, companies like, for example, the contact lens Waldo, they advertise solely on social media. Uh, but you need that data and the checks to then check that this is performing well, that there is no maybe medium that can do better for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because that is an ongoing thing too. I mean, and I had a question, which we sort of already answered a little bit, maybe if you want to add anything to it. It's just the idea of one-time project versus ongoing. And then how does that change based on who you're working with? Like if you're, if you're brought in, I think as if you're brought in as a consultant to do one thing, generally it's over once you do that one thing. But if you can keep on creating recurring value, then you might be able to, to add additional pieces to it. So, um, yeah, so what is one-off versus ongoing? And then does that, is that different when they have an in-house team versus when they're working with agencies exclusively? Have you, have you noticed that, that there's a, you know, do you have ongoing engagements after you yeah. do the big project? And then what, is it just a different scope or is it more of like a, here, here's how you use this thing, and here's how we make sure it doesn't break so that you don't have a huge project two years from now right. from your neglected uh, yeah. analytics tool. We have clients that at various points of the journey, we had clients that we've done the implementation for, and then uh, we helped their internal teams uh, just maintain it, improve it, and it was basically handed over to them and they run with it, and right. we're just there as a, as a consultant to help guide if they have choices to make that they're not sure about. We have clients where um, we've improved their existing implementations. We've had clients that we have done the implementations for, but I don't think we have many that we've done the implementations for and then that was it. Mm -hmm. That was the end of the engagement. Normally there is some relationship. It's normally very scaled down, 
but we're there to help just make sure that this can continue in a good quality yeah. and um, and that they yeah they use the data and when they lack expertise perhaps perhaps in-house we're at hand to help mm -hmm. yeah it's sort of like what you were talking about as well is that you have to you can implement it plan all you want to but then one you have to have see the data come through right to know right. if your implementation is working because no matter yeah. unless you've done it 10,000 times and, and you know that industry like if you're if you only do e-commerce yeah and you only do e-commerce for companies that sell directly to consumer and have between a hundred million dollars and one billion dollars in revenue on Shopify right. and you know yeah, right. and they have these ad channels yeah then you could probably boilerplate it a little bit right um, but they wouldn't really want that because they, they actually the reason why they got to that level is because they don't do anything cookie cutter right so it's, right. it's yeah it's really challenging so there's always something that comes through that you have to take pay attention to yeah and like you we, we are, most of our projects are ongoing so there's implementation then um, ongoing support and, and uh, tweaking where, where I've noticed a couple of instances recently where we've lost that is we had a relationship with a marketing manager or whatever, semi-small company, and that person moves on. And then the new person often has a relationship with another agency or whatever, and it's like, oh, shoot, we spent so much time thinking about the business needs here and implementing it, and uh, now someone else is going to reap the benefits. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and maybe they, they think the strategy is better or, or something along those lines right. too. So, right. all right, we have time for one more question. And I wanted to, this one may, may or may not backfire, but um, <laughs> we, we do KPIs for our clients. You know, we always have like, hey, here's the numbers you're looking for. And that's, that's tied to their strategy. Is there any KPIs around success of a project? Is it around, you know, delivered on time? Is it around, you know, how do you, how do you track that you did this the right way? Is it, is it based on punctuality? Is it based on client, a client survey at the end? But what's a KPI that you did an implementation well? Start with you, Monica. Um, for me, it's how happy the client is. And that norm normally I know because I work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I get feedback. I know how the project is going at different. We have different uh, implementation stages. So there is the, the, KPI, the workshop KPI business questions workshop. Then we have, uh, we submit the data layer implementation document for them to implement the data layer then we configure the tool the data starts flowing so at all these points i communicate with the client so i know um and even my team they communicate with the client i can see the communication i can i know how they feel basically so i don't have hard kpis but them being happy satisfied with the implementation knowing how to use the tool and actually using it to drive decision making yeah. that's yeah Excellent, Fred. Yeah, I, I would agree with Monica's answer. And the 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 strongest KPI I've had to deal with recently was we did a, a bunch of GA4 migrations last year, and we wanted them all done by June 30th, so that we'd have a year-over-year -year comparison. So that was like the hardest KPI that we really had to deal with, just to make. And we we had a lot of migrations that had to get done by then, because we really did want our clients to have the year-over-year. -year. So um, that's probably the hardest one. Um, but the satisfaction and uh, of the client satisfaction is one, obviously. And then the fact that they're actually using it, they're asking questions, they're asking, how do I find this information? Oh, another department has asked about this question. Can you help us dig into the data and answer that question? Um, that, that's a much softer KPI, but it shows that they're using it, they're engaged mm -hmm. with the data, they're using it to drive business decisions or helping other people in the company. So for me, that's a KPI as well. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me and thanks for, for watching along. Really interesting conversation about implementing this stuff, getting it done, what roles are involved and how we can make this an effective way to not just give somebody a tool and an implementation, but how to use it over and over again afterwards. And so hopefully you enjoyed this conversation and I look forward to catching up with you in our next segment. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm first time here, and it looks like everyone is here. So uh, it's definitely um, a good e big event for me. 
uh, to speak to you. Um, I will discuss some trends uh, that are with us already and that will affect digital analytics in coming years. And uh, don't worry, I won't talk at all at, about universal analytics sunset and stuff like that. Um, so uh, yeah, let's, let's get into it. I, I will try to keep it in the time limit because I know that I think the next thing on the agenda is lunch, so <laughs> everyone is looking for that. On my background, I, I have a technical uh, background, so I've been building advertising and marketing technology for the last 15 years. Started on the more advertising side, then went to marketing side and privacy. Um, so I, I've been, you can say, on, on both sides of the, of the wall. Um, and we'll talk about areas like uh, data integration, cookies, uh, data cleanrooms, AI, and how that all will affect um, uh, what, we, what we do and how we do it. Um, but before we, we start with that, I, I thought that we, we should start with something that feels good, because not, not everything that I, I show is good. So uh, let's start with the good stuff. So um, the good thing is that more projects use uh, marketing, analytics, and data to, to make decisions. And that's actually almost 50%. It's probably like 50% less than we would hope for, but uh, as you see, the trend is going up and it's pretty recent because it's from September last year. So uh, more data-driven decision-making, uh, hopefully not more data to ignore, just more uh, decisions made based on the data. And what's maybe more interesting is that there will be more spending on analytics and it's not uh, only like spending on tools, but also the analyst salaries and more people there to actually do the job, which is, which is also a great, um, great news. So um, let's uh, start with the, 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 the actual uh, things that I wanted to talk. First uh, part is about cookies and, and, and in general tracking technologies and what are the obstacles in, in collecting the data. Uh, we know that cookies can be good. Uh, you don't have to like get rid of completely cookies because then the internet will basically stop working or will become uh, very annoying. Um, but where we are, so I will, I will start each section with where we are and where we are headed. So we see the phasing out of third party cookies that is being delayed and delayed, but it's, it's pretty much gone already by Firefox, Safari and Edge. It will be gone finally in Chrome. Um, we have some other mechanisms that prevent tracking, like for, uh, capping the storage of the lifetime of the first party the object, um, uh, first party isolation, uh, CNAME cloaking defense, uh, referral downgrades. I think this one is actually affecting us quite a bit because we don't see the, the actual URL where the users are coming from, but just the domain and various fingerprinting prevention mechanisms, better or worse. But, uh, but making the uh, tracking of the visitor a bit more, more difficult. So as analysts, we, we may not be happy, but we'll deal with that. It's, it's not like end of the world. It, it doesn't really like affect that much the quality or the amount of data that we can collect. We can definitely cope with that. And uh, the technologies that are used for web analytics are those that aren't that much at risk. In the meantime, in advertising industry, uh, <laughs> other firms try to think all is good, and they've been doing that successfully for the last decade or like last five years with all the changes, um, uh, and they will continue. So we'll see. That's an unanswered question. So wh where we are headed with uh, with all of that? So what what I see is that ultimately we'll have such mechanisms that will course that we will more analyze audiences like it's in app stores for example you can get the aggregated data but not visitor level data and i think everything is going in that direction because that moment you can uh, get to the point that maybe you will not be using personal data and that's uh, all the gdpr pains and other privacy laws go go away maybe go away in the in the brackets um, we'll also see more first party identifiers uh, and zero party data. So zero party, so the, the data that the user actually enters on the website, whether it's like email, login, etc. But on the other end, 
uh, we have to do something with the users that aren't identified and there will be a lot of them like depending on the site like we, we cannot get the users to log in on every single site so some sort of anonymous insights based on the sessions based on, based on the audiences based on some campaign clusters data depending on where the data is collected from okay so with data integration so um, in the data integration, the buzzword is CDP, and the name is uh, relatively new, uh, but it's been like this type of technologies uh, have been with us uh, for quite some time. So um, CDP as a concept exists probably a decade or two more than the actual like CDPs that we know today. Um, and the, they come like from different backgrounds, from tag managers, from uh, CRM <laughs> systems, data warehouses, etc. Um, and we see the rising adoption of CDPs and sometimes even organizations are implementing CDPs but they don't know yet for what they want to use it but they buy it anyway. Um, but this will mature over the, over the next couple of years. Uh, functionality wise we have great CDPs that integrate and activate the data and they have like thousands of different connectors uh, for fetching the data, for activating the data but they are not great at analyzing the data. They basically, you have to have some separate data warehouse where you put all the data from the CDP and then you run uh, BI tools. Uh, we see the, the, the players that are entering the CDP space from uh, analytics, uh, and it's not only us, Spirit Pro, but also Amplitude Piano, which is interesting because that will add some counterweight to the CDPs that we've seen um, so far. And uh, maybe this, this landscape of CDPs and analytics will start merging a bit uh, like uh, is happening with product and, and marketing analytics. Um, so where we are, where we are headed, um, I think the bad news is that at some point, or that's already maybe happening or will be happening, is that, that uh, some companies will end up with more than one CDP because different teams will implement it and that's what happened with analytics platforms pretty much like we we have many companies that use more than one one uh, there will be CDPs integrating with CDPs and so on but this is uh, I feel like a natural part of the evolution uh, we'll see definitely more advanced analytics functionality and what what will have to happen is uh, the privacy controls because now it's so easy to connect different data sources. Planes. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, uh, there are more and more uh, data uh, being connected, but there is not much control over that, how and whether this data could be uh, joined with other data and for what purpose they, they can be used. So uh, there are definitely risks uh, here that needs to be addressed, and they need to be addressed also on the functionality of the CDPs. And, that leads us to, to privacy topic, uh, the surveillance, let's say, <laughs> but not only surveillance. Um, uh, wh where we are is uh, that marketing and legal teams talk to each other and it's beautiful, it's sometimes challenging, but uh, that the legal team actually started to care what's, what is happening with marketing. Um, that wasn't the case uh, when GDPR came into place, but um, it's, it's something that, that, that needs some, some, some evolution. Uh, we see also regulators providing the um, guidelines, which is great because we know how we can implement different tools or we, how, uh, which tools or how they can work each other to, to actually comply with what regulators are, are telling us. Um, and we see examples from CNIL, whether these are the, their audience measurement program or their guidelines for Google Analytics or DPA in, um, in Denmark and so on. And we'll probably see more of that happening. Uh, the other thing are also Digital Marketing and Digital Services Act that will greatly affect especially the, the very large online uh, platforms, the very large online search engines. Um, so where we are headed, definitely the, the privacy trend is, is going forward. Um, it will be very interesting what's happening in the US, both on their like uh, state laws as well as their um, fed, possibly federal law. Uh, probably we'll see earlier some, some more state laws uh, being strengthened. 
And finally, uh, this will happen. We don't know how and when, but there will be some uh, agreement between the US and the EU uh, on data transfer. It needs to happen. Um, maybe we'll have the current uh, agreement uh, with a Schrems free case, but ultimately we'll get to something that is acceptable for both, part, both of the uh, not countries, but the regions. And uh, this, this, this will change how we work with the data and will address the issues that, uh, that, are, that, that we have today. Um, the next uh, buzzword, maybe not buzzword, but um, the data clean rooms, which uh, for, by some of them are uh, recognized as new kind of DMPs that have very bad uh, reputation. Um, and they, they have the better reputation for a reason. So basically data clean rooms allow joining the data uh, from uh, different parties without user level data being matched and access from, from outside. Um, it's something that has a lot of promise and it's very useful for the analysts because we can analyze our data set with our partner data set or partner data set. Um, but it's kind of like um, questionable whether this, this uh, will not be uh, problematic from the privacy standpoint, especially when we add some AI algorithms on top of that, that may match the data and uh, connect the data in a better way, but in the end, uh, separating individuals, which, which may uh, create some uh, privacy headaches. And um, I definitely see that uh, data clean rooms will get uh, higher adoption in the, in the years to come. But at the same time, we'll see probably some first case of regulators looking into whether that's um, compliant with privacy laws that, that we have. Okay. Um, the next thing is about collaboration. I think that's that's um, exciting part because um, analytics platforms so far were more um, focused on giving great tool for the analyst to work on the data, but not necessarily collaborate with other teams in the organization, other um, um, other uh, roles in the organization. Um, so we know that. Uh, Analytics platforms are already widely adopted. They are growing, as I showed you earlier. Um, but uh, different teams sometimes collect the same data in different tools. Um, and uh, in some ways, decision making is still not being data driven. So we collect the data, but uh, ultimately the decision is made, uh, at least in some organizations, uh, by the actually uh, gut uh, feeling, not the, the actual uh, data that we have. Uh, but where we are headed, and I think this may slightly change the, 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 the way that this is happening, is uh, there will be more collaborative tools like Google Docs Miro-like experience of analytics platforms, where multiple stakeholders and multiple teams uh, can work on the data, can add comments, can um, add suggestions, and actually make this more like a not data reporting, but, but storytelling or visualizing the whole process of why we made the decision and why it's backed by the data. It will also help the um, circulation of the data in the, the organization and on the way maybe it will end up that we'll use less tools for the same uh, thing that we use in the organization, specifically not collect the same data in, in three different uh, platforms. Okay. Uh, I think uh, a lot of presentations here uh, uh, today have chat G GTP. Uh, this one will have that as well. <laughs> um, so um, where we are is that AI is um, doing great job at uh, detecting anomalies, um, visualizing trends. It's not even AI. It's like simple machine learning algorithms that, that do that. Um, uh, Chat GPT is, uh, there was a great video, I think, by Big Copipo that uh, showed how it can help uh, analysts to implement tax and event tracking, uh, which, uh, which is a great use case. But at the same time, there is a great um, uh, concern about why, if this insights, if we let AI do, that, do the job for us, uh, if they will be all the right quality. And I actually asked AI if, if they think so. 
And uh, I think they, they stated this, uh, something that is uh, clear to us, that uh, the insights at the end of the last sentence uh, are only as good as the human interpretation of it. So we definitely will have a lot of job. We'll have just better tools uh, to do it. <clears throat> so where, where are we headed? Definitely AI will help us generate insights. Maybe they it will help us to create not just report, but the whole composition of reports and dashboards. Um, and we won't be doing it from scratch uh, using like 100 clicks to, to, actually, uh, to actually create what we want. Uh, it will create a scaffolding that we can refine and then um, do uh, spend more data, spend more time on data analysis rather than on data cleanup, data integration, uh, creating some, some of the uh, reporting. And I think at that, uh, this, uh, this is going to be great. This is going to save tons, tons of time. Okay, so advertising. This is the space that is quite near uh, and co uh, connected. So I wanted to, to highlight some of the things that are happening. So first of all, we are past the peak of advertising of uh, Meta and Google. So um, it's first time since 2014 that spending, ad spending on Meta and Google account actually for less than half of the, the spend. And uh, there are some reasons behind it, like uh, introduction of changes by I Apple to, to the iOS devices and, and uh, Apple devices in general. Um, also the rise of some of the players, including Amazon, that take uh, some of the market. Um, at the same time, there are also happening some, some interesting stuff. So for example, Topics API, which was the response of uh, Google Chrome to, to the disabling third-party cookies support, was rejected uh, by W3C, so the standardization body. Uh, there are also very interesting antitrust uh, uh, lawsuit that was fired, I think, last week or, or two weeks ago by DOJ in the US against uh, Google for anti-competitive anti behavior. Um, and then a, 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 a series of lawsuits in, in Europe. So definitely what's happening is that um, the, the both US and Europe uh, want to break the oligopoly of, uh, of the big tech players. And at the same time, what we were talking about the DSA and DMA um, is going to have a profound impact on advertising, which is the main source of revenue for these uh, platforms. So uh, uh, they will have limited way of using user data for, for advertising, which is their primary revenue source. And whether we will have the end of advertising in, the, in, the, in, the, in identifiers, I'm not sure. Um, maybe it will be still business as usual for ad tech, but as I um, uh, showed you earlier, the, the fire is in the room, especially with all the changes that were rolled out by the browsers in the recent, recent two years. So uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe to, to just sum up, um, uh, I want to say that tools that um, that we work with to, to analyze data, they change, they get improved, some of them um, get sunsetted. But what matters in the analytics uh, is that the, the whole market and the, the trend for more data-driven dri decision is growing. Um, and this means also that the demand for our expertise is growing and will be growing in the years uh, to come. Thank you very much.
gentlemen, eating, sleeping, experimenting, repeating, back to the stage again at Super Week 2023. The one, the only, the awesome, Ton Wesley! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, did, was this your final intro? No, just one more. You do one more? Final, Please give a hand for Joshua. I've never seen such an awesome host. <laughs> and of course, Maria, you're awesome too, but uh, you have different styles. <laughs> but your style is quite unique. Thank you for the intro, Joshua. Thank you, thank you. Well, hi, uh, I'm Ton. Uh, I'm gonna do a talk on how an analyst can add more value to optimization uh, because we are in a room of analysts. Um, I started as an analyst. Uh, first, I was born. I was not an analyst when I was born. So this makes 74. Yeah, it makes me quite old. I built my first websites in 96 um, and started analyzing log files. And I liked analyzing the log files of my websites. And then I tried to make changes and to see if I had more hits in my log file. So if you add another image, you will have more hits. Uh, where do you go? So I started working at an internet publisher in 1999. And uh, they were building uh, just content websites. They had a lot of domain names. So they had a lot of type-in usage. And over there, I think in 2002, I started running proper A-B experiments. We just had a lot of affiliate links, and we wanted to know which one created the most revenue. So a simple A-B experiments since 2002. And I think, because I started already back then, I have made all the mistakes you can make with A-B testing. Um, in 2007, I left that company, became a contractor, started working for a larger organization. So I was allowed to play with tools like Metrics and Optimos, like the early optimization tools. Learned a lot. Started my own agency in 2009, Online Dialog. We're based in the Netherlands, conversion optimization agency, but we became more like an experimentation consultancy, helping up uh, helping setting you up with experimentation, uh, structure, and culture. Started presenting. Um, it, it was fun because in this company, I was not allowed to share any knowledge on what we were doing. Uh, so when I started to work for myself, I started publishing. And then in 2012, I started presenting. And I've learned if you share knowledge, it takes time. It takes a lot of effort to, to, to prepare. You will get more knowledge in return. And if we all play this game, then we can learn a lot. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> so 2014, I started running my own events because I like events like this. I'm doing the conversions hotel in the Netherlands. And in 2020, I started the Experimentation Culture Awards because I believe that's the, uh, the ultimate goal is to have an experimentation company. And, and that's what I still do myself now in 2023. I still like to work on experiments and help building an experimentation culture in companies. So I, the company became too big. We have a management team. I moved out of the data operations to get my hands dirty again and just help clients get the things done. Because I really believe in the fact that organizations that don't adopt an experimentation approach for the digital products won't be winning in the future. This is the way to make decisions to validate, to grow, to outrank your competitors. And it's a really fun way of working. And it really excites teams if they have this experimentation approach, experimentation mindset. So in 2020, I was here presenting at the previous hotel. And my goal back then was how an analyst can add value. And I really went to the Matt Gershoff style. So I wore, wore his t-shirt. You can uh, barely see it. Um, but I really took a deep dive in numbers. Because yes, I believe that an experimentation approach uh, will, will win if it's a trustworthy experimentation approach. So back then, I talked about false positives, false negatives, uh, type M errors, SRM errors, business case calculations, and so on, because I really believe that you as an analyst uh, can do a way better job calculating this stuff than the product owner or the marketing manager or whatsoever. So that was my call for help back then. Um, I hope it helped. At least the number of experiments are growing. This is from a survey I did with VWO. This is like 125 companies. And they said in 2022, on average, they were running 74 experiments, which is a growth of 48%. So 
velocity is going up. Uh, the outperformers were running 127, and even the underperformers were running 56. Of course, this is a biased group. I reached out to my, to my email database and uh, to, uh, on LinkedIn, so these are people that indeed are working with experimentation, but it's growing fast for them. And it will grow faster because the answer in the survey on how many changes to the digital activities in your organization are backed up by CRO insights is only 33%. And backed up by A-B test results is only 25%. So 75% of stuff that's being shipped is not validated. So they're trying really hard over here, and then in the meantime, this is happening. And this will grow. I think we are moving now from marketing experimentation to product validation. Companies that get it really embed this in their pipeline. So this will grow continuously, and next year it will be bigger in the year, more and more experiments. So velocity will go up. But what I see happening now, more and more teams and organizations being enabled to run experiments, that the percentage of winning experiments is going down. And that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, if you have more experience, not everything can be a winner. And if some teams are just not that good in understanding consumer psychology, understanding the journey of the user, then they will have less success, but still some success. But this is quite okay because the number of real outcomes, the number of winners will go up. Uh, if your velocity goes up faster than your winning percentage is going down, you're quite okay. But if you continue doing this, the lower your winning percentage, the higher your percentage of false positives among the winners. So your false discovery rate is going up, which even means that it could be that your number of true positives, your number of real winners is going down. And this is something we don't want. Uh, if we add, spend more time, more money, and more resources on the velocity of experiments, this is not a good direction to go. So this is why I need your help again as an analyst, because I think you can do a really good job in helping those organizations to have a higher winning percentage. How to do this? How can we do this? Well, I think this statement is a really important one. What I see happening at organizations that they become a validate everything company. Oh, we have a discussion on a bottom color. Oh, let's test it. Uh, we're not sure if we should add this element to the website. Let's test it. And of course, you want to validate everything you release, but it's not something to, to reduce risk. Yeah? Validation is not a solution to avoid risk. Validation is your invitation to take more risk. If you talk to C-level people at companies, they're all, always kind of scared if we talk about validation that is risk reducing. Yes, it is risk reduction, uh, reduction because you are validating what you put live. That's something good. But they don't want to create a culture where people are not taking any risk anymore. It's your invite to take more risk because it will be validated. But it's not an invite, uh, a solution to try everything. Validation is a solution to try everything. Validation is to verify your customer journey insights. And this is where you come in. Because customer journey insights, that's translating qualitative and quantitative data to insights. So what I will share with my background as an analyst is my approach to optimization. And it involves more than analyzing web analytics data. So at some point, oh, sorry, I switched around some slides this morning, which is something I should not have been doing. OK, my approach, I have three steps. First, I want to understand the full customer journey. Then I want to know where it must be optimized. And then I want to create promising changes. I want to improve understanding the customer journey. I want to improve knowing where I should optimize it. And I want to improve on the changes that are being developed and launched and validated. So when I get a new client, or if I start working at a company, and for example, I just started with these guys. They are a ticket resale platform, marketplace. And what is the first thing you think I did when they signed me up to help them with their conversions? I run experiments. Any idea? Change the color of the box. 
Uh, I already had the answer. It is. Yes. I became a customer. I want to understand what the whole journey is like. So I bought the product. And the fun thing is, the people that I work with at the company, some of those people in the team never bought something on the platform. To me, that's kind of straight, because this is the first step. Buy and use the products. Understand the customer journey. And then I'll start talking to the company, because I want to know their business model. How do they make money? I want to understand their targets and KPIs. And I, I will give you a funny example. At some point, I was working for this Dutch financial company, MoneyU, and uh, we were just hired to optimize their conversions, get more transactions. So after three months, we presented our first results, and we were really happy because we were really able to optimize the selling of savings products with like 20%. Big success, a big presentation, everyone was there. And at the end of the presentation, the CEO said, well, amazing results. Um, but this product already reached its target two months ago. We don't want to sell more savings products. We need to sell more mortgages. That's the product that's, need, that's needed for optimization. And we just, before, we just looked at the numbers, like this is the biggest opportunity. Let's optimize this biggest opportunity. And well, we didn't ask about the targets and KPIs. So you, you need to understand this. Once you start on analyzing the customer journey, you need to understand the targets and KPIs, the business model, and of course, I always ask them, who are your competitors? And I do the same on the other side. This is the company side, and you have the customer side. They have reasons to buy. They have reasons not to buy. And of course, I also ask them about alternatives. I just start talking to people. And the first step is always, you go to the call center. And first you listen. And after some training, you're even allowed to talk to people. And you get the real answers. And of course, interviews are even better. Why are you buying? Why are you not buying? And what are the alternatives? It could be that the competitor is not the alternative they're ma mentioning. They're mentioning a different solution for the problem. Always really interesting. And of course, they also always have chat logs. And, and this is amazing because you can search through this, see all the answers, also learn and understand how they are talking, which words they are using. So that's deep diving in understanding what's going on. Business model, targets, competitors, reasons to buy, reasons not to buy, alternatives. And once you know competitors and alternatives, it becomes interesting. You can go to Google. And you start searching, uh, trying to understand who all these alternatives and competitors are. And what's the first thing you do once you know who the competitors and alternatives are? What do you do? Buy yes. You buy and use the products. Because if you want to optimize the customer journey of your website, you need to understand the full customer journey. And when they buy at your website or become a leader whatsoever, it's not that they're only on your website. They will use Google. They will use the competitor's websites. So if, if something is changing on the competitor website, it will influence the journey of your visitor. But it, well, it's something that you should measure. And that's the next thing I always do once I know the alternatives and the competitors. I use a tool like Visual Ping. There are way more out there. I'm not attached to them or whatsoever, but I like this one. I just enter the website. I will set up an email sent to me every 24 hours if there is a specific visual change on this area of the website. So this is a scraper. And it will send me an email when the competitor website is changing. Because if it changes, the customer journey changes. So this is data you need to collect and you need to analyze. And like I said, there are way more tools out there. There are even tools for mobile apps so you can scan changes in mobile apps and so on. So a lot of stuff you can use, quite affordable, to monitor what's going on. The fun thing is, once you know what's going on on your competitor website, it's also quite interesting to spy on their experiments. If they use something like Optimizely, you can install a plugin. This one is from conversion.com. This is the Optimizely website, and it tells me which experiments are running on the Optimizely website. So once the visual change ping comes in, then I know already that it's based on an experiment, just not a specific change. They've run an experiment, and they implemented it. That's really interesting. And you really need an analyst to collect this data and to analyze this data. I'll give you an example. Um, 
been working for a large hotel chain in the Netherlands. Their biggest competitor um, is booking. Um, because the hotels are always like on capacity. But if you book through booking, they will have to pay money to booking. If you book directly, they make more money. But the prices are the same. Eh? The, the price on booking is the same as the price on the hotel website. They have some loyalty programs, but that's it. So the battle is not to get more conversions. The battle is getting more conversions through direct channel. So at some point, booking launched Ideal, which is a Dutch payment solution. Uh, usually booking is credit card based, but they launched this Dutch payment solution. And we were monitoring their website because they're the biggest competitor. So we got this ping, oh, they added Ideal. And we immediately saw it in our numbers. The share of people booking through booking became bigger than our share. We, we also had Ideal on our website, but not that visible. But it turned out to be an experiment. And they did not implement this. And I can only guess why. Probably because credit card users are more loyal. You have their account details. They can pay more easily than this one-time payment thing. I don't know. So the, after two weeks, it was gone again. But then when we learned this, that, that with promoting this on booking, their share went really up. We created a way bigger presence of this ideal solution on the hotel websites. And then the market share of the hotel website went up. And this is only by spying on your competitors. So it's something you should really do. So now you know, you know about the product, you know the business, uh, you want to understand the customer and alternatives. That's the part where I dive in scientific research. You have amazing solutions like Google Schooler, Semantic Schooler, Deep Dive, which is like the Spotify for scientific articles. And if you have the money, you can go to Science Direct, which is more expensive. And they publish all studies that are being published, and that's a lot. The amount of money science is spending on research and publications is really big. And then you have to learn how to use something like Google Schooler. It's really important to look at the number of citations uh, and, and uh, who's the author. And uh, there are papers out there that are not that good, but there are also papers that are really good. And these papers will have lots of insights about your problem, solution, and product. Uh, for instance, the loyal customer's perception regarding the online buying process, uh, online consumer behavior, uh, why buy people online. But you can even go more in-depth. If you like selling bets online, there will be scientific articles written, large research studies on why people buy bets online and what's withholding them from buying bets online. So this is stuff you can use. And well, once you know the journey and know all these backgrounds, then you kind of understand the full customer journey. You understand their reasoning, scientific research, you understand the competitors, what's happening over there, you start monitoring them to understand the full customer journey. But this has to be done by an analyst, not by the product owner or not by the marketing guy or girl whatsoever. Next step, know where it must be optimized. This is where we dive in analytics. I'll give you this example. This is Safari bookings. Uh, you can book a Safari to Africa. That's the business. Uh, and, and they're just a middleman between the tour guides in Africa doing the safari uh, and you as a, as a customer. When I look at data, I'm not looking at most visited pages, landing pages, whatever. I try to create segments. And I'll give you an example on a typical e-commerce uh, flow example. I want to know all users on the website with enough time to take action. Because users that leave immediately don't have the time to take any action, so I'm interested in the ones that spend some time on the website. Then I'm interested in all users on the website with at least some interaction, some scrolling, some clicking, so they're interacting, they're talking to me, they're talking to the website. Then I want to know all users on the website with heavy interaction. And of course, this is, this is a definition, what's heavy interaction, uh, what is some interaction, uh, and that's something you will tailor along the way. You will learn while creating the segments if it's working or not. I'll explain you later. Then we want to have all users on my website with a clear intent to buy. E-commerce example. Willing to buy is my next segment, and then succeeding in buying, and of course also returning and buying again. So I want to understand this funnel how many people are in each segment, how many drop out in each segment, and the time they use to go from segment to segment. I'll take that data, just import it, do whatever, this is an old spreadsheet, 2017. And for in this case, Safari bookings, 
We wanted to know total users, users with interaction, users with interest, visited minimal one, two operator page, users with intent that opened the form and successful users that submitted the form and loyal users submitting multiple forms because they're a lead generation company, so submitting more forms will make them more money. So we're getting that data. And of course, um, to understand in which segment you're in, uh, we run this kind of survey pop-ups, quick feed feedback forms. It's in Dutch, but it's, it's asking, are you currently um, uh, looking uh, for hotel prices at other websites? This is a hotel example. Um, and some other questions. Do, do you already know your specific date, destination, and so on? Quick survey, high response rate. People submit this. We inject the data in analytics. So then we can create these segments based on what they say they're going to do compared with the behavior. But this is how you optimize your segments. Whoa. It was fun. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back. That was an interesting uh, twitch. So, oh, no, I don't want to open Excel. So we, we create dashboards like this. I'll zoom in on the, on the graph below, um, because it's too much info. So this is, the, the red ones is, I believe, uh, desktop, the gray ones is mobile. But it really shows us the click through per segment. So from users to users with interaction, it's only 45%, that's kind of interesting. So half of the users are not interacting with the website. Could be bots, who knows, I don't know. And then from interaction to interest, that's kind of high, 60%, that's good. But then from interest to intent, it's only like 10% moving on to that segment. That's an interesting segment, really fascinating. And then from intent, once they have intent, success is quite high. But then from success to loyal, that's kind of low. So for us, this means that we need to run experiments over here to see if more people start interacting. We need to run experiments over here, or maybe had the wrong definition of the segment. That could be, there's something we need to learn. And we really need to do something over here, because once they have success, and they are on the thank you page, like, okay, leads is there, then it's quite easy to show them another couple of options and have another buy. So that's kind of interesting. So this is telling us where to optimize. So this is what we do with analytics. You know, we create users per segment, conversion and time it takes to move from segment to segment, that gives valuable insights, and what are the essential pages, pages where decisions are made. Once you know, okay, we need to optimize the, the, the step from, 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 from uh, just clicking around interaction to intent, what are the pages where this is happening? And once we know these pages, we start doing conversion mapping. We're just gonna run a bunch of banditized experiments where we just leave out elements. Because that's quite easy to do. For instance, booking step one on a hotel website. We've tested leaving out all sorts of elements. And then we learn what happens if you leave out a specific element. Of course, you could try to leave out the call to action. Don't do that. We have learned that this one, if we leave out this step, it has a positive effect on conversions. If we leave out this one, it has a positive effect. The gray ones have no impact. And in this example, there were no negative specific things that, hurt, that, 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 that grew conversions if you leave them out. So this gave us an, an overview of the elements that have an impact on this specific important page. And of course, if you don't have the numbers to run this kind of experiments on this high scale, you can use a tool like Usability Hub and just show your website and ask people, what are the five most important elements for you? What are the five not important elements for you? So you can minimize the number of Bandits you need to run to understand what the data is really telling you and not the people. And of course, you want to do this with your own users. So if you run surveys like this to ask for feedback, why are you here? On the thank you page of this feedback form, you want to ask, do you want to participate in more small surveys from our company? Please leave behind your email address and you'll be surprised how many people do this. So then you can build your own guerrilla army. So going to strap three. Um, we understand the full customer journey. Now we know where it must be optimized. So now it's time to create promising changes. We work with five optimization strategies. And this is not typically something for the analysts, but the analyst part will jump in a little later. 
we use uh, we optimize ability. Uh, so people are able to do something, we optimize attention, and uh, they should see it to be able to do it. Then we optimize motivation. We have certainty, adding certainty helps a lot. And the fifth one is choice architecture. This is the hardest one because you're really changing the order, the flow of the website. These ones are more simple to do. But these are the main topics we use. So we know the specific uh, part of the journey, we know the specific location, uh, we know the specific element that's important to go to the next step. And now we're going to try to optimize, uh, is it about attention, is it about ability, is it about motivation, and so on. And then we start running experiments. And they're always based on this specific reason. Uh, we apply this change, uh, uh, if we apply this, that's UX, then this will happen with the data among this specific group of people because of this specific reason. And then we just start trying, failing, trying, failing, and succeed. The interesting part for you as the analyst is this step, because you want to record every single experiment in a database. And then you can understand, okay, we won 195 experiments on ability. Uh, 80 of them were winners, so our win rate is 41%. Of course, you want to drill down on specific customer journey stages, specific devices. And here you can see the choice architecture is like, in this case, this example is 52%. Oh, that, that's interesting. So changes on choice architecture are, have a higher winning rate than changes on attention or motivation. And of course, they are more expensive. They're harder to do. That's something you have to consider if you make your decisions. But with this, you really can create insights for the company. Okay, if you are optimizing a product page, it doesn't make sense to add any certainty or motivation. We have learned it really helps to add ability and attention. That could be an outcome. You need an analyst to analyze this and come up with these insights. Because if a product owner or marketer will go to this database, they will not come up with the insights. The data is there, they will not come up with the insights. Now this is how you create more promising and more promising changes. That's step one, step two, step three. It becomes even more interesting because this is all about earn more money now. Uh, optimizing for transactions optimizing for getting from step to step. And with the database, you have first order learning. You slowly start to understand the behavior of your users. Uh, customer intelligence, uh, specific segments, understanding how emotions and ratio work. But this one is even more important because this one is really where the money is. Second order learning. Based on all these learnings, you can come up with new features, new services, and start optimizing customer lifetime value and have innovative new products based on all that knowledge. And that's really something that, that you need to analyze and try and experiment with because experimentation is not only here for button copy testing or whatsoever. In the end, it's about business experimentation and taking a risk and taking bit, bigger steps, but backed up with a lot of data and a lot of insights. So to me, validation is not a solution to avoid risk. It's your invitation to take more risk. But uh, it's not a solution to try everything, because then your win rate will go down. Uh, it's to verify your customer journey insights. And then hopefully, uh, if you add all that knowledge to the product teams and the marketing teams running experiments, then the velocity will continue to go up, but also the winning percentage will slowly grow with you. So you have more true positives and more growth of the business. So that's what I like you to do as an analyst. Uh, look beyond analytics to get insights to optimize, but really help the company to prioritize what they're working on based on proper insights. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I have a small one more thing. We all know about the Google Optimize Sunset. I'm running a survey to collect end users from the 35 A-B testing vendors we identified because I want to have end user experience to come up with potentially a solution where people need to move to because Optimize doesn't exist anymore and a new solution in GA4, well, at least it will not be there in time, my guess. And maybe it will never be there. I don't know, I don't know. So what to do if you are on a free package, should you use Optimizely or should you use something else? Or if you are at a um, quite have you installed an Optimize 360? Where to move to? Should you stick to client-side testing or should you move to server-side testing uh, and create a better experimentation engineering pipeline? So I try to 
gather all the data and then give it back to the community. So if you have experience with one of the A-B testing tools, please submit the form so I can ask you questions about your end user experience because I don't know all the tools. So that's on LinkedIn, uh, it's my most recent article. If you go to my profile, you will see the article and you can submit the form. Thank you. One more thing. <laughs>
winning at data privacy. So I think we got the, we got the right people uh, in the room. Um, let's just start off with what is the number one thing going wrong in data privacy right now? <laughs> Julia, I know you have an opinion about this. You, you've already uh, vocalized it. Uh, yeah, you have to pick. What, what's, what's the worst thing? Uh, that's a tough question. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess the number one thing is that data engineers and data analysts not always understand that behind this whole bunch of data, they collect, capture, and monitor its actual human beings behind it. And they need to understand, like this is a basic human right, that they need to respect, and this is not like guaranteed or has to be under the law, it's more just ethic as well. It's not just the law or regulations, data privacy regulations, but to have that respect for people, which was so much highlighted during your presentation. It's, it's a basic thing, respect, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think that we have gotten such a, like our focus has narrowed so much onto, you know, what we see mostly in the media with all the fines and everything that we've forgotten what privacy actually, the element of privacy is, which comes down to, right, everyone in the world has some right to privacy, which, which then translates to a right in terms of personal data. Um, and protecting that. So it is important, especially for analysts um, and people that work with data to not forget that there is this human interaction. And I, as I was highlighting in the, converse, in the discussion we had before now, is that I really strongly believe that it is every person who works with data, it is their job to understand the regulation as it pertains to their data. Um, because there is no way now as an analyst or anyone that works with data that you can go into the job and say, I'm not going to know that. If exactly. it regulates the data you work with, you need yeah. to know it. Just the basics. Exactly. Nobody wants you to quote the law exactly. when, when somebody asks you, but you need to know the data privacy regulations regarding your field where you operate and regions. So uh, it's just a sanity, you know. Yeah. When you said that in your talk, I was thinking of, a, well, not necessarily an org chart, but it, most people who are at Super Week are probably at data collection or data analysis, maybe, right? Maybe transformation, right? But that's, these are these buckets where people specialize. And then privacy is like this vertical on top of it, right? And, and probably the challenge with that is because, because it's new, it's not actually new, right? Like you highlighted <laughs> these, these things are, uh, you know, like they're, they're basic principles, but it's new to us. Let, let's, you know, most people who, started in this industry 10 years ago, did not care about privacy, you know, didn't pop into their mind. They were just building cool stuff that I think most of the people at Super Week, they would you know, get enthusiastic about, we're building cool stuff. And now it feels like it's an addition. How, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Like what, what can we do to minimize that friction or to? Yeah, yeah I, there is a lot of friction there. And I agree that it is especially hard, I think, that when we were in data, and I mean, I was part of that, you know, when everyone was trying to collect all the data, make all these decisions on it, and, and understand our users extremely, like, nuanced. And it's really cool when you're playing with data and you get to start understanding that, and there's an excitement with it. So it's even harder than when you understand this to say, you can't just do that anymore. Um, so you're taking away, like, their playground. So it's... So it is, it's not going to be easy, but you can also switch that around. And if you start changing your mindset a little bit and saying, but wait, how can I still serve the user and respect them at the same time? All we're doing is throwing in another challenge. All, I, like, all we're saying is now take that additional information and grow even more and build even more cool stuff. So I don't think it actually contradicts each other. I think that ultimately this is just allowing all the really great minds in the industry to take this information, learn it, and then build something even cooler that still respects the user and gives the user what they want, which is they still want all this, they still want us to understand the behaviors, they still want us to target us according to behaviors. And if we can mesh that, because I'm not someone who thinks that it's all privacy all the time. I do think it needs to work, it needs to work for the business. The business doesn't work without us being able to serve the user. So. I think that all the great minds, most of which are at Super Week, are going to be able to now take that and put it together and 
within the next few years, the golden punch card is going to go to somebody who's doing something like that. That sounds exciting. <laughs> Bold prediction. I like it. <laughs> um, I mean, Currently, I started with data analytics, and data analytics is a lot about capturing data. I know the Googlers like to coin this uh, process now, observe data, but actually, folks, you are capturing the data. Um, yeah, so, um, so right now, I'm more on the downstream side where data engineers kind of work. They pull different, different data sources and work with it um, under data mesh architecture or uh, in centralized storages, they're trying to model the data and deliver insight. I mean, then delivers the data to, to people in analytics or BI so they can drive insights for businesses. And data privacy for me also includes data security a lot. Because data and like web analytics, product analytics is on the early front line and it's capturing actually human behavior. That's why there is so many talks about it, like ethic talks and so on and so forth. But there is also the other piece when data is stored and what tools I apply to manipulate and put the data into the action. And this is really important to talk about that as well, because like we can't get all the consent up front, but still there is um, personal data and we need to know how it's stored up there and what tools have access to put this data into action. So one of the things when we were developing um, Mesa data was to apply best practices from analytics, how analytics tools are treating it, to, to, to have this ability um, not to, like, to have no chances to expose this yeah. data um, out of the storages. So what I highlight a lot, it's good that you collect all the consent when you capture the data, but you need to make sure that it's stored properly as well. Yeah, yeah. well, th th this ties in with the next question I wanted to ask is, I think I already kind of know your answer, but do you think we need to solve this with technology or do we need to solve it with behavior change? And it's probably both, a uh, you know, it's at least a little bit of both, but um, as you're more in the data engineering space, right, so you, you have uh, probably a lot of visibility on this, but my thoughts are, if we, um, if we can enforce it with technology, then humans can screw it up further down the pipeline, right? So if at the collection point, we kind of enforce certain things already um, from an anonymity point of view, from a privacy point of view, that makes the rest of the pipeline, you know, whatever happens to that data, th there's no privacy risk attached to it. That's a little bit of thinking I have. Um, first of all, I have an opinion that everything starts from people. If first, if people do not care what is happening down the road, it, it doesn't matter what kind of tools you apply. Yeah. So first of all, it's people who need to consider the risks, uh, you know, the privacy aspects, and so on and so forth. The good thing is when I'm starting, I'm already, you know, engaged with data engineers. Um, chief data officers, they uh, start to ask this right question when they pitch them a solution. They ask directly, Yulia, what data do you query? And that's it. This is like a single sentence that uh, actually, um, that actually is important to answer for any, for any solution. Like what data do you have access to? And this is a really simple sanity check if this is uh, secure enough to use. So um, I should say that technical aspect is really, really important, but it comes second if people, are, if people care. Yeah. yeah, and the people have to build the technology, right? So, yeah. Yeah, but, but <laughs> yeah, the, 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 for me, it's uh, obviously if, if nobody cares, nobody needs the technology. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that it, you know, she stressed this point that there's this element of security. And I agree with you, Leah, that we need to consider the technology that can help us, but we're never going to get away from the human interaction. 
Exactly. It's just no matter what. And that means there needs to be behavior change and that behavior change needs to be driven by a basic understanding of what's going on. Um, it's almost like we're asking a whole subset of population to change their mindset towards something. It, but they, it, it just needs to be done because there's a reason why in privacy there are, are th there are measures taken, such as limiting access to various data to specific people that actually need it, so that you don't have these risks and elements. And uh, yeah, I, I I don't think that that's something technology only can change. Oh no, <laughs> it's just I don't yeah. think it's possible. Um, just you know, I'm I'm living in the startup world, and there are um, lots of privacy first startups that. Um, I personally know the the founder of startup who whose promise was to track all the personal information data within the client's data stack and and beyond, and he couldn't lend the client. I mean, there could be different reasons for that. Yeah. But it's um, it was maybe one year ago, a couple of years ago. Yeah. But it also signals that it wasn't a need. Yeah. So. Um, I think at your talk at the end, uh, uh, Juliana asked, asked a good question of what resources out there are there for us super weak people, right? Uh, let's, let's call it people who are not in privacy, who are maybe now understanding that they should, you know, uh, care more for, for the reasons we just discussed. But a lot of the resources about privacy are, like you said, aimed at lawyers. And super weak people and lawyers are not the same people, uh, to put it lightly, right? <laughs> so, but we do want this adoption, we do want this change, because we all agree that this change is important, and it's also important for us, for our industry, that we understand privacy. Um, so what can we do to, you know, to create these resources or to, I don't know, to, 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 to take this next step? Besides giving your presentation here, right, which is already uh, which is already a step, of course. But what what more can we do? What what can vendors do? What can other attendees of Super Week do? Yeah, so I think there is a, a trend that's starting with vendors, where they are trying to educate people and empower people to be able to make some of those decisions, um, especially some of the more privacy-friendly uh, solutions that are just coming into the market. So they're really going out of their way to um, not just educate, but also empower and give the responsibility to the people. But all these things take change, um, and change is slow. Hmm. So I think for especially a lot of people who work in data and data analysts, some of that will need to come um, from their own drive and their own motivation. And I completely understand that it is a very uh, a hard point to entry because I went that route, right? I went from data into privacy, and it is shocking how little there is written, but there are definitely a couple of um, data-focused people out there that have phenomenal blogs and, and write really well, and there are podcasts that are really great to um, kind of bring that to the forefront. So I do think that it's, slight, it's changing, and it's really on us to change it. So I think that the more we talk about privacy, especially in analytics and data conferences, the more interest there will be from people who work in data and analytics, and those that will get more excited about it will make sure to communicate about it. it. You know, I got excited about it, so this is why now I can talk about it. And I, I'm sure it'll keep on happening. I'm seeing a lot of people in the field taking an interest in it, and, and those resources will become more and more plenty, I hope. I mean, it's just hard. Um, I agree. Was a lot of points on top there are uh, you know people who empower other people and raise awareness that this is actually a concern and we need to to think of it as a professionals who deal with data stefan rick you you're doing a tr tremendous job but also that should be incentivized by government as well <laughs> like if there is no enforcement yeah. it just you know raising awareness won't help yeah. and what is um and there are what I discovered for myself, how I understood, how I understood everything is moving, like in Europe, is so much different from what is happening in the United States. And so if Europe is more about data privacy focused, like to, um, how do you say, to, to, to stop things from happening, you know, to stop things from um, data breaches, 
So United States law is not that proactive, let's say, as, yeah. uh, as European Union. So they just will have lawsuits when the uh, data breach happens. So it's kind of different, um, how do you say it? Like, it's, a, it's a different business model. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, I, love, I love how you frame it. Which is funny, though, because when you look at some of the data that we have um, about how the public views privacy, the Americans and the British value privacy at the highest out of everyone, not the Europeans. It's, it's an interesting thing when you look at the normal people, right? <laughs> and, um, but from an enforcement perspective, I agree. But maybe it's also just because Europeans know that it's being enforced, so they don't have to care about it so much. It could be that, but you, know, that you can interpret data in various ways, as we all know. But um, yeah, there are definitely different approaches. So, but there are a lot of people out there who are um, doing a really good job. And I would say Rick is doing a phenomenal job at, at bringing out the resources, and also Corey Underwood. Yeah, he definitely. is doing his yeah. blog. I think is really accessible for people who work in data because that's what he does. Yeah. So he really speaks that language. See Underwood dot dev. Yeah, Shout dot dev exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Okay, so so last question, uh, rounding up. Next year, Super Week. Hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll all get to be there. What um, what do you hope to see at next year's Super Week with regards to privacy, or what do you hope has changed? So we're looking a year from now into the future. I think I really hope to see a lot more um, at Super Week specifically. I'm hoping to see more solutions that take the big that look at the big picture. So currently we're seeing a lot of solutions as this is how we can collect this data and keep it anonymous and therefore reduce the risk, but still get what we want. Yeah. Um, which is very specific. I would love to see a little bit more about. Um, products that are addressing the bigger picture. So instead of trying to take the products we currently have and adjusting them, mm -hmm. yeah. I would love to see the whole product changing or, or, or you know, the way, the approach to privacy, because I think it's still very reactive. And yeah. in light of what Yulia said, I would like to see more proactive behavior, even from data, um, uh, people who work in data and analysts. So that's really why I'm hoping we're headed. I like your point, Siobhan, really. And um, I was thinking about this uh, framework in software, uh, in software development about uh, zero trust. Uh, like uh, when the, uh, the user enters the application, always generate, uh, the, the new token should be always generated. So we would need to have, uh, we would need to coin actually a new, um, you know, uh, framework around data, so you would need to use those solutions that do not that have no ability to expose the data um, you use with those solutions. You, I mean, apply uh, in action with those solutions. Um, I guess that could be um, that could be very very good if there are something like this would appear on the market. And, and, and I mean, it's all tied back to the awareness of people who are using those tools. Yeah. So yeah, raised uh, awareness about the uh, data security and data privacy. Yeah, great. Julia, Silvan, thanks for uh, this talk. And um, yeah, hopefully we get to have uh, more interesting talks during uh, the rest of Super Week. For sure. Thank you Thank so much you for, for having invitation. us. Yeah.
Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, going to talk about this, and I want to start out by just uh, explaining a little bit about myself. So, um, first off, my current job. Current sounds a little bit ominous. It's not meant to be. Um, <laughs> I work at DFGS, which is a logistics and ferry company, both B2B and B2C. And there, I'm uh, the head of a department that covers actually almost all of the tools that support sales and marketing, from the mobile app to the CMS, the build pipeline, the digital analytics, the customer data platform, customer relationship management, and more. So um, in that sense, I've, uh, I've moved a little bit uh, in terms of uh, my original start. So you took the shine out of this, Maria, but uh, I, I definitely <laughs> felt the need to, to break here also. Um, I used to work with digital analytics uh, implementation, and before that, I took an education as a nurse, yes. My certificate is no longer valid, just for your awareness. I uh, then, uh, before that, I worked as a communications specialist. So um, I've got a little bit of a past, and before that even, I was a guild officer in World of Warcraft. So, back in the day, just saying. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so the problem here, if you give a, a woman a hammer, though, you know, the saying goes, give a man a hammer, so I don't exactly know what happens if you give a woman a hammer. But if you give a man one, you know, he will treat the world as, you know, a nail. So one of the things you could say is that the digital analytics space, as we heard before, earlier yesterday, has matured, and we've um, approached some of our problems in a quite a, a well-proven manner over a period of time now. And we've standardized a lot of our tools and our methods and our goals, which you would think is a good thing. It also is. But the world has changed around us. This is trite at this point. It's a well-known fact we're still trying to grapple with. But I think we should try to rephrase the problem we're solving. I'm not the first to say that either. Um, but uh, let's see if you like my spin on doing this. So, I think we should try to dream about what we would like something to look like in order to figure out where we want to go. And that's why I want us to take this ideal state we can imagine and then consider what are the steps needed to get there. So I thought I was going to do three examples of this, but I found out that just doing one was plenty, plenty of detail for me to cover just in this talk. So one example of how that could work, I'll go through. First off, setting the ideal. Secondly, just describing what are the requirements if that were to actually be true. And then defining an architecture. And finally, just touching very briefly on what are the steps we are taking to bridge the gap between our current state and that architecture. All right. This is the ideal that uh, I would like to try to think about today. And when I say our here, I mean our company. So literally understanding our company's communication. So first off, we need to try to begin to define what do we mean by communication. So a uh, starting point could be this, but uh, because I think that's in a, in a sense fair, you could consider any kind of signaling to be communication, but it's perhaps a little bit too broad for the purposes of what I'm trying to solve here. So I'm going to move on to a more narrow definition and say that I will think about communication as being overt and digital. So that's the transactional communication we do, email marketing, push notification, <coughs> chat messages, and similar veins. So primarily owned channels and direct intentional communication. All right. So moving to the understand part, what do I mean by understand? Well, I think we could break it down to that a communication happened, when a communication happened, what we actually said, and finally, who we said it to. So I, my background, I didn't put that in earlier. I actually studied philosophy also. Maybe you can feel that in the way that I approach this problem. So taking the first one, how can we know that an event or that a communication happened? Well, we actually then can say that we have to have event tracking ubiquitously across all of the different channels that we own. 
That seems obvious, but it's worth mentioning. We should probably also have some kind of attribute for our events that allows us to distinguish these types of events from other types of events. If we imagine that our whole landscape is a kind of a huge event emitting landscape, we will have many types to just support our general services and operations, and these should be considered in a particular sense. Then we also need to have event attributes tied to the event that tells us the context of that communication. All right, so when did it happen? Obviously, we need to have some time stamping on all of these events. That seems also obvious, but it is not currently necessarily the case. There are plenty of systems in your landscape outside of digital analytics that might not imbue their events with timestamps because it might not be necessary. Further, we need to maybe make a distinction between something we could consider event time and then the send time because we often will queue a communication to be realized at a certain point. And that might depend on something outside of our control, maybe somebody opening an app or something like that. That brings us to the next distinction. So did somebody consume it? You know the litigation kind of uh, stereotype, which is apparently not true, that you hand somebody something and say, you are served, right? That is the recognition of the consumption of the message. That's a separate thing. And then we should try to, what I call bracket, all the ways in which we cannot know whether consumption actually happened. We, don't, we can't verify it to, if it took place. So if we say, you know, you read an email, that's assuming that we know whether you read it. So rather, we sent you an email, we know that at least. And to go into just a tiny bit what I mean about bracketing. So I think about bracketing as remembering that there are known unknowns. So there are status elements that we cannot know, and how should that affect how we communicate? So we know the example, for instance, for male privacy protection, that all the people with the Apple stuff, they will just figure as having opened an email, but it's not actually true. So what that would mean is that we would remember that we can't really trust that consumption message, and rather than we could think about other types of attributes we could calculate, which would serve a similar function. So here, for instance, I just hypothesized that you could imagine that you sent some promotional message and then there were people who activated a link, which is a different event, right? But if they did it within a certain time frame of you sending it repeatedly, you could put them in the box of somebody who probably reached your message fairly quickly. That might make them very relevant for a campaign that has some time limit, for instance. All right, so what was said in the communication? That's another piece of the equation that we often leave out. And um, what I think it requires is to have standardized communication and standardized content. So that means, for instance, that your elements of communication have to be categorized. So to what degree do you need to categorize it? to the degree that you have elements that differ. So at some point, you should understand what was said to somebody. That requires, for instance, you to know whether you did a, a dynamic intro or you had a two or three product offers. If you included the, the latest visited page, it would need for you to categorize and give metadata to all these different content pieces for you to understand in a later fact what was actually said at that point. Um, of course, you would also then have to include what type of communication is this? What type of content is this? Is it the product news? Then we know, as Aurélie mentioned, that it could be covered by a customer agreement and therefore not mandate other types of things around that event. Whereas if it's promotional, um, you know, it's different. So what I would also like to point out that since we do a lot of personalization and we might have, for instance, uh, models that compute the output for a particular element. For instance, you might have a promotional element in an email that is based upon a model trained to predict likely upsell, right? So that choice would be something that differed over time. So if you wanted to know actually what 
was said to people, what type of emotion, you would need to either have an audit trail in the tool that outputted that, or have some highly categorized format on top of the actual message to let you know what it was. All right. So, to whom it was done? Fun, fun, fun. Well, unified identity orchestration for all identified entities. That's like the first thing you need, right? Because most of the channels that I'm including are things where you actually need to have somebody identified. But not all of them, right? So chat would be something, or push notification would not necessarily require identification. So then what you need to also have is bracketing of recognized non-identified <laughs> entities, right? So you don't know who they are, but you've seen them before. How, what does that mean for how you can address them? Further, you need to do some bracketing of non-recognized entities. So people that you haven't, you can't know whether they were there before, but they might have been. They might have just you know, deleted the cookies or use a browser that doesn't allow them, whatever. And then finally, the bracketing of non-entities. And by that, I mean hits, right? So almost like at the server log analysis state where you just knew that a page was requested, but you know nothing else. And these different levels of knowledge about the person who's consuming your communication has an impact on what you should say. And we can see that there's a huge, like there's a realization rolling right now around this. So people are doing promotional messaging where they are including different wordings that they used to. So um, that is a lot of bracketing, but uh, for instance, just taking a, a very silly example here, you know, enjoy 15% off your first order plus free sh shipping and returns. It seems so innocent, but how often will it be wrong? You know, it will be a false promise because that person was already a customer. They can't activate it. So what I see more people doing is to alter their promotions to be non-dependent on first and rather, for instance, being maybe a less high offer of discount, maybe a little lower, but then it's going to be your next order. That is subtle, but it's actually pretty clever. All right. So, what is the architecture able to deliver this? Ooh. Well, I'm going to just you know, start off with some context. I'm going to do some of what has already been done today and yesterday and harken a little bit back in time. So, I want to look at what web development uh, actually was 10 years ago. So we had limited communication between back end and front end. And almost everything followed like the simple request response pattern, where we now actually do have some alternatives to that. The back end applications were mostly monolithic, and they did all of the different aspects in one go, like one big thing. We didn't have a lot of single page applications and we didn't have the front end frameworks that we have today in, in use, ubiquitously. So it was a quite different area. And for the purpose of supplying data to web analytics and also to the third parties that we use uh, to evaluate the performance of our marketing, this was, uh, it was slow and cumbersome, right? It was difficult to play with. So 10 years ago, we might have said that we needed to do very central data collection and process it centrally, transform it, store it. We needed to do perhaps event classification downstream through either advanced or simple methods. And we needed to do attribute extraction and analysis to determine context. And then we also needed to do central integration, quality and governance on top of that central data management. So you also know if you've done this at some point in your career that that is super heavy and cumbersome. But what happened uh, around 10 years ago, little, little more, was a particular player arose on the scene. It wasn't its own, of, first of its kind, right? But uh, Tech Manager in 2012. And what Tech Manager really did was it enabled a fully decoupled ecosystem of events. So it was an event-driven architecture suddenly in our browsers or our clients. And the data layer functioned as an event stream processor. And it supplied both your own analytics needs and the third parties through the scripts deployed. 
And if we then look at what was the selling point of Tech Manager, what was it viewed as at the point when it came out? Well, the advertisement from Google themselves was, you know, you don't need to talk to the IT folks, you know, and, uh, you know, marketers can do what they want and then let webmasters focus on something else, right? It quite, quite shows what world we live in at that point. Webmasters, right? Because the front end was mostly about CSS and styling and not about deploying very deep functions. So somebody else looked at it and said, what is this thing? Is it great? Yes, it is. Because you'll only have to talk to your web programmers once. You know, they just add the script and then it's done. And then you have digital intelligence data that's going to be so complete and the time to get it will be shorter, error small, uh, less likely to occur. And finally, you know, just to emphasize, it's always been hard to pass data from your back into the front end so it can be used on text. People get creative, but Tech Manager does this in a super way where the methods are standardized. And uh, it's not just meant to be a tool, it's meant to enforce standards, is what they're saying. And that's, uh, that's totally true. But then, begging the question, why wouldn't we just continue with the event-driven, decoupled tech manager setup that most of us have got going? Why, what's wrong with it? Well, there's a couple of things you already know, but just to summarize them, the privacy undercutting of data streams, I, I know that's putting it like at a particular perspective, right? <laughs> but um, it reduces the value and also the validity of the whole ecosystem of third-party uh, data streams and advertising. I'm not saying it's not there, it's just we don't really know. First, and then secondly, I don't believe in the sharing of first-party data. I don't think that's a viable strategy. Even if it's possible now, I don't think it'll be possible soon. And I don't like it. <laughs> and then uh, I think also forcing your business to Google standards is not really nice. And that comes both for when you talk about the event stream processing. And here I've called it the interface limitations, right? Because, you know, it's not that limiting, but the way that you have to interface with events very discreetly and separately, rather than uh, in a very scalable way, I think forces us into a particular mindset. But also, the analytics model limitations. You might be lucky that your business is one that conforms to the standards of a particular model for e-commerce and so on, but you might also not be that lucky. And if you're not, then what you've just done for, for a long time now is just to shoehorn it into this format and live with the discrepancy. All right, I think this is a lot of work for diminishing uh, returns. So, what then? Well, I think that events should be primarily modeled according to our own domain. And I know that I'm talking from, I'm not talking from a kind of like digital agency perspective, I'm talking from a client perspective where the business that I'm sitting in is one where we're doing transport and travel. And so a super long customer journey and super heavy internal data products that actually are more meaningful for us to think about. I think that the events we create it should serve a range of functions and not live isolated to support just the digital analytics loop or ecosystem. And I think that we should do event processing prior to routing. Finally, I think that a central, robust and asynchronous user creation capability that is not divorced from our internal setup and backend is also a prerequisite. So going into this a little bit more, I, for instance, have a need to understand quote requests. And I don't care if it's a form submit at all. The only context in which I care whether it's a form submit is if I'm looking at a chain of events to evaluate reliability. Otherwise, I want to understand it divorced from the context of it happening. I actually would like an event to serve a range of purposes. So a booking event online should also in itself be sufficient to power 
a transactional message, and the analytics, without us having to do a lot of transformation across these different usages. And we, we already covered this a little bit in, in Jim's talk, but we have a lot of things that we are sending data to, both where we don't know what we're sending, but also where we're getting a lot of costs by just routing a lot of stuff along the chain before deleting the mess. And then this one, this is extremely important, at least for us, because one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm aiming for is that users can be created in the digital touch points online, initiated by a user, but users can be created in many more different ways. They can be created in a contact with a customer service. They can be created by a salesperson in your CRM. And I think that those needs to be functioning in such a smooth manner to not really give us the problem and headache of downstream synchronization. All right, yeah. So I think that independent data analytics was a solution to a problem. It still looks like a solution, but I think it gives us a lot of headaches now because we have to constantly monitor. And the more we use digital analytics to power things, and that is you know, coming now, I think we're getting to a stage where events can be so much more rich, the more we want to power with it, like external data feeds, for instance, we're faced with all that reactive monitoring, which is super annoying. I think we should have events as first-class citizens, and that in itself, I think, moves accountability towards uh, whatever component is producing that event. So rather than viewing uh, a booking as something that then just is applying a piece of information to a front end or a customer, you should view it as something that needs to have a range of different attributes in order to fulfill its full potential. Just to take an example, adding a product to a cart, um, abandoning that cart, the people who create that experience also need to ensure that they have built it in a way so it can be leveraged in an abandoned card flow and land people deeply with all those choices preserved. That's not somebody else's responsibility. And then I think data contracts that we've also heard a little about is what would support this because it's abstracting the data governance into these data schemas and they are not uh, necessarily embedded into the different tools, but they're part of an agreement. And they are then followed up also with spe specified rules of how do you then alter your product. <coughs> you cannot delete or change, you can only add. You have to follow intervals and all of these things that the sort of more hard hardcore web development and development space has been following rules like this for a while, right? Yeah. So. Next step in the reverse engineering. I said we we're gonna do these things and bridging the gap, at least uh, where I'm sitting in my department, um, we are right now trying to abstract the event framework from the web context and trying to think about it in a channel agnostic manner in a, included in a data schema in a separate system that can then output um, type signatures. And then we want to deploy that through a framework agnostic tracking package that allows us to have it embedded in whichever applications produce meaningful events, whether that is a microservice or a front-end application or a back-end system. And then we're trying to, we, we're never going to get rid of Tag Manager or TMS ever, we don't think. It's just a super high utility to have a tool that is embracing the third-party world and allowing speed for testing things, but as the main method and main control center, we want to have our own and to be kind of respectful of all the things that happens behind the scenes. Our first step is to shunt a server-side tech manager with a Kafka go-between. And then finally, in order to allow for, for instance, a salesperson within CRM to create a user and then immediately understand as a magic roller deck what that person might have done if they identified in another context. We want to support user creation um, as an independent capability. Yeah.
Thank you so much for the great talk and making us think a bit out of the box and like, you know, about the new concept and how things might look like. I'll probably start with the first question. So you're on this journey now, right? And I love the idea of having different touch points together, like from, let's say, web part of the journey and then sales interactions, because this is typically where, you know, the, the, the gap happens. But then in terms of using this data, who will have access to it and like how do you share that data with the team? Yeah. So one of the things that I believe is that the, when you divorce these elements and you do the event-driven uh, architecture and you have very powerful events, um, one of the differences between the web uh, or the general development domain, where DFDS is also pursuing a composable architecture uh, direction, is that you, you are able to do more independent functionality on top of regular operational events. When you move into the space of sales and marketing, you need to do it a bit of a different way because you have to preserve the ideal. So when the ideal is for us to know what was said, that has to be also somehow organized. And that's just one ideal. It could also be to preserve a particular tone of voice. It could be to remember uh, the most you know, reasonable CTA in any given channel across. So it has to be actually organized. It cannot be fully decoupled. So I think it has to be structured. And that is what we are trying to experiment with. How do we organize the marketing methods and the sales methods so that they play nicely with these ideals. And the way that I'm pursuing it now is by saying, let's try to do everything with the requirement of it being automated flows. Because um, requiring stuff to be done through automated flows requiring, is requiring you to set the rules. And that is, I think, the first step of agreeing, is this the best use of this audience, or is it something else, and so on, if that answers the question. Partially, but I can catch up you later to ask more about yes. that. And we have a question from Doug here. Thank you. And oh yeah, yeah I'm standing up. Hang on. But, oh. <laughs> morning, morning. Uh, as ever, thank you for an awesome presentation. You always make us think, and that's great. That's good fun. Um, one thing that um, hang on, no, made notes here. One thing want to understand more. Maybe I misunderstood. Because um, you said you want to understand the outcome divorced of the context uh, of how it actually happened. But isn't, well, we've said for years, context is king, surely. Did I misunderstand, or is there a, a more nuanced view of that? Um, yeah, it, it, it was difficult how to phrase that in a sense so it became the most clear. But what I meant is that right now, for instance, in our space, we have a lot of logic that is embedded in the different contexts. And the rules for how to resolve what actually happened resides within them, that context. And that's one of the things that I want to kind of rip out of that space and put into the event. So yes, the event should contain the context, but that's exactly where it should be and not anywhere else, right? So, so I didn't exactly, I, I worded that, uh, you know, I was debating with myself how to word that. Yeah. So, check. Um, first of all, I really very much like the abstraction of the event mm -hmm. architecture. Can you speak a little bit about how hard is it to do? Meaning, I, conceptually, I'm hopefully there in terms of un, like understanding an idea, but operate, uh, making it operational. How hard, you talked a little bit about the technologies, about Kafka in between um, to, to handle event flows, um, but there seems to be a lot of strategy and then there'll be an execution part. Can, like, you've done this, how hard is it? And it's like, I'm... So the, the places where it's most easy is, oh yeah. And like, and like how long would it, what would be the, the planning cycle for an organization to make that sort of shift? Like, this is a six month, 12 month, 18 month sort of transition or, or undertaking, just to like give it a yeah. bracket. Yeah, so I think that this is definitely, you know, along the 24 month scale. Uh, 
And the reason being that uh, so much of development when you get to a fairly high enterprise level is done in silos. And done where you think about it as a, a very kind of small sliver that you're doing. And what uh, was mentioned around the product and marketing analytics uh, and the idea about feature flags and stuff like that is, is like, it's like a really good example in a sense that viewing these things as separate really, really is nonsensical. But uh, the step towards um, fixing that gap, at least how we're pursuing it, is actually through a CDP implementation to say that a yeah, business case approach, taking the CDP and then trying to say, we're going to do it and we're going to do it in a way where it can live on its own and it's, it's healthy and it's scalable. Um, and that then requires that suddenly the, the product team and the marketing team and the sales team and our team are sitting together and looking comprehensively at, whoa, you built the booking flow to support only part of these features. That won't work, right? Um, so I think that's, that's how I see it. It has to be through particular value that you're aiming for that will drive that change. But then some of the things are easy. In, well, easy, maybe. Okay, easy. But the, the path... <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. I just meant that some of the changes are, can be done behind the scenes, just like the, the data products that um, was mentioned that you use as an agency yourself. For instance, the user creation. <laughs> Since, uh, the, since my tribe, we, we kind of own all the composite parts and we also own the integrations. It's not, we don't need to kind of do any kind of work with anybody to then engineer that. It's just the pure problem then of figuring out how do we want it to work and how scalable and how much volume should it support. So, yeah. We'll take two last questions while the next speaker is prepping and then for the rest of the questions you can find Astrid later. So here you go. Thank you. Um, actually, it's honing on, on, on this question. Uh, so you talk about central, robust, asynchronous user creation capabilities, which I think is a great sentence. Um, and you just mentioned that it, if I understand well, goes together with ultimately the implementation of a CDP. Um, if I get your, your drift well here, one, what I'm really interested in what part of that process you feel you must manage in-house with and with, I suppose, an infrastructure you created. And what part you see as something that you want to use a vendor for, because that's just beyond what you are prepared to do in-house. Yeah, so we, we chose a segment because of its um, rooting and processing kind of features, and then also the, the profile stitching. All of the parts of the journey that are until the identification point, we are fine, somebody else is doing a vendor, that's fine. We don't need to, to struggle with that at this moment at least. But as soon as we bring it to the identification stage, that's where we want it. And so the way we are doing it is to build um, the user creation on top of a form builder that we've done ourselves so that whenever anybody gives us an email, this can then be triggered. And we're going to use the same component behind the scenes then for all other types of user event creation, which could be, for instance, when uh, marketing gets a list of people from somewhere, right? And they claim they've got permission for these people and they want to then upload them somewhere. We would want to use a component for that as well, because it would resolve immediately at the ingest point whether they were already there and then update potentially their consent status and so on. Hmm? Thank you. And the last question, Matt? Oh, sure. Am I supposed to stand? Yeah. 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 I'll stand. Matt, um, amazing, <laughs> I feel awkward in the front row though here. Amazing talk. And um, personally, I have no question about your capacity to execute this and shepherd this through. Um, but you're of high ability. And um, I just wonder how much discipline just from your, like as an outsider, and if you're dispassionate about this approach, uh, how much discipline do you think the organization needs to have in order to execute this and for it not just to, to draw resources and, and never really be effective? Like, does the organization need to be of high ability in order to execute this? So first off, I just have to remind everybody that we have not done this yet, right? <laughs> so before, before I brag about that, this is, a, this is a, our vision. So I do believe the organization has to have a fairly high level of buy-in. Uh, we're in the kind of lucky situation 
that the enterprise architecture has been quite um, bought into by the organization. One of the core reasons being that transport is a super um, old business, and so our core operational systems are extremely monolithic, very cumbersome. And so the whole journey and value of componentizing them is, is a very real benefit. So that whole journey means that you could think about the like layers of development, right? Where you've got the, the back end people, uh, the operational people down here. Those were the were first ones to be kind of convinced about the composable architecture direction and event driven principles. And then it's now it's trickling up. And so basically the, the experienced teams that are building uh, front end applications <coughs> are the last to become a part of it because their reality is not the operational execution of a service, but the marketing and sales domain. And they've just not met sufficiently in a holistic manner to understand what the benefit of the event products uh, will be, or data products will be. So I, I think it requires a lot of discipline, but I think you also need to have a good use case. As I said, if you're like a very regular e-commerce place, you might not need this, might be over engineering, so. Thank you so much and put your hands together for Astrid.
Hey, welcome back live from the Super Week TV studio. We're coming back with an interview that I'm really excited about because it's two things that I think are, they go hand in hand, things that I'm very curious about and want to talk about, and that is the intersection of paid ads and conversion rate optimiz optimization, so CRO. And so I thought no better person to talk to than Magda from Growth Savvy, and we're going to talk about this, how these come together, and how it works, and, and tap into some of your experiences working with it. So let's get to the first question, and that is, um, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about the CRO process when it comes to paid ads. You know, do you look at, what do you look at, what metrics are important, and is there any separation between channels and stuff like that? So what, what do you look at when you're talking about, somebody says, hey, I want to improve my conversion from paid ads, yeah. what do you start with? Sure, uh, excited to share some insights with you all. Um, when I'm thinking about CRO and paid campaigns, the cool stuff is that most of the steps you go through to build a CRO strategy are the same with the steps you go through to build a successful advertising campaign. So that's a massive advantage for someone who specifically looks at optimizing the conversion rate for a specific campaign. Uh, now, let's say that tomorrow we want to build an advertising campaign for um, an e-commerce business. And let's assume that they sell camera harnesses for photographers. Um, and, you know, the first question to ask here, that's also a very important question for building the ads, but also optimizing the landing pages on the website, is who is the specific audiences, uh, the audience that you want to target and talk with. And in these situations, it might be that because you offer camera harnesses to photographers who carry heavy lenses and, and cameras, like our friends here, <laughs> uh, it might be best to target people who love mountain uh, photography, right? Because that's the, that's the situation where they have to carry heavy tools for a long time. And okay, we might start with this audience in mind, which is quite specific. But then the next step that's going to be super important for the ads themselves and the landing pages is going to be understanding how these people talk about the problem and the solutions they are looking for. And um, I can't emphasize this enough, but you know there are many perspectives you go through and you talk with prospects, interview prospects and customers, um, and you try to understand how they are talking about the pains they go through when they're up on the mountains with their friends, how they do complain about what they go through. Uh, and that's the natural language that should inform and inspire the messaging on the ads, but also on the website. And it might be you also want to understand what triggers the search for that solution, which is another messaging uh, perspective very important. And some businesses, um, they assume that there are certain triggers, but actually, when you talk with the prospects and customers, you're going to find out that the moment that triggered them to search for a solution is the moment when they got home of, after a long time, a long day in the mountains, and because of the neck pain and the shoulder pain, they have a migraine, and they start fighting with the spouse. So that's a moment you should keep in mind. It's not explicitly the features or the technical details, but how they feel certain things, how it does impact them by not having access to, to the solution, and how they naturally talk with their friends, complaining or uh, describing their, their dreams, how they can become better uh, photographers and so on and so forth. So this layer of understanding the authentic language they use is an extremely important one in the process. And one last step we go through, and I'm going to stop with it um, to keep it simple, it's making sure the data tracking is working the right way. Because you're going to see that, as you also know, once you have the incorrect metrics within campaigns, you feed the wrong and you get the algorithm the wrong way, and the budget is going to be invested in the wrong audiences. So. It's the same with A-B testing on the website. You need to have correct metrics. Otherwise, your conclus conclusions is gonna, are going to be um, you know, less than correct, and we don't want that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. It, yeah, so it's really interesting that if you think about it, and I think the camera harness is a really good example too, somebody has a product, they know, they think they have the best product and they, they designed it for a problem. Um, generally that should be the same problem as their customers have, but a lot of times the first iteration of something is not optimal. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's whatever gets it out there. So you do a Kickstarter campaign or you do a, um, you do some kind of like put out a landing page, do something that's built on your e-commerce system and you, and you put in a bunch of bullet points because the template says that you should put bullet points in there. Yeah. And then eventually like, okay, well, everybody else is talking about how good they're doing with ads and our ads are not doing very well. Um, we were wasting our budget 10 minutes into it. Correct. Or there. And it's like, okay, well, you know, just be, you know, if you just did the first step of many. The yeah. first step of many is to, is to exist and to decide you're going to commit to doing something. But then optimal, which is like the second part of conversion rate optimization, and optimal is also the holy grail of paid media, is you want it to be at an optimal position, which means that it's giving you the best foot forward. And what gives yeah. you a better foot forward than using the voice of the customer, understanding what they want, what their pain points are. Even it comes exactly. down to things like targeting, right? Like you said that if somebody's on a mountain and they're there, could you do geo-targeting to the mountain zip code? Or you know, could you, could you do stuff like that? Um, can you look at their, their intent? Exactly. You know, there's so many. The cool thing about the ad platforms is that it, it's ads, can cr you can create a targeting yeah. for that person based on what they say. So, so I'd say that it's not just about the data of the results they did, but it's the yeah. data leading up to that results. It sounds like it's just as important. Exactly right. And, you know, when you just thought, I don't think you are going to go so in-depth understanding the voice of customer. And I'm saying this because when I started the business as an agency, you also, you know, run campaigns and do marketing for yourself. And I, I can't say I did from the first uh, campaign, I did all the research yeah. and I did it right. I learned, but also when, you know, uh, when seeing that this is so important and so impactful, like I could not delay too much and we, we did the right thing ourselves as well. Um, but I think that the weird thing about, you know, being customer centric, understanding your clients, as a marketer, you have to believe in it and take action before you see the results and you grasp the tangible value to voice of customer, like what's yeah. voice of customer, how is this gonna help me? Once you start really um, including the messaging and the words your, your people are using in an informal uh, context, you are gonna see how they connect with you easier and how you are gonna have better results. Yeah. I'm really, really a big uh, fanatic of this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it, and it seems like it's also an evolution in, in how many people are involved. You can get up ads by yourself fast. Yeah. They're probably not going to be the best. And then you keep on going. So I was going to ask you, what does a team look like as a company progresses? You know, if it's like a, you know, if it's a one person shop, I can only assume that, that the role is just one person doing a bunch of stuff poorly. Yeah. But then as it evolves and, you, and you, you start to care about conversion rate, you start to see that if you can double your conversion rate, you can spend half as much money and get the same results. What does a team look like to get this done? When, when it, maybe more at an optimal or nearing an optimal state. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the steps I went through before were actually targeted on teams that have one marketer and they do have like a data engineer to yeah. work with. Now, when I think about the way we do things at Grow Savvy, um, each advertising and serial program is going to have anywhere from six to eight experts involved. So we start with uh, qualitative research. We have a specialist for that, data analyst. Then they provide the info for the conversion copywriter. We go ahead with design of the creatives and videos. Then for sure making, uh, checking the data. So we have a data engineer. Mm -hmm. the, the ad specialist is going to lead everything and also is going to collaborate with the CRO specialist. So on, on average, we do work with six to seven specialists yeah. for each uh, program to build it the right way. It's, I don't want to scare anyone. Again, <laughs> keep it simple. And if you get right a few of these things that I mentioned, it's going to be a good start. Now, if you really increase the marketing budget and have so much at risk, I think it's important to have all these brains together. Like, yeah. no one is uh, almighty and knows everything, and I know that. And that's why, like, I do 
talk with so many people who know their job and we put everything together. Yeah, and I'm, I can only assume that this doesn't always have to be full-time roles. It can be an agency that has those pieces in place. It can be one person might wear a couple hats. So there's, you know, the, the roles are, are, the team may have multiple people doing um, yeah. multiple roles, right? So, yeah. Exactly. So you do have the expert, but I think as a business, you might need hiring. Um, you don't need that. You don't need to hire seven people. And yeah. probably a, an agency now, you know, I'm leading an agency, so... You know, what can I say? But <laughs> um, agencies are easy for you to um, access that knowledge without really hunting all these different people. Yeah, yeah. It's also difficult, like, to keep top-notch talent in a company where they are not challenged every time. Mm -hmm. In an agency, I do challenge them. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. And you get to see results across multiple yeah. clients, which yeah, is a exactly. huge advantage. It's like... I always call it pollination of ideas. So if you do an experiment with one client and you see the results, you can now you're not doing nearly as much yeah. testing, or you're, you're still testing, but you're not doing as much experimenta experimental stuff. You're like, hey, this one worked there, so we're already started. We've cut out 40% of the, 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 the pain yeah. This, yeah. You know, in order to get this one going in this particular area. So you get more, more efficient, better processes, and so on. Yeah, it's faster, and uh, it's just the way you learn when you work with multiple clients, but again, not too many clients at the same time, and that's very important to us as well, because you don't have the space to research and really understand uh, deeply each business. Yeah. So you have to really pay attention like um, to how many projects each, each person handles, mm -hmm. even if it's an internal person, you really need to give space for them to be creative and really understand and connect with the, with the audience. And this is not done when you have a very strict deadline and you only have five hours, we don't run like this. Yeah. We, we take the space to do the, yeah, the job. Yeah, yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is one of those specific roles that you mentioned. And okay. This is what my role was at my agency for five, ten years, and that is the traffic driver. I was the paid ad specialist, the, the one who yeah. did the keyword targeting, you know, did the landing page selection, ad grouping bid management, all that stuff, which is its own discipline, right? Like there's a whole, exactly. there's conferences about that. There's, there's <laughs> you know, there's associations dedicated to that. Um, so I've, I'm very passionate about that specific area. And I actually, I was a little bit more skeptical on gigantic conversion rate optimization projects if, if media wasn't involved, right? Like if they were two different silos, I was like, you know what? I can actually affect your conversion rate with the keywords that I select more than any landing page optimization project in the world because if you have crappy traffic coming in, you're gonna get crappy results, right? Exactly. And so I'm just curious as to, to is that just me being biased from my function or, or how much does the quality of traffic factor into everything else downstream? Is that considered? Is that, you know, is it just taken for granted maybe? Or how, how does that work for you? Good question. I think it's half-half. So it's half the traffic and half what they are finding once you, they land on your, in your own home on the website, right? So, but just to uh, emphasize how important traffic is, imagine that you have a steakhouse in New York and you have a banner outside your restaurant advertising for the best vegetarian dishes. <laughs> what, what's gonna happen? Not, like, not much, you're gonna get, not even traffic, but maybe curious people searching and, and getting into, into your restaurant, but nothing is gonna happen, right? Yeah. So it's extremely important, and I will say that even with an average traffic, you still can increase a little bit the conversion rate, but with a traffic that's really not for you, you can't do much. And the CRO programs are not going to be profitable for you. So the real optimiza optimization really starts with the channel in mind. Mm -hmm. And then you continue the same story as you go through the landing page, uh, product page, checkout, and, and emails. You need to have the same story, otherwise you confuse them and you disconnect everything you, you know, connect at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you're right. It, it's a cohesive experience, and at least talking to each other will make it make sense. And then understanding where the handoffs are, because that's not always clear. Yeah. And usually it's territorial. 
usually there's like, hey, that's my territory. Like, I don't <laughs> want it, you know, or, or hey, you know, you just do your job. That's all that we care about. And, and usually it's when somebody or something represents the big picture <laughs> that's really important, you know, the actual, yeah. you know, getting outside of just your, your discipline and, and representing what's best for this project or for the for overall the project, results. For the yeah. Business, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was curious. So I know we've, we're talking about like some of these things are aspirational for certain companies. Some companies like they have to have, an, I mean, you, you touched exactly. on it. They have to have enough traffic and enough spend where they'll benefit from improving that. Right. So if you're spending a hundred dollars and you improve it, you, you get $200 from your traffic. If it costs you a million dollars to, to, to double yeah. your, traffic rate, it's still $200. <laughs> you know, if you're doing a million dollars and you spend $200,000 and you double your, your results to 2 million, you just yeah. made profit, right? So that's, yeah. that's always a thing. But um, I think there's probably a common thread between them all. And that is what I'm calling the low hanging fruit. <laughs> and that is if somebody were just to, if they were interested in this thing, um, is there like a thing that you can go to and you'll always get results? Like you always look here and you get results, whether it's, you know, could be survey data, it could be copywriting, it could be, mm -hmm. um, it could be the data analysis, it could be the traffic sources. Is there, is there, is there ever a single low hanging fruit that works or is it like each project has a little bit different story? Yeah, obviously I could start with, it depends, but I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna focus on what I see that's important for each type of business, regardless of how, how many people they have in the team and regardless of how big the budget is. So I would really say that building this voice of customer report that's gonna inspire the ads and the landing page is the most important. You can chat with uh, five prospects, five customers, um, and then maybe also check your competitors' Amazon pages for reviews. It's a lot of language there. Yeah. Um, and I will say that depending uh, what's the business you are in, sometimes even only skimming through 2,000 reviews is gonna give you everything you need. And you don't have to be you know, an expert at skimming through reviews and understanding what's the language that, that repeats, what's the pain, what they're trying to say to you. So I would say this one, and the second best one is tracking a couple of metrics, but the right way. Mm -hmm. I like it, yeah. So yeah. understanding your customer is, t is priceless and it's timeless, right? Like if you know what they want, then you're gonna just do better with everything else. Exactly. If somebody knows the language of the customer and their, their concerns, then you're not writing for everyone, you're writing for someone. <laughs> you're you're yeah. putting ads out there for someone, yeah, for sure. And this makes sense because when you meet with people um, and you have a dinner, if, you know, the way you connect with them, it's through understanding each other experiences and pace and life, right? Yeah. And re really hear them. That's all, you have to hear them. And I think as a business, regardless of where you are in the process, maybe you have one hour to hear a client or two hours, but I think we are responsible. And it's a bit selfish to say we want clients now and want to grow, but we, you never take the time to, to hear them. Yeah. They all have something to say to you. And I think you know, it makes sense. Yeah, and, and they want, they'll pay for custom, or like customization to their needs too, right? They want to be exactly. heard and they want that, they want it to be repeated back to them. They want, they want to be heard, but they want to hear you saying that they were heard, yeah. which I think is yeah. really important. That's, that actually, that's both on the agency side to your clients, the client side to their clients, you know, everybody wants to, to have that. And it, and it takes more effort than not. It yeah, takes more effort than sure. being a cookie cutter, um, but, but it also makes a big difference. It makes a big difference and we all want to sleep peaceful at night yeah. and feel safe with whoever we work, with yeah. our team. It's, it's a lot about being safe and know that everyone involved acts in the best interest of your business and your life. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it for sure. Um, the next one that I wanted to talk about is, again, going back to paid media a little bit and just yeah. how, where it fits in is, um, is there channels that work better for CRO, for example? So I'm just gonna give mm -hmm. you an example of how I interpret channels. You know, Google search is, I always say like the, the holy grail of intent. Somebody's raising their hand and saying, I want 
information on this thing. So they're motivated. They're, they yeah. think they found you versus you think you found them, right? Your ads are their way of saying, oh, I found this person, right? So, or even organic That's results. Nice, yeah, uh, yeah, it's great. Like there's nothing yeah. better than somebody who's doing their own research and ready to go. They know nowadays that that it's a paid ad and they know that they're gonna get sold something, but it's probably what they want. <laughs> so that's amazing, right? Um, and, and sometimes it's just don't screw it up. Don't, don't get in the way of that, right? Give, let, let them, let you be the best answer versus exactly. interruption marketing, like display advertising. You know, remarketing is a little bit different because it's just reinforcing a buying decision, but mm -hmm. display or Facebook ads or like an interrupt on a YouTube, like a YouTube video, that type of stuff. Those are the ones to me that, um, can probably benefit maybe more from having a you know having that story nailed down and, and optimizing. But I'm just curious, do you have different CRO strategies for different traffic sources? Um, is that does that factor into it? Would you say, okay, we this page is based on this source. Here's how they're coming in. Is is intent ever factored into this, or is it more of like, let's just make sure that we put our best foot forward? Yeah. We always account for intent because some of the people are problem aware, others are problem and solution aware, others have many solutions in mind. So I think each channel has a place for a certain stage in this awareness journey. And uh, as much as possible, we connect uh, each type of campaign, it might be a colder, or warmer or targeting campaign, to a specific story and, and uh, messaging. Um, obviously, if you you know, you consider TikTok uh, and you un want to understand like how much of an impact the CRO is going to have for TikTok traffic or Instagram. Well, there is, you look differently at different metrics, right? You just want to bring some traffic that's engaged and uh, maybe sign up for a webinar or for a free trial or they bought a product sample, right? Um, and that's fine. That's the bottom, the top of the funnel. Um, and you can leverage CRO to measure whatever metric is important for a specific channel. Now, if, uh, obviously that when you look at Bing ads, search, Google ads uh, search, or even LinkedIn, you can uh, target intent very well. Um, obviously the CRO, um, the conversion rate uplift is gonna impact faster and immediately the results of your campaigns. Yeah. But not to say that it's not gonna benefit also the social media campaigns, for example. I would say in this situation to, that we need to pay attention to not judge dogs by the way they fly. <laughs> um, and we need to figure out a way to grab the attention on one platform, convert that into intention and then into action. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems like it's it's a non it's linear in some ways. Like yeah. you need to walk or crawl before you can walk her, right? You need you need to crawl before you can run. Um, exactly. That definitely happens, and, and that that's just how our buying behavior is. You know, there's if you've you've seen the awareness stages, right? There's like un, fully unaware, and then fully aware, and then there's product aware, solution aware, or problem aware, product solution aware, product, product aware. Yeah. And it seems like every one of those things has a it's CRO problem to solve and it has an opportunity. And so it, it gets to be exponential when you think about it, the complexity of it as you go through it. So if you're, if you're doing variations of the first part, different KPIs, then you have another KPI waypoint along the way, different experiments, different messaging, testing, and then you also have different yeah. segments that you're going after, you know? I'm going after this If you're lucky so enough it, to have so yeah. much traffic, you're yeah, going yeah, to Yeah, exactly. So yeah, there, it seems like there's, you could really get crazy with this. And so I think it does come back to what's the win? What's, you know, like figuring out, and, and like you said, every win's gonna be different, but figuring out what that win is. And so I think we have time for one last question. Okay. And so um, the last one I was just gonna say is, and this is gonna be an interesting one in general, but who leads this? Is it clients? <laughs> is it agencies? Do you, do you, does somebody come to you and they're convinced they need this, but they're not convinced that you're the right one to do it. And you have to, you have to convince them that, that your methods are gonna be better. Is it more like you go in there and say, you need this, I looked at your data, you mm -hmm. need this. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how does, is it usually led internally at a company or is it external that, that we, we need yeah. to fix this? Good, good question. Um, the way we pick our customers, we work with businesses that are aware they need it. Uh, 
so they are going to come to us and, and uh, tell what's the problem and uh, where they, they want to go to. Um, and then we handle the entire process on the agency side. Mm -hmm. But it's very important to us as a company um, to hear that the client knows and wants to solve it. Yeah. Because we also need their support to understand uh, granular details about the business and uh, you don't set, you know, tasks within a week. You have to go through the research. So it's a bit of patience and buy-in from the client you need. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we just uh, build A-B tasks based on assumption and we wherever we think the client needs. And we, we never do that. We don't want to do that. Yeah. So to us, it's very important that the client articulates the problem and knows that they want to work with us because we are, you know, nerds in terms of, Understanding the customers, having the technical uh, knowledge, but also coming in with the human behavior knowledge and psychology yeah. um, knowledge yeah. as well. And also being able to set a budget accordingly yeah. to be able to predict what the value is and prove that value to the business. They need to have their ducks in a row in order to justify investing because this is a pretty significant exactly. investment. And I think that's that's one of the challenges is that it, it's a significant investment because of the different roles. It's not like if you're fixing your ads, it's usually one role or two roles, right? Yeah. Somebody who writes the ads, somebody who manages the platform. You fix your analytics, it's a technical tag or it's the analyst, right? There's usually like a pair. A CRO is not, not in that way. This, so, this is a yeah. full context yeah. where you can't just hire the engineer or the copywriter or the ex, uh, the uh, designer. So it's like CRO, like I've been working in many businesses as, as a you know teenager and by the time I got I turned uh, 22 I had like 12 12 jobs <laughs> so I experienced a lot of jobs in the past and then um, now focusing on, on these topics but what can I say is that um, you know it's it's important to have space for uh, understanding all the areas and allowing the experts to, to do their jobs. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much for this talk. Thank you I too. really enjoyed it. Was it. Exciting. Yeah, and thanks everybody for watching another segment on Super Week TV. This is paid media and CRO and how they come together with Magda and Jeff. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this one. And I look forward to catching up with you on the next segment. So we'll see you then.
And um, first of all, applause. The banner is fixed, the conference is fixed, so well done. And I know it's after lunch, so you might feel a bit drowsy, maybe? Okay, there are extra signs there. Do we, do we, no, no, all good. So I think we can continue. So yeah, um, suggestion here, and I hope you, you know, run with it. Let's all stand up just for a second, because I know like, you know, we all wanna sit and chill. So yeah, let's stand up. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's take a nice good stretch. Exactly, Fred. Let's just follow Fred here. <laughs> <laughs> Out the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a bend to one side, to the other side. Oh. It's been a lot of sitting, mm. not that much moving over the last few days. Definitely a lot of drinking. So a bit of an exercise. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Feeling better? Yeah. More energy there? Yeah? <laughs> Woo! There you go. Okay, so who of you have been here last year for Fred's talk? Okay, and I've heard from many people, and I, I was here as well, that it was amazing just the way that we can learn from musicians um, in terms of analytics. So this year, it feels like Fred has even more interesting analogy, what we can learn from animals, um, specifically in agencies. And I can bet that there will be a dog there somewhere. Indeed. So welcome to the stage, Fred Pike. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> so there's good news and bad news about this spot, this speaking spot. First, it's after lunch, so most people are going to fall asleep. That's a bad news. Or maybe that's the good news. I don't know. But the, the good news for me is that I don't have Yehoshua doing one of his introductions. So I love this spot. So this is me, Fred Pike. And I, I have two flags on that shirt, one for Spain, because I lived there for several years and, and love that country. And the second for Brazil, because my wife is from Brazil. And so it's, it's uh, nice to honor that. And I also, you may remember, I have some Brazilian chocolates up here from one of my favorite places. Yeah, so uh, when, when I get good feedback, you may get a chocolate. You're amazing. <laughs> All right, here you go. <laughs> um, I think a lot about my legacy. A few people here have called me, have referred to me as the old man, which I don't like. But I do think about my legacy, and, and I think it's set here at Super Week. Because yesterday we had the Fred Pike banana bread. Now, if that's not a legacy, I don't know what is, right? OK. So I'm, I'm Fred Pike. I'm a managing director and one of the three owners of Northwood Software in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or as I tell Europeans, outside of Chicago. <laughs> um, we are a digital agency and a software dev shop. We actually started as a, as a software uh, company. And, um, I would like somebody to ask me what I did last year. What did you do last year? You already get, you know fair. Somebody else. What did you do last year? <laughs> uh, here. All right. <laughs> I'll owe you, John. OK. So what I did last year was a lot of GA4 migrations and implementations. I'm a moderator in the GA4 Facebook group that Julia started with 50,000 people. So I, so I helped moderate that. I'm a, I, I offer GA4 support for the Data Driven U community, Jeff Sauer's company. And um, last year in, in December, I taught a GA4 course with Jeff, and I'll be doing that this year too. So when I was thinking about what I could speak at at Super Week, of course it's GA4. I spent all freaking year doing GA4. So I said, Zali, I want to talk on GA4. And he said, Fred, Fred, Fred. <laughs> the Nor a lot of people are going to be talking about GA4. The North Star is anything other than GA4. <laughs> so I'm thinking, shit, well, I kind of hit my head against that. What am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, huh, I've got to look intelligent. I think I'll just stand here. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I do work with an agency, obviously, and we did face some challenges. So I thought, okay, let's talk about some of the business challenges of an agency in 2022. So what I'm gonna talk about today 
will, some of it will be relevant to everybody, but I'll be talking about an interim program we developed. Um, I'll be talking about the impact of inflation. I'll talk about stay interviews, and I'm also going to be talking about negotiations, and the negotiation thing in particular is good for everybody, I think. So the intern program, a little bit of background. We had a great 2021. It was probably our best year in business. 2022, we start off, and, and one of our senior devs, somebody that we love dearly that had led a large project for us for years, said he was leaving. He's going to a much larger company for a much larger team for a much larger salary. And it's like, oh, shit. When we're thinking, oh, I hope this isn't the beginning of a trend. But we do have people that we can backfill, obviously, and, and it was a good opportunity for some other people, but we, know, we knew we had to hire more people. And our normal channels for, for hiring devs was not working. It was really tough to find people. So we have had an intern program in the past that has kind of worked, and we have a person at, at Northwoods who is passionate about interns. He ran an intern program at a different company, and he said, okay, let, let's really try to build that up. So, we decided to, to really relook at that intern program and, and focus on that while we still tried to hire some mid-level to higher end dev people too. So sometimes you're sitting around and life just presents you with some opportunities to do something. And you have to, you have to go after them, right? Yeah. So I live in Shored, Wisconsin. That's a suburb of Milwaukee. That's our village hall. We're a small little suburb, 14,000 people, one and a half square miles, four, four kilometers. So not a lot of people there. And I'm sitting on the couch one night with, with my wife, we're watching TV, and she's scrolling through Facebook. And she said, oh, here's something you might be interested in. So I looked over, and here's a message from Kyle to the Shoreward Community Network. So, hey folks, long shot here, figured I'd ask the network. So this is you know, a small group of people, maybe 3,000, 4,000 that are on this Facebook group. I'm a senior software developer, I'm a yeah, senior software de developer who specializes in web development. Cool, that's what we do. Last six months, I've been working with a person who I think is now ready to take on a junior associate program. She's really smart, she learns really easy. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm interested. If anybody in the network has a spot for her, let me know. I grabbed my wife's phone and said, yes, we are definitely interested. That was a Wednesday. Thursday, she gave us her resume. Friday, we interviewed her. Over the weekend, we hired her, and she started in the intern program the next week. We'd already had somebody else starting in that. So actually, we had two people starting at the same time, which we really liked. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some aspects of the interns. And this is coming from Jerry, the guy who really is passionate about interns. The first thing that he emphasizes with the program is psychological safety, which I thought was really interesting. He wanted to create an environment where these interns can come in and feel safe to be dumb, to learn, to ask questions, to not be inhibited by imposter syndrome. That's his first goal, which I thought, it wouldn't have been my first goal, but when they talked about it, it's like, that's brilliant. Next thing is, we want to give them a sense of progression. So they're learning, they're coming along with us, they're learning. We want to get some business value out of them to, to the extent that they can be billable, working on client stuff, off, offloading things from some of our other dev team, that's great. Gives them uh, a sense of, of excitement too, that they're actually working on billable stuff. And then finally, a sense of purpose, because what Jerry does with the interns he makes them responsible for training the next generation of interns. So their sense of purpose is to figure out what works well in that intern program, what they're learning from well, what they're not learning from well, make videos if necessary to explain things, to just make the intern program better because they know they're gonna be teaching the next wave of interns. This is how we start Angela. That's the person that I found about that, that night. So, Jerry, the person who leads up this group, created a, a glip group, it's like Slack, a glip group just for her with, with Jerry, with Ben Schultz, who's a mid-level developer, but who's new to the company, with Aaron Stearns, who's been at the company for many years as a senior dev, and then with Angela. This is her safe spot. This is where she can ask any questions, get help from these people, and not be afraid of looking like a fool 
this is a good spot. And this, is, this struck me so much with what Simo was talking about yesterday. This is a community where it's effortless to ask for help. And I thought, wow, that's great. Simo, you stole my slide, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I, I really like the way that, that tied in. And we, we gave a presentation to Milwaukee Tech, a, a group in Milwaukee, obviously, about the intern program. And this is what Angela was saying. From the day one, my imposter syndrome was being managed. We're making her feel safe. I had a clear goal before me, get hired, um, a sense of purpose, knowing I could help train and mentor the next person. So she really bought into this. And she said the skill sheet was instrumental in overcoming some of the in imposter syndrome. So what is that skill sheet? Tim, you like that it's a spreadsheet, of course. You know, it's not an R thing, so I, I apologize. But so basically, we, we, we assign a score to the different skills that the person has. Zero, they've never heard, heard of it. Four, they're really good at it. And this is a sample of it. So this is day one, filled out by the intern. And these are a small sample of, of what the dev side have. If, if you're a digital agency, it would obviously be a different set of skills. But they self-select, they self-put down, okay, I'm a, I'm a two in bootstrap, I'm a three in PHP. This is their own self-assessment. At the end of week one, Jerry sits down with them and says, okay, where are you now? At the end of month one, Jerry sits down with them, where are you now? And then we can look, okay, over the course of the first month, where have you progressed and where, where do we still need to focus on? What's cool about this is that we capture the skills the new intern has right from the beginning. So like this person came in with PHP, that's not something we, we typically um, work with, but we added it to the skill sheet because this person was actually pretty good at, at PHP, cool. We, we, uh, we identify the areas where they need more training. We're illustrating the progress they've made since the first day. And the, and the intern program is a three month program, by the way, so we do this month two, month three. So they, they see, they know that they've learned, but they also have some evidence of it. And then um, as we're trying to make them billable to the extent that we can, we can look here and identify some of, some of the skills where they're good that we could potentially plug them in someplace right away. So this, this is a really nice approach, I think, to really make the people know they've learned, know where they still have to learn, know where they can contribute to the company. And the thing that struck me initially about this is that why do they do a self-assessment at first? And then it occurred to me, um, back in 2015, I thought I knew GA pretty well. I'd taught some courses on it, I'd, I'd worked with clients on it and stuff. And I took a CRO course from Pep Laja at CXL. And at the end of, which was a great course, at the end of that course I thought, shit Fred, you don't know crap about GA. What you thought you knew, you didn't. So I would have put myself at least as a three, maybe as a four, and I came out of that thinking maybe, well, it's not a zero, maybe it's a one and a half. So, so that type of self-knowledge, self-realization, I think is an important thing to realize, and the interns get to see that. All right, so the results. We've had four interns this year, we hired three of them. We would have hired the fourth, except frankly, there just wasn't enough business for that. Um, does it scale? Does it work? This is, we've had a fierce internal discussion on this. Do we continue with this? Because this is an expensive process. Um, actually, backing up. It's an expensive process in, in dollars, but also in time of the senior and mid-level devs to work with them. If we don't keep somebody, this fourth person, can we outsource them? Could this actually become a new business line for us? Because if we really have that intern program set, could it become another service line for us? I don't know the answer to that yet, but we're discussing that. And then the cost, like I said, we have not used recruiters in the past, but this intern program, we figured for the two interns, three months, between hard and soft costs, it's probably 40 to 50,000 bucks that we invested in that. Because we are paying the interns and paying them a, you know, a, decent, a decent rate. That's a lot of money, that's a lot of money. So does it work? is important for us to figure out, and I think it will. Um, but it also said, okay, if we're gonna spend that much money, let's, let's fight our resistance to use a recruiter, and we did use a recruiter to hire two software devs this year, too. So, we've spent a lot of money in this program and with recruiters. Um, all right, so that's the intern program, which 
frankly, I'm really excited about. I think it's, it's a cool way to get people involved with Northwoods and really give them a sense of um, ownership, of, of belonging, and hopefully of wanting to stick around and really help the next wave and grow with Northwoods too. Because you know, keeping people is so important, obviously. So, all right, that's, that's up for the interns. The, um, the next thing I wanna talk about is inflation and raises and rates. We, we got a little bit, well, everybody knows about inflation. So what are we doing with this? The, the typical 5%, 6%, 8%, whatever you were giving for raises before was not cutting it. That was really clear. And we, needed some, we thought we needed some type of inflation adjustment. I don't know about um, Europe. I know there's inflation here, obviously, in the US. There's, uh, there's, people are laughing. Yeah, there's definitely inflation in Europe, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So keeping this really simple, it got more complex. But we just looked at the different groups that we had and their salary, the, the billable resources, the salaries that they had, so adding up to 328000 a month. If we gave each department a 10% increase, what would that be? An extra 30, 33,000 bucks in expenses. So where's that money gonna come from? It could come just from the company, but that doesn't make sense, right? We've gotta, if we're paying people more, we have to raise rates. We have to look at what we're doing there. So this spreadsheet is really hard to look at, to read, but here are some of our top customers and the rates they were at, and this was the first time we really took, and this was really stupid on our part, first time we really took a deep look at, all right, what is everybody being charged across the board? So let's raise some of them, let's look at the revenue that that comes, and that brings up, I know you can't see this on the back, but doing that, $27,000 of the 36 that we needed. That makes sense. Um, so we did that. We raised rates for 100% of our clients. And the really interesting thing for me is that we got almost no pushback. I was really expecting some people to push back. And we had like some clients where just a shitload of work each month where we raised their hourly rate 25 bucks an hour. And I thought, I was, I was afraid. And there was like, yeah, okay, we understand. And it's like, wow, okay. So we should have done this before. All right, so we, so we raised it for everybody. We didn't do the 10% inflation adjustment across the board. Well, you know, we're not gonna be, we wanna be more judicious on that. But we did raise some, um, we did give some bonuses and raise some, some rates for some of people like our senior software devs to make sure that we wouldn't lose them. So we had this pile of money. It wasn't necessarily gonna be distributed evenly, but it was distributed how we best thought about it, okay? That makes sense? Yeah, okay. Tim, you're, you're nodding your head. You want a chocolate, Tim? Oops, sorry, Chris. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be, yeah. all right. Um, so, and the good news, at least in the US, it's an, it's an unclear picture, but there are signs of inflation moderation happening as well. So, yes, John. How did you, how did you go about the, the communication associated with, with those rates and rates? Did you jump on calls? To the clients? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how do you communicate those rates to the clients? Uh, it was a combination of some calls, some emails, some, I mean, whatever, whatever our best relationship, uh, best method was. But for like a, that $25 one that I mentioned, that was an email, actually, which maybe shouldn't have been, but. Oh, John, what would you like? <laughs> All right, oops, there we go, okay. So stay interviews, that's another thing. I don't know if, the, if it's popular over here in, in Europe, but it's become a huge thing, it seems like. I'm seeing all these articles about stay interviews. So there's something in Forbes about the 12 strategies for conducting stay interviews, and it's, it's, it's like an exit interview, but it's before they leave. So you're, the, the purpose is you're trying to find out if they're dissatisfied or, or how you can make sure you keep them. Um, and one of, the, one of the groups that is really pushing this a lot, a lot is called SHRM. It's an American group, the Society for Human Resource Management, Managers, I think. And so they've been talking about this a lot and it's important to spend time and really understand the, the employees' needs and where they need to grow and stuff like that. So in one of the things they're talking about, most day interviews take 20 minutes or less to conduct. Are you kidding me? This is one of the most important things you're saying to, to, have, to have these conversations with employees? 
and you're only gonna spend 20 minutes or, or less? It's like, no, 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 that, that. So the, the whole thing about the stay interview just rubbed me the wrong way because who do you teach to stay? That's a question that has a chocolate associated with it. Who said that? All right, Dookie. Indeed, you teach a dog to stay, right? So I didn't like that stay thing. Um, Pardon me? No, now I understand. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you, Juliana. All right. So this is not how I want to treat my employees, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> by the way, isn't it great that we've had a dog here throughout the whole session, the, the dachshund over there? I've just, yeah, she's great. Anyway, so. I learned something in 2022, a nature experience that has really stuck with me. And I, I tend to think of this better for the so-called stay interviews than the dog. So let me, let me just digress a little bit here. I love birds. We have several bird feeders in our backyard. And we have a bird bath. We've had a bird bath for years. This year, for some reason, this summer, this past summer, the bees discovered it. And this is not a good place for a bee because it's a slick side. They, they land, they kind of slip down into the water, and if they're lucky, I'll be around, I see them swimming, I get a stick and take them out. But most of the time they drown. So I spent a lot of time pulling out drowned bees from the bird bath, which is not what I want to do, you know? So what, what we ended up doing, and it's kind of hard to see, but there is this cool little thing down here, which looks more like this. It's a bee bath. So it's a shallow tray of water with rocks in it where they can, they can, they have safe purchase. They can go down, they can get the water and there's no chance that they're going to drown. And you can see how happy they look here, right? <laughs> That's a happy bee. <laughs> so the, um, the thing that I found really interesting, if we go back here, the bee bath is really close to the bird bath, but the bees all went to the bee bath. They didn't go to the bird bath. And I'm thinking, how do they know that? How do they know to, to go to the bee bath? How has that information gotten shared? And the way that it's gotten shared is through something called the waggle dance. And so the, the bee comes back to the hive, wiggles itself, waggles itself. The distance that it waggles is how far away from the, net, from the hive this good thing is, whatever they've discovered. And then it describes the angle. It, it tells the other bees how far it is and in what direction to leave the hive to find it. So, yeah, isn't that cool? Pardon me? Yeah, well, nectar, flowers, uh, any, any good stuff. So I'm thinking, I'd much rather use the analogy of the bees coming back to the hive and sharing that information and the, and the bees in the hive listening and learning. So instead of a stay interview, screw that. I want listening sessions. We have employees out in the field, working with clients, obviously. They learn a lot out there, obviously, you know? I want to share that information. I want to make sure the things that they've learned, I want them to come back to the hive, do a waggle dance, and share that information in a, in a formal process. And so what we've done with, with this listen, um, these listening sessions, I mentioned there are three owners. Each of us take a group of, of employees, and it's people that we don't normally interact with. So I didn't do it with the digital marketing team. I did it with, with other teams. And we, those people are normally meeting with their managers on a weekly basis or something. So we take over one of those meetings for 60 to 90 minutes, roughly, and it's just a chance for the employees. We ask questions, obviously, but it's a chance for the employees to share the issues they're facing, the good things they're experiencing. It's a chance, it's a safe place for them to give us their feedback and tell us what's working and not working. Some of these things, I've taken six pages of notes. And then, again, the three different managing directors, we come back to the management team and we do our own waggle dance. We, we share with everybody else, this is the, these are the issues that are coming up. And we all talk about it, we figure out what's going on. And I, I will tell you, 
the feedback from the employees on this has just been phenomenal. They felt, they felt listened to, which is great, which I really appreciate that they did that. They felt safe in talking to one of the other managing directors than they normally interact with. Um, for me personally, it's been a tremendously energizing experience to hear what they're going through, the, the, the good and the bad. I have loved these sessions. Um, the impact has really been pretty significant at Northwoods. So one of the things we found out is that there really, there were some technology issues, routers, old laptops, crap like that. We spent a fortune on updating all the technologies to, to get rid of those, to get rid of the impact of the issues that they brought up. Staffing, there were some internal issues that the people on the field we're really struggling with some of the people back at the company. So we actually let one person go. We have another person on an, on an improvement program. We've hired two more people to take, um, to address some of these issues that, that, were, uh, that were brought up. And you might think, well, shouldn't you have known that? Yeah, maybe we should have, but this was a place to really bring out those issues and, and have them, if you hear the same issue from every member of the team, you know there's an issue. So it just, it just really helped us um, address a lot of stuff. Now, now, what it requires is trust. The person coming in has to trust you that you're not gonna take their words and use them against them. The other thing it requires is that if you hear that there's a technology issue, and then three months later you hear there's a technology issue, and then three months later again you hear there's a technology issue, you quickly will lose trust. You have to do something based on this information. Which we, which we did, I think, and, and probably more quickly than, than we normally do. So I have loved these listening sessions, and it, and it really, that whole analogy of the bees bringing that information back, that, that like rocked my world in 2022. I just, I just think that's so great. So that's what we did there. And then finally, we'll end up with negotiation. So I lead the GAGTM practice area at Northwoods but I'm actually the CFO. And like four years ago at Super Week, I was talking to Brian Clifton, one of my GA heroes, and he said, Fred, are you freaking insane? Why are you actively involved in payroll and all this stuff? Hire somebody else for, for that. And it's like, oh, wow, that was a good idea. So I've done that, which is, good, which is great. Uh, I've learned so much from Brian over the years, but that's one of the most impactful things. So I did that. So um, I don't do much with the, finance, the finances now, thank God. But I'm still involved in the, on the negotiation side. And I, I, I hate these monthly recurring bills that come from every single vendor in the world. And it's so easy to just keep adding them on. And I understand the business model. A recurring revenue model is awesome. Um, a recurring expense model is not so awesome. <laughs> so, so I really want to control that expense as much as I can. Um, so, the, so I'm brought in on some of these things. So the most recent one, and there have been several examples, we're, we're going through a process for a new MA and CRM tool. We're leaving SharpSpring. It's a, it's a terrible platform that we thought was gonna work out really well, and it, it didn't. So we're leaving SharpSpring. We're going through the normal process of picking new vendors, and we ended up on uh, HubSpot or Salesforce. Big surprise. Um, HubSpot was 48K a year, Salesforce was 43. So they're roughly a lot, or roughly similar. SharpSpring was 7,000 a year. So as a CFO, I'm going, are you freaking kidding me? And I'm thinking, there's gotta be something on AppSumo for $49 that's gonna do this. And um, I actually did look on, on AppSumo, but I didn't find something. So we're, we're, we're going through this process. I also know, since I've been in this industry a while, that there are end of year discounts, right? These people wanna make their numbers at the end of the year. And we were doing this in November and December. So cool, and the, the, only, the only company I'm aware of, and I hate them for so many reasons, including Jira, but Atlassian doesn't have those end of the year discounts, which is just a shame. If they, if they had that, at least I wouldn't hate Jira quite so much. But anyway, I digress. So I knew there were gonna be end of year discounts. Um, Salesforce came down to 23K. Oh, nice, 20K off right there. So we go into the meeting with HubSpot and my marketing director has made a comment to them, we'd really like to be around 20,000. And I'm thinking, ah, what did you, why did you tell them that? Don't, you never say where you wanna be. So um, I love my marketing director, she's awesome. 
but it's like, oh my God, <laughs> don't make that comment. So we have the meeting, and what number do you think they came up with? <laughs> All right, Carolina. Several people saw it, said it, but uh, yes, 20,000, what a shock, right? We can meet your number. As it turns out, there are a few things that happened in the meeting, and so the price turned out to be 24K. And I'm thinking, oh, all right, 24K, it's better than 48, it's half of 48. 2K a month, yeah, I can kind of live with that. Shit, um, these guys are nice people, I'm a nice person, I don't really want to push back, and it's almost like, okay, I'll accept it. Then I'm thinking, you know who's not afraid to negotiate? You know who's not afraid to piss people off? Birds, yeah, dogs, yeah, birds, birds are. This is my, this is my kid Muggsy in, in Hyde Park in London feeding some of the parrots, uh, parakeets. Um, they are aggressive as hell, you know? I want what you've got. They don't care to, if they're gonna upset you. They don't care if, if they're gonna ruin the relationship. There is no relationship here. They fight each other. It's like, come on, move aside. I want that, those seeds. So I'm thinking, that's what I want. That's how I want to go into the negotiation. So I, I went in and said, you know, guys, we're paying 7K a year now. I don't want to go up to 24K. How about we do 12K? A little bit of silence. <laughs> uh, and I continue. I'd even sign like a two-year deal. Would you do a three-year? Uh, yeah, I'd consider that. And I mean, once you're in with these things, you're gonna be in it for at least two or three years. We're not gonna leave Salesforce or HubSpot, in the, HubSpot in this case. Um, so th they said, we'll, we'll talk to the finance team. So the finance team said, yes. And they said, not only for the three year, but they said for each renewal, we're gonna keep it at 12K. And I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'm thinking, yes. I'm thinking, whoa, I won. And then I'm thinking, I should have asked for eight. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, those are my thoughts on negotiation. Do not be afraid. You always ask for, be as aggressive as, as these birds are being. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you and my dog Shusha thanks you as well. And here's my information.
great. Welcome back to the Super Week live studio. I'm joined by Kelly Wharton and Tom Wesseling. Um, Kelly, I understand that there's something like measure slack, but then for conversion rate optimization, and I know you're going to correct me on that word, for conversion rate optimization people, and it's just as awesome as measure slack. Oh, I don't know if we can say it's just as awesome, but uh, we're trying to get there. Yes, the test and learn community, the TLC, is uh, for experimenters. Um, we try to broaden the subject a little bit beyond just uh, conversion rate optimization. So for research and experimentation, because we um, try to optimize more than just conversion rate. Um, but yes, the, the TLC is open to all, just like measure. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's great to hear. I'm uh, definitely after Super Week. One of my to-dos is to join that community because, uh, yeah, from you know what I've learned from Measure Slack, I know how valuable it is. So I can only imagine uh, to learn it in a new view. Um, Ton, you you were presenting today. Um, yeah, how to how to introduce you to the, the the Godfather of of conversion optimization. I think one the first presentation on the topic I saw was from you. You've been doing this for. 20 years? Pre presenting only since like 2007, when I, because at the previous company I was not allowed to share anything what we were doing, but I was <laughs> already working on experimentation and zero and optimized decision making. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I've been presenting about the topic I think since 2007, 2008. Yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm old. Yeah. And knowledgeable, mostly. I've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm still making mistakes, but it's the way to learn. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you, you had a great presentation. I think it was already broadcast on the live stream, uh, stream so people can scroll back if they, uh, they want to see it. Um, I want to get you both into this room because my spiel is the, the privacy angle on things. Uh, so I've been interviewing people about that. And one of the things that uh, is on top of my mind is what if we take our current privacy regulations to its extreme, so to say? What happens to the A-B testing software, right? I think I think of this from my Im implementation angle, right? I help uh, people like you to implement the text to make sure that the data shows up in your tools so that you guys can do your job. Um, but I'm worried because people are opting out and maybe the cookies that are used to stitch the sessions together are becoming less trustworthy. Thoughts? <laughs> let, me, let me start with you, Ken. Okay. Um, well, uh, testing by nature is um, randomized, controlled um, testing, right? Um, it's no different than in, in the real world when we do testing, and it's, it's sampling. So the people who are opting out are not part of your samples. You might say, well, then, you know, you're, you're confounding your experiment, right? Because the people who are opting out, they, there may be something unique about those people, and the people that are in your experiment may be inherently different than the people that are opting out. It's absolutely true. However, the people who are opting out have just told you that they are not interested in your treatment. Therefore, we don't actually care about uh, making a better experience or a personalized experience for those individuals because they've just told you that they don't want it. So we don't need to include them in, uh, in that experiment in, uh, when you're talking about personalization. Now, obviously, the truth of the matter is a lot of people are confused and they're opting out of something because they, they're afraid of it and they actually do want uh, an improved, especially when we're talking usability, they want an improved experiment, they, they uh, experience on their website and we want to include them when we can. Um, and there's a lot of experimentation that occurs um, down funnel and um, where customers have to give us information, like for example, in the checkout funnel beyond um, um, the authentication. So once that type of experimentation is not gonna be harmed um, by privacy regulations because yeah. that's not an issue. So the only, the only locations where privacy regulations are going to harm is it's really on landing page. So pre-authentication. The unknowns. The unknowns. And, and frankly, that experimentation is probably the least impactful experimentation that we do in the first place. And there's a lot uh, more than one way for us to make decisions with data beyond the standard A-B testing, button color testing that everybody talks about. There's, there's a, a whole, you know, 
uh, tool chest out there of research that we can do from usability testing to heuristic analysis, comparative research, and behavioral analysis, which we've been doing for years before we ever had, you know, all of these testing platforms that allowed us to do A-B testing. Yeah, I think, Don, you, you, you shared a bunch of those in your talk. Yeah, and also, I, I, I don't think we have a huge problem because, we, of course, we were in this paradise scenario of being able to track everyone. Uh, so we all went to the dark side and tracked people way too much. So right. we, we had this perfect scientific setup of doing large-scale experimentation, scientific research, and really knowing people. But that's not completely true because we were not able to identify mobile versus desktop crossovers, uh, several browsers, people deleting cookies. So we already had noise in our data. And the amount of noise will be bigger, but we can still a normal server-side experiment will have session-based data. You can collect that. Also, there's hardly any PI storage in experimentation, so that, that's, that's all fine. But indeed, re-recognizing the user, and they went to the experiment, did not buy, come back the next day, seen as a new user, so they could end up in a different variation, yeah. that, that, that's adding noise to the data you're collecting. But you can still make a decision. Of course, a really small change could be harder to see because you used to have better data and now you have a little bit less better data. So it could be that you will miss some of those, but the big changes, and, and that's what you're looking for, you will still see them. Because the other solution is not to use data. And, yeah, but that, that's not a solution. The, the, the running the AB experiment with a little bit more noise in the data is always way more effective than just go for your expert opinion. And of course, there are way more ways to validate decisions because we are trying to optimize decision making, right. uh, prioritization and then testing and make a decision. Yeah. And there are way more ways to back up your decision. Right, just because we can doesn't mean we should. So our goal is to make better decisions with data, however we can do that. And yes, randomized controlled trials and causal inference is you know, the, the peak of decision making, but that doesn't mean it's the only method. So could you say that maybe we were a little bit spoiled and now we're returning back to reality? Some companies are even now gathering better data because the, the shift they're making is they were not able to track users because they were not logged into the websites. And then I all shifted to a login environment. And of course, still the newbies, uh, the unknowns are still unknown. But yeah. once they are logged in, across the files, you will have the same experience. Yeah. So I think from product experimentation perspective, they're going to be working with better data. Yeah. I would also argue we're, we're shifting away from gather everything so that we can personalize, which, you know, if you really take a step back and, and force brands to talk about what they mean when they say personalize, they mean, you know, targeting. They're, yeah. they're talking about, you know, rules-based targeting. They're not talking about true one-to-one -one personalization. Yeah. Um, it, but when they, when we really talk about true personalization today, in the, or maybe I should say tomorrow in tomorrow's environment, if we really want to be customer centric and customer first and use customer empathy in this new, you know, customer privacy first world, instead of talking about personalization, we should be talking about customizations. And that means asking your customer, what data do you want me to have? Yeah. What, what experience do you want to be customized? What do you want me to remember? Yeah. And then customers are actually opting in to give you the data. And what do you want me to remember? And that's, that's exactly what GDPR we, we, is. We, we, we do have a data challenge that's more on your side, like when the vendors like Apple are starting to make changes in the way you can oh, collect data, yeah. so they're overruling and maybe you have lots of trust with a specific group of customers and they really want to share yep. the data with you, but then they, they cannot because Apple is blocking sure. this. Yeah. And then you have to be careful if you analyze an experiment to understand that the behavior of Apple devices will be different than the behavior from other devices. You have to take yeah. it that in. So it becomes more complex to get better trustworthy data, but I think it's doable. Yeah. I, I want to recap a couple of things. I think uh, in, in Siopan's presentation about privacy, she also mentioned something you just now said, like a lot of people actually want, if you would ask them, do you want a personalized experience? They say, they say yes, but then 
with the cookie opt out because they don't understand it and they're scared they say they opt out but you know they they want they want the best of both worlds both. right yeah. um, so that's something probably in communication we have as an industry have to figure out to communicate that more clearly so they understand that what they're opting into um, i think the, the the apple part that's a you know that's that's a that's a whole separate discussion uh, but yeah that's definitely a, an an interesting avenue because they are enforcing their duopoly status perhaps uh, and and using it as a usp uh, to their customers but they're also uh, wrecking a lot of companies ability to provide a good customer experience you could say in everything you just said one of the things that popped into my mind is is it like is optimization the way the way you guys do it on a daily basis is that becoming harder for smaller companies because of these this set of issues we just discussed it's always been hard for smaller companies because the trouble is the the, the, the story used to be that if you are a, a, a small company like the small fish you can swim faster than the big fish because they're slow in turning around but the big fish has so much data and they are able to learn so much about the customer they become better in decision making than the small company it's a good, it always was becoming harder already with all the data being gathered for the small companies to beat the big companies so maybe it's changing in a more positive direction that the bigger companies are less allowed to use the data because if you have less data, you need to take more risk. And this, that's typical for smaller companies. Yeah. You know, to survive, you need to take more risk. Counter argument. Interesting. I still think the big companies are, have challenges. I, I have been so impressed with um, the, the companies that you brought forward in the... Um, um, experimentation culture awards and the experimentation culture awards just amazed with the depth and breadth of what they've been managed what they've managed to bring especially the large corporations that, that has not been my experience at least with the US companies that we often work with they, they really do struggle to turn the ship around um, a lot of it um, the struggle is in um, well the cultural shifts um, getting the buy-in and um, you know, the change management. The, yeah. That's, the that's where a lot of the struggle is. Yeah. yeah. Um, conversely, small organizations can move a lot faster, but they're not doing, um, they're, they're able to do it at scale, but they're not doing it through what we would call traditional A-B testing um, and online experimentation. They're doing a lot of offline experimentation and a lot of, um, um, what we call structured ideation. So the um, um, heuristic analysis, comparative research, behavioral analysis, um, more traditional um, yeah. forms of decision making with other types of uh, research um, for decision making. Well, I, agree. I agree with that. There are a lot of the examples everyone knows are like the large scale tech companies, right. Amazon, Microsoft, LinkedIn, yeah. Netflix, Airbnb, yeah. what, uh, high skill, high velocity experimentation, but they are almost built uh, with an experimentation mindset from the beginning. Not, yeah. not, not all of them, but most of them are. Right. Um, and then if you take a, a 120 year old financial large enterprise organization, yeah. uh, and then you have a challenger that's sure. being built up as a scale up with experimentation in mind, they must be able to indeed still take that market share yeah. uh, fr from, from the old one. So they, they, ha they have advantage because they are just became slow turners and, and don't know how to use the data. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So those, um, let's call them the non-AB test ways of doing uh, optimization. Yep. If companies want to dive deeper into that, besides joining the test and learn uh, community, obviously, what, what would be a, a good starting point for companies who are like, okay, this sounds like something we want to invest more in? Well, the, I mean, it's, Get involved with, um, go talk to the, uh, your data science team. Uh, you probably have a, a, a qualitative research team, a customer research team, um, usability teams um, within your organization that know a tremendous amount about your customers and your website. Get involved with them, you know, set up. We, you know, we often create learning agendas 
um, where the, you know, the idea is like, what do we want to understand, you know, create a hypothesis library of all the things that you would do, just like you were going to set up a plan for the things you were going to test. Um, but there's more than one way to, to validate if, hypotheses. If, if, even if you don't have the data to run experiments, because you That's need right. a, quite a large amount of data, then you can still do the whole research phase. That's exactly which right. Which is used for prioritizing your experiments, but then you're just going to implement, and you can do normal measurements like before and after. It's less trustworthy, yeah. but it's still way better than not doing any data study on it. Exactly. Yeah. So it, that, that, that's, that, that's doable. But, but still, I also believe that the smaller companies, once they have, once they have the opportunity to implement a, a validation solution or experimentation solution, feature flagging solution in yes. their engineering pipeline, so everything that's being pushed live is being validated, and maybe not to grow further, but to make sure if you implement something that's hurting your business, that you're not shipping it, but rolling it back. Yeah. yeah. And once it is, it's in the engineering pipeline, like you do your security tax checks and your performance checks and the bugs and so on, then it becomes common sense that everything is being validated. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, that that's, that's the way forwards, to, uh, also for small companies, and even when you're small, it's easier to implement. Yeah, yeah. I, I've noticed at, at my clients that uh, just as what you just described, Whenever um, the development team or the product team is has an awareness of this, then it becomes part of, like you said, the, the way we ship code. And then it's really easy for the marketing team to be like, hey, we also want to do testing, not necessarily from a product point of view, but from a marketing point of view. The other way around, I've had more struggles getting things done. It, it doesn't make sense from IT perspective to do client side JavaScript, external yeah. JavaScript. Like they hate that us. doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Of course, yeah. it's an easy way, especially if your external landing pages is probably fine to do it like that. But it's it's, it's the old setup. We, we've been yeah. there. Yeah. Server side is the way to go. And also, in my opinion, uh, to really embed experimentation in a company, everyone always tells you need C level buy in, which is of course it's good to have a sponsor. But those people can also leave the company and take the whole responsibility with them. Once it's, it's embedded in your engineering pipeline, it's almost like a Trojan horse. Yeah, if you get better than C-level, if, if it's in the source code, you're, because you're set. Still, the, the review I showed, uh, the study I did recently, still uh, with quite well-performing companies, only 25% of, of the changes are backed up by A-B test results. So they're still shipping 75% of the changes without any validation. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. You're trying so hard on this part, getting some winners, and then That's yeah, right. they do three times more. Yeah. yeah That's right. Yeah. Um, you are both multiple times Super Week attendees, I think. Uh, this is my first year. Ah, like me. You're enjoying it? I love it, yeah. You're hoping to be back? I would love to be back, yeah. If you are at a future Super Week, perhaps next year, perhaps mm -hmm. later, what, what do you hope from, from your point of view, from the experimentation point of view, what do you hope the, the, the super weak crowd has adopted next year or the year after? Um, I would love to, I would love to have more conversations and um, with super weak attendees um, related to experimentation. We just sort of it's my first time here, so <laughs> so I didn't want to, you know, be overly pushy about, you know, research and experimentation. But we just started sort of, you know, touching the surface of yeah. experimentation in a couple of conversations. And when we did, they they became they were really great conversations. And now I wish that I had been pushier <laughs> from day one because they were fantastic conversations. So I I am looking forward to that uh, next year because I will be back. And it would be great to have some space in the timetable for just breakout sessions. Yeah. So with those 20 really passionate people about this topic, yeah. you can be in one room. So it, it has to be designed a little bit, otherwise it will be loose conversations. And we all had great conversations. It's an yeah. amazing conference. But that, that would be nice. But I, what I hope that they are doing differently next year for the ones that attended this year, something they take home, is that um, there, most of them are engineers implementing yeah. data, making sure data is trustworthy, data is collected, and so on. Uh, but they are also the best ones to analyze the data because they know where the data comes from. And I hardly see people here that also really translate the data to, into insights. Yeah. Maybe that's someone else in the team, but if that person doesn't know about the implementation and how the data is collected, 
they become silos. Having a little bit of a wider look at things yeah. instead of our... Yeah, because yeah. all these people are really smart and they can add so much value. They're super yeah. smart. Yeah, if. <laughs> to the organizations they work for. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of... I think Doug Hall's presentation tried to aim at it a little bit, and 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 Steen always tries to get us yeah. to think about the whole picture, right? But it's a, I think that's a, an, it's a never-ending battle. But uh, you know, specialists are going to specialize. But uh, we're creating yeah. our own silos. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, we've been fighting the silos for you so many years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, hopefully, hopefully next year, perhaps we have a, an optimization breakout. Uh, and I don't definitely... know. If it, I don't want to do. I I disagree. I don't want to break out. I break think that's in. the problem. I want to break in. But seriously, because, like, I literally have not come to Super Week all these years because I thought of it as an analytics conference, and I yeah, was wrong. Okay, so with the breakouts, we're creating, again, a silo. Yeah. yeah. yeah I agree. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, a hard, it's a hard one to solve, but uh, I, I get what back. you're Let's saying. Let's lean in. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you for joining me, and uh, hopefully uh, see you here next year. Absolutely. Thank you, Rick. Bye. Bye, everyone.
Well, here we are at Super Week 2023. My name is Joma from the Brand Leadership Community, and I have the absolute honour to uh, interview some of the brightest minds in analytics, uh, talk about their career, uh, the important learnings they have, and also the value of relationships along the way. I'm here with uh, Maria uh, Bacheva. How are you, Maria? It's great to meet you here. Yeah, nice meeting you too. And uh, and you um, you gave a really good talk, and I was really inspired to come and grab you and hear more about your story. Um, you know, you're talking a lot about organizational transformation and stuff like that, and, and you gave your tips, and that just brings me with lots more questions. But what I really want to know about is, um, is, is a bit more about you, the person behind the story. Um, but let's just quickly start um, Measure Camp, oh, Super Week 2023. <laughs> We've got all these events in our brain. Yeah. Super Week 2023, this is not your first. Obviously. No, it's not my first. My journey with Super Week started in 2017, actually. Wow. So, and I've been a part of it ever since, even when COVID like hit in 2021, and we had to do it completely online for 24 hours. That yeah. was also good fun, yeah. Yeah, we did the, the stream in from yep. Copenhagen as well. That was a lot of fun. In, in the pub, a bar. Uh, the bar. In the, oh, in, that in was the, amazing. Uh, yeah, and that was uh, very exciting. We had to time it with, I'm sure, some of these uh. people behind the cameras at the moment. But from our point of view, we had a lot of fun with that, and it's great to see that. But for Super Week 2023, what, apart from this wonderful interview, <laughs> what is going to be one of the memorable things for you about Super Week 2023? That's a great question. Um, and first thing comes to mind, is tons of knowledge and ideas. But then we all know that I think majority of people like at Super Week will agree that we come here not only for the talks, but for the sense of community and for informal chats and catch ups as well. So for me, Super Week, every time it's like a summer camp in, win summer camp in winter for adults. And um, that's always a, a bright memory. Yeah. And of course, this year we uh, we had a, a very special purpose, a campaign to get behind uh, supporting uh, Ukraine, because you're also from Ukraine as well. So how did how did you find how was the support from the community at your time of, yeah. of need? Okay, I promise I'm not going to cry <laughs> at no, this okay. point. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I am um, at constant out with the community and how they're supporting from the very first days, like when everything started back in February. I got tons of pains uh, from a lot of people who I met at Super Week and who I made friends with Super Week. And whatever we were doing like through the year, all the initiatives, they were always behind um, them and supporting them. And Zola and the team, I know they also did a lot like during the first weeks and keep helping and supporting and talking about like specifically causes during Super Week. Um, few things to call out is um, Simo's talk we had yesterday where he was calling out like the most reputable um, campaigns and most uh, reputable charities in Ukraine where we can help. And then what Jules brought up uh, in terms of what Lithuania is doing. And Julius uh, from uh, Analytics. Uh, Mania. Mania. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, about uh, what, what Lithuania is doing currently trying to protect air, uh, to buy air radar systems for Ukraine. And when he just, you know, approached me with this idea, it's like, man, that's amazing. Like, I was a bit too shy to bring it up because I already felt like community has done so yeah. much. But then, you know, we ran it by Zole, got his full support, got cool prices from uh, people um, in the community to run this uh, raffle. And I'm really excited uh, to see how we will, uh, how much we will bring up uh, today when we draw the ruffle, so... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, support well, I, I is you, outstanding. That, this is, that is one of my most memorable parts of uh, Super Week 2023. I know you didn't mention it's one of yours, but I'm sure it will be one of yours in terms of the community coming together. Um, just want to ask you, um, how would you describe, from a, a professional's point of view, or maybe from a Marvel Comics point of view, <laughs> what, what would you describe your superpowers to be? Um, I think that my superpower is to find problems and fix them. I think there is like a smart word behind that, like restorative power or something. Mm -hmm. So I'm really good in identifying what needs to be fixed and doing that quite quickly mm. and bringing people or resources together to make it happen. Yeah, and that's obviously, that's a, that's a great skill to have throughout the course of your career, right? And uh, I think you, you're probably like a go-to person in your organization, right, or, or with your the customers that you must be dealing with? Um, yeah, I think you're right here. And 
it's a great skill to have, but then it also feels like a curse a bit because once you get that reputation of, of a person who knows how to solve things, you do get many requests, but you don't actually need to solve all of them. And like finding what you need to focus on and delegating and then like teaching and empowering people to solve their problems on their own. That's another, you know, big um, side to it. Yeah, that's absolutely a, a, a trick. It's almost you're becoming like a mentor in some way so, yeah. that, so that you can, you can guide people along. Um, so if you could describe your career, because we, we obviously want to inspire a lot of the viewers out there um, at maybe even the younger uh, viewers who are looking at a, a career in analytics. But if you can walk us through your career from your time in, in uh, Crimea, I believe that's where you graduated yeah. high school, and, and take us through to today, what are the highlights uh, along the way? Um, I'll try to keep it short because there were quite a few things on the way, but basically my first real job that I was getting like money for was even before I graduated, I was helping my grandpa and he was giving me cash for that. And it was like in human hospitality kind of uh, area, meeting people, because I used to live in Kerch in Crimea, touristic city, so there were a lot of like foreigners coming. Um, and this is where I got this sense of like human hospitality and nice customer service. Then when I grew older, um, uni times, um, I was a couple of times on work and travel programs in the States, again, working in hospitality as a waitress, as a cashier, um, as administrator. And again, I think that's like one of the best skills to get because you learn how to talk to people and how to hear them. Absolutely. And also how to solve problems. Exactly, again. <laughs> exactly. And, I, and this is, it's quite, it's great that you mentioned that because because uh, I've worked in hospitality as well. And you can see the difference in those. They might have their masters or a doctorate even, but if they're in the workplace and they don't have those people skills, uh, you know, they're, they're really going to struggle. And it's always something I look at in a CV at the times that I've been employing is, have they worked in hospitality and, and, uh, and, uh, because you know they can think on their feet, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good school of life for sure. Yeah. And then um, after working travel programs, I went back to Ukraine, got my master's degree. And I was actually not sure who I want to be when I grow up. So I was- Neither am I, actually, so don't worry <laughs> <Still>. about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was going from different interview to interview, trying to understand like, what is that next thing that I want to be doing. And in one week, I had like absolutely random interviews from being like an assistant to a deputy someone to being like a teacher in kindergarten to working in a support in an um, IT company. Mm -hmm. And I decided IT sounds good. And this is how my path with IT and analytics started. So I started as um, support manager, uh, just, you know, answering tickets and that another, that is another like really good school of life where you need to if you want to be like successful in it, you need to find the root cause of the problem and anticipate like the next question and answer it ahead of time. I think like that's a also a really good skill to have. And then from there, I transferred to project management and product management, and then to sales and marketing and to analytics as well. Um, so I spent about six years in that company um, working in a startup-like uh, environment. And this is where you get to wear so many hats. Yeah and try so many roles. Um, and then at some point I realized that I want to get more of a corporate experience because I'm like really bad in politics. Like I don't get this pol politics games and you mm. know, like managing super complex stakeholder uh, maps. So as like any corporate experience. And um, I had a bet. With had a bet, you a bet, okay. Yeah, a bet, like we- Money, here's some money. Yeah, uh, beer. Okay. With, <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, with, with a guy I know from France who works on, uh, in an agency and I told him that I was looking for corporate experience and he dared me if I could get a role in uh, Google and he thought that I could and I thought I couldn't. And uh, yeah, I, I've been working for Google for the last three years and uh, it was like a very random um, path to take but um, I'm, I'm really glad it happened and I feel like over the last three years I acquired a lot of knowledge specifically in that field that I was looking for. Yeah, and it, it's good. I mean, you, you do talk about a lot of a lot of the experiences you had, like being in a startup. I mean, again, the, the hospitality role that you had, uh, bringing you into the startup environment. I mean, I would imagine your your creativity in in how to solve things and and seeing things created must have been really um, opened up new parts of your brain, right? In terms of uh, what's possible out there, right? That's one thing. 
but again, I think in order to stay creative, innovative, hungry in a way, you need to constantly go outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Speaking at a conferences, going to Metro Camp and like giving your first talk there. And um, this is something that like stretches you mentally a lot and gives you new ideas because you meet new people and not necessarily like you learn hard skills from them, but you get the inspiration, you get the ideas, you can brainstorm together. And this is where the creativity comes from. Yeah, absolutely. So, so now you're in, in the corporate world. Yeah. Um, and I've also been in the corporate world, so I know that there's a big difference. We won't go into too much of, of what it's like in there today. I mean, we can touch, touch on it as much as you can, but because I, I really want to also talk about some of the, the biggest changes that you've seen, I suppose, in your career, not, not just uh, in, in, in your earlier years and, and yourself changing, but you know, some of the big changes we've seen in the industry uh, and also, I suppose, in the time at Google. Yeah, I mentioned that in my talk yesterday that the only constant thing is change, like, you know, that we really need to be comfortable with ambiguity, be that economic uncertainty, be that technology changes. Um, yeah, like, I think if there is one thing that COVID taught us over the last few years is that uncertainty that we sort of need to, um, to get used to, to live with. And then from professional perspective, um, I think like big changes that are happening are in skills. So if we think about it at the, at the longer scale, you know, when I think about like, for example, my parents, they would get like one profession, one job, and they would do it for years, like 20 years, 40 years. Now you constantly need to learn new things. Like whatever you knew yesterday, becomes outdated and it becomes outdated tomorrow. But, and of course, like there are some um, things, some basics that are important, like, I don't know, in analytics, maybe statistics, that doesn't change every day. But then you need to be on your toes all, all the time. And one thing that I'm really getting inspired about is how people from different industries, and let me rephrase it, how people who worked in different industries, let's say, um, medicine switch to IT and that those ideas that they can bring in. It feels like best ideas and most innovative ideas come from that intersectionality of different fields. And I think this is what we're going to be seeing more and more in the future. Mm, absolutely. Now, we're here in probably one of the most amazing community events in the on the planet, probably the universe. Um, but to you, what What's the value of community to you in relation to your, your career so far? Um, it's something that can be, that is very hard to overestimate. Because when I started my path um, in IT and analytics, I didn't have any hard skills in that field. I didn't know, like, I barely had any soft skills besides uh, consumer hospitality. and community around me helped me shape my vision and my path and understand what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, again, when I think about Super Week, when I think about Measure Camp, you have so many role models and you have so much inspiration. And then at the same time, I, I was talking to Peter O'Neill the other day about it, that when I started coming here back in 2017, I felt like the youngest person on a conference. And now, six years later, I feel like there is so much new fresh blood and I feel like I want to give back and help any way I can. And this is something that, that is very sustainable and very inspiring in my opinion. So mm -hmm. um, the value of community, yeah, like I cannot put a price on it, it's, mm -hmm. it's too high. Yeah, and one of the things that Simo uh, really surprised me with, and I was almost crying when he was, I was speechless actually, because he was talking about the value of community and, and his, as you were talking about um, offering advice uh, and help is, uh, is really important. But he took it a step further. Is when you offer help, you're actually digging deep and you're learning yourself. You're discovering a, a new solution to a new problem that someone else is going through um, and, and stuff like that. I, I believe you're also active with, uh, with women in analytics as well? Is that something that you've been looking at nurturing? Um, yeah, so when um, 
there is this saying that if you want to learn something, try to explain it to someone else, right? Um, and this is exactly what I see with analytics happening. Um, I'm aware of women in analytics community. I cannot say that I'm an active member of it, uh, but I think if we talk about representation, there are definitely quite a few things that we can bring to this particular conference to make uh, women in analytics more vocal and more visible for the community. And um, we had this uh, first women uh, analytics award this year, so that's, that's exciting and very empowering. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier like about role models, right? I think that we do have few role models, uh, women role models in analytics, but we need more and or maybe make them more visible. Um, I read this uh, study not so long ago about Scully effect. Have you heard of it? No, I haven't. Okay, have you watched X-Files? Uh, back yes, in the day? Okay, yes, X-Files. Yeah, yeah. This goes way back into the, the Exactly. The so yeah. what they've done, they, um, and like I'll try to explain really quick. So basically, um, Dr. Scully, she was one of the first models in um, forensics and, you know, like being cool. She was badass. <laughs> exactly, exactly, to say the least. So years later, they um, did this research where they talked to women who were in STEM and they tried to attribute if their decision to go into STEM was influenced by that role model. And I think around 60% said that it was. So yeah, we need more role models. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Maria, it's been uh, really nice to sit to meet you, first of all, and actually to get to know you a bit better, even though in a more formal environment. Um, and we're definitely going to see you back at Super Week. I'm hoping to come back as well next year. And I hope you can also make it to um, Copenhagen uh, Measure Camp and or Web Analytics Wednesday in Copenhagen. It'll be great to see you. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. This is uh, Joma and signing off for this uh, episode. Cheers.
And here we are at uh, Super Week 2023. My name is Joe Marez from the Brand Leadership Community. And once again, I have the honour to uh, interview some of the brightest minds in the analytics industry, talking about their career journey, uh, the importance and learnings, uh, and the value of the relationships and community. Today, I have, oh, right now, I have uh, Marie Fenner from um, uh, Piano Analytics. Uh, Marie is the uh, now, the Global Senior Vice President at uh, Piano Analytics, and we'll get you to explain that in a bit. <laughs> but first of all, I just want to open with, uh, this is your first Super Week. It is. Delighted to be here. Um, we've had, as a company, obviously, this is a very important event, and uh, we used to have our my colleagues um, being here last year. We had uh, Declan and Nicola, Nicholas um, joining, and we had a you know, really good networking and exchange. But this is my first time, and I really wanted to, I've heard it from my team members and colleagues, but I really wanted to experience it myself and um, have been actually out of the game in terms of actually networking with uh, our analysts community for a little while due to my role yeah. um, and I want to want, wanted to get back in the yeah, game. Absolutely. That's absolutely. why I'm here. <laughs> so, so what, what are some of the, the most memorable things you'll be remembering thinking back at uh, uh, Super Week 2023? Wow. The talented speakers um, and um, sort of depth they go to. And I was actually very surprised because I've always felt that this is really analyst community, almost dare I say, geeky. But the variety of the contents and the presentations that I've seen over the past few days is amazing. The, the breadth, not just the sort of different topics, but the breadth um, and the depth mm. is just amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it's and we are all trapped here for five days. Trapped? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, voluntarily, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we really get to go go deep and explore that that uh, that depth and that and that width. So. Um, your role, I mean, you recently, uh, from what I saw on LinkedIn, you were promoted to, to a global role, uh, which told me that just means a lot more work, basically. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, well, no rest for the wicked. That's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, if you, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person, and uh, ab absolutely. But I'd, I'd really like to explore your career path from, from the beginning when your career started. I mean, you know, leaving you know, high school, I often consider that when, oh, gosh, um, when people go to university. Not long ago. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, we've got time as well. So it's and it's yeah, but um, but but tell us if you can just overview uh, your time and, and how you decided on your path or what influenced uh, you in this path because this hopefully will help people at that early stage also understand the path that's been travelled by someone like yourself who's mm. in a senior position in a uh, a company that provides a, a tool to an industry. So um, so tell us about where did it all begin for you? Oh gosh. Um... So I actually started in computer hardware rather than software, and that was my starting. So moving boxes, um, you know, PC towers and all that stuff, that dates. Um, yeah, <laughs> and that was that was wonderful. Um, but I decided to go into software because that was you know the place to be. Um, and it was back in 2002. I joined a small company called Netstat, um, which became Comscore afterwards. So I stayed there for 10 years. I, I think I was an employee number three in the UK. Um, and that's where I fell in love with um, analytics, data, the power of it. And back then, I'm talking about early, you know, sort of 2000, 2002, um, there were still, most companies were still relying on log files. The SaaS business was starting out. Um, mm. And I remember re evangelizing the benefit of um, SaaS business at the time. Mm. And I started like that. And when, when I joined the company, um, we, we were smallish in the UK, breaking into different verticals. And we weren't big, which meant you had to do a lot of things. So although I don't come from developer background, I don't have any software skills, um, I learned to do JavaScript implementation, actually quality, you know, doing the data quality check in, in JavaScript and checking in the reporting and running reports, doing client trainings, um, all of that. And that sort of gave me that knowledge base. Mm. And um, this is a skill that you have to continue to hone in on. It's not something that you learn and then you just you keep using the same mm. thing. So for the last, that was so 20 years ago. Um, so since then, I've sort of moved from Comscore into AT Internet, which now became Piano Analytics. Yeah. So I started as a, 
um, client management um, sort of as a, a practitioner doing actually analytics and using the data for the benefit of the clients um, and became the sort of resident expert uh, within the company. And with that, um, I think I was lucky um, going into management, but still very hands-on working with our analysts and our clients. And I'm, I'm really passionate. I, I get that a kick out of um, speaking to the clients mm. and when they say, we do this using your data. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that, that keeps me going. Yeah, that's, that, that's amazing. And I, I love how you bring it back to, you know, evangelising mm. the, the SaaS environment. For, for me, I was working in IBM in, in the mid-90s mid and uh, I was helping configurations with mainframes uh, and stuff like that. And uh, it was all software as a service. It was monthly licence fees as well. And it's amazing how things are almost circular, right? So, so do, you, do you find that, um, you know, you can't sit still in this industry, right? And you, you, it is constant learning, right? Um, and a lot of what you're telling me, like how much, if, if, we, if we talk to the Marie 20 years ago, uh, what would she look at you and see? Would she be like, are you crazy? Or would she be proud of you? What, what would what I think I would be very proud of myself yeah. uh, in that uh, I sort of almost stumbled upon um, software business and I didn't really, really realise the value of the data analytics back, back then. Um, but over the years... Um, even now, I know there are some companies who still just lose the data. There's not, we talk about, you know, sort of data-driven decisions and companies, etc. but there are still companies who are not quite doing that. And what really boils my blood is when I come across um, companies who have a really wonderful tool set, whether that be Piano Analytics, or it'll be Analytics, Google Analytics, they still have that, what, what I call, consumption gap. So mm -hmm. the tool can do uh, a lot of things, and yet they're leveraging only a small part of that, mm. whether that be skills gap, et cetera. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, sort of not fighting, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission to reduce that consumption gap, make sure that uh, whatever tool you're using, ideally piano analytics, but uh, the clients are getting the value out of the, the platform they're using mm. and um, the data that it provides. I'd, I'd really like to talk about that whole skills gap or that implementation gap or whatever you mm. call it. But I, I really want to, just before we move further, I would like to ask you, um, what do you see as your superpower? I call a superpower something that you're known for, that you're good at, that you love doing, uh, that people come to you for. This is, this is I, I just call that a superpower or a set of superpowers. What would you describe uh, yours to be? Ooh, um, it's not a secret weapon, but I'm known as that person within the company. Although my current role is I'm a, an executive sponsor in our client relationship and new businesses, etc. Um, and people very often think, and most of us think that, oh, she must be just a management person. Um, but you put me in front of a client, I have a field day. That's my ground where I really want. So I think my the core skill set is not just about the knowledge of analytics extraction, but, but I am interested in genuinely how we can help the client's business. Mm. So having a conversation on what our client's business objectives and we need to align what we are delivering because otherwise the value that we will deliver will be completely misaligned. As a result, the consumption gap starts mm. happening. So I think my, I'm, I'm very proud to have that skills of not just in management, but also having this deep-ish knowledge in analytics, what it can do, what the, what the data can do, mm. and that mapping um, that, that capabilities with the client's uh, yeah. business objectives. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you, you've spoken about, um, about the whole uh, getting those things together. For, for me, I've, I've worked on the client side or with a brand. I've also worked with a vendor and I've also worked with an agency. So I have this crazy view on a lot of things, right? And, and I often feel that uh, when I'm back on the client side, I'm like, wow, that's right. It's, it, we, there are challenges from mm. the client side, right? There's the bureaucracy, there's the Game of Thrones effect, there's the, the slower, what seems to be a, a more, you know, slower pace in, in, in developing. How, how do you, do, do you see this uh, in the clients you deal with and, and is this something that you can help navigate them with? Is that whole internal culture that, that a brand, a lot of brands struggle with compared to agencies or vendors? Mm. I, I must admit, that's not the battle that we always win, but we, we do, do try. And we are extremely 
privileged to work with clients in different walks of life. We have a, a large and very mature clients like BBC who have an army of analysts who are using our data day in, day out, and they have this enormous data-driven culture. As a public organization, you have to, mm. have to prove and justify every spend that you do. At the same time, we have a small and medium-sized clients who want to do something, and yet either they don't have the skills to do so, or resources to do so, or even budget to do so. Mm. So um, in that case, sometimes we you know, deploy our own resources to help clients out. We do, we do try and really promote self-service aspect as well. As, you know, we, obviously, we want to work closely with our clients, but we, we want our clients to be self-sufficient, um, driving more value, and not afraid to come and talk to us um, every day in, in their daily lives um, to get some more value of, out of our solution. So as long as there's this culture, which is the big question, as mm. long as there's a, a, a desire and drive, I mean, we're not a, a, a free solution, which means somebody's paying whatever that amount is. Um, and as long as the company wants to get value out of that and not afraid to actually ask us for support, we are very open to. So we work very collaboratively with our mm. clients. And actually, P Analytics, we have a three key pillars. One is better data championing the case of GDPR, as well as data quality, no sampling, etc. And we have a, data, a second aspect is the better, um, better data and better, uh, uh, gosh, I should know, <laughs> <laughs> better data and better tools. Because the tools, you know, some people are, re I mean, everybody, 200 people here um, mm. this week are very savvy. They, they, will, they will know Python, R, all sorts of stuff. Mm. But many of our clients are marketers or business people who mm. need to be able to access data easily without having, you know, really um, sort of high skills, etc. Mm. And the third aspect, which I wanted to get to, was the, um, the better relationship. Mm. Um, so it's all good to have a better tooling that you, you, you can have, um, better data, which is very important, but it's that human aspect where, especially if you're a small organisation with a, maybe one um, person who's looking at part-time, looking at the data, we are here to mm. help them. Mm. And from, from your perspective, you know, and, and you are in that vi environment of, of people, processes and technology, which is great, and we've had, you know, we've, over the last five years, ten years, we've seen huge changes, whether it's privacy, whether it's geopolitical, mm. uh, whether it's, you know, a looming recession. Um, what do you see, and I suppose still on your career from a personal point of view, and, and you can also use uh, you know, piano analytics as an example, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've seen uh, in your career, you know, working at, at, uh, at piano, and, and how have you, how have you been agile enough or, or found solutions to move beyond those problems and, and into solutions? What are some that you can think of? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so GDPR lately, when I say lately, because uh, when you talk about 20-year career, lately means like a five, six years. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm there with you. I'm, I'm exactly um, with you, don't worry. And obviously, since 2018, GDPR um, has been a, a very important. I think early days, like because GDPR was enacted in May 2018. Yes. I don't think people really realise what that meant. And no. now, penny dropped. And there are countries like France where data authorities are actively going after you if you're doing the wrong thing. And you are being fined. And you are given the final warning to rectify. And as a result, some companies are having to just get rid of their analytics and running the business blind, which is a really scary mm. thing to do. So I think finding the way to be GDPR compliant, respecting our, um, you know, consumers' privacy. And I think that's the not a, a challenge. It is a challenge, but it's not a threat. It is an opportunity. Mm. If you do it well, you will build better relationship with your consumers and build that trust. Mm. And um, if you choose well, you will create that competitive advantage um, as well. Because there are solutions like Piano Analytics where you can get 100% of audience visibility mm. all at the same time being um, GDPR compliant, mm. for example. So that's one thing that uh, I, you know, we are experiencing now. Um, but earlier than that, overall, um, I think we're... Um, something we call data model or sort of unified data model where in olden days and even now you have a 
web going on, app going on, two different models going on. If you have a multiple countries that you're operating in, multiple sites, you're still struggling to roll up. And even having a roll up report is painful or costly. Mm. I think it's very important that uh, companies look at their how you want to measure, what you want to measure, and having the flexibility to do so rather than having a vendor lock-in where this vendor is giving this model and we have to fit our business model into that. And that's what we've seen. And that may work, you may fit in now, but maybe six months or six years down the road, you are stuck in that model. And that means you are actually creating a technical debt yourself that you mm. can't extra, you know, get yourself out of um, that. And we're, we're, a lot of companies are moving, you know, migrating from uh, forced to migrate from UA to GA4. And there are many benefits of, uh, of GA4. But if you are migrating, have a look at uh, is this migration, which is a quite you know, humongous task. It's a big as well. thing, yeah, absolutely. Have a look at um, are we doing the right thing? Is it going to future proof our business at least for the next five years? I think we need to have a look at that, not just short term, because UA is going away in July 2023. We need to do something about it. I think we need to look at a little bit longer term. And you, um, GA4 may be the perfect solution, um, but it may not be. But mm. I think it's important that the company looks at what we need to do rather than this solution works this way, let's fit mm. into that. Well, I mean, it's exciting times for like, a, like a, an alternative to, to GA that, that's been so dominant over the years. And uh, last week we ran the, uh, the uh, uh, analytics masterminds where we surveyed Indeed, the audience. Yes. And, brilliant. We, and there was there was no surprise in terms of, you know, the majority of people were on the Google platform and then Adobe, but uh, a lot of companies are right now re-evaluating their their data stack and their tech stack because mm. it's time and it's an opportunity to clean out, you know, clean out and start again, right? Um, moving forward, um, potentially you could see the migration of a lot of companies onto your platform. Um, are, are you going to be prepared for things like training and implementation and and because these are potential issues moving forward, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And this is, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the better relationship part mm. is very important for us. And as a company, we want to build that relationship and build that even community with our clients. We have a customer advisory board that we run to invite our strategic clients to have a direct influence in our roadmap and things like that. Those are very important. But also, we don't have a finite resources within Piano. Piano, we are 650 um, people company and most people we have are actually active frontline people and R&D people. Still, we're not in every single country, we're in 18 countries um, and we have clients in, you know, asking for our solution in India, as far afield as, uh, you know, Asia, etc. So we do build and we have built, so we've done a good job so far and there's more to do, is to create that network of um, partners that who, are, who welcome our solution, who see the value in our solution, and um, I wouldn't call it quite you know, certified partners, but mm. we, we are um, recruiting or for searching yep. for a, a, a really good partners uh, who will represent work. and yeah. deliver quality work to our clients. Yeah. And, and they are, you know, some of them are big agencies in, in, in the world, but mm. many of them are actually one-man band who mm. have a deep relationship with their clients and they are very often the best. Mm. Now, you know, we're talking a lot about relationship and you mentioned community. I, you know, I, of course, I'm with brand leadership community and I went in that direction because I firmly believed in my same 30-year career that it really comes down to community and you have things like passion. I can see the passion in you in the job that you have, right? So, so tell me a little bit about, for you, um, what does community mean to you and how do you see that in the future evolving for you and for the company that you're working at and maybe the industry as well? What are your thoughts on Absolutely. community? I think community is vital. Um, it can be your community that you build. I mean, Google built a phenomenal community um, and we're trying to do that, as I mentioned, with our customer community, et cetera. Um, but we learn from each other. It's, um, it's a strong yearning from, I, mean, I, hear, I see and hear here this week, everybody wanting to learn from each other and actually help each other to learn. And Simo was saying yesterday as well, it's, uh, um, I can't remember exactly how we said it, but uh, um, the fact that you are actually willing to share, you are actually learning by doing yeah, that. I, I mentioned that uh, previously with Marie as well. Uh, that, that got me as well that, uh, 
you're actually taking a, as lot as much as you're giving in, in different ways. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and I think community, and and because um, you know you, you and I we've been in this industry for uh, for for quite a while, and Peter O'Neill was there yesterday. He and I used to work together at uh, when yeah. we were in that stuff, and um, we supported very much a um, uh, measure camp community as well, um, and you become the part of the community rather than you know very often we're seen as oh they are sponsors no mm. we're more than sponsors we're here to sponsor the the community that we really value because we need to sort of feed off each other bounce ideas off each other mm. and i think it's very important and we're, we're definitely committed to um, being part of the community and nurturing the community and deliver or give and share whatever we can marie thank you for sharing a bit about Pleasure. your career and a bit about uh, piano as well. <laughs> so, Pleasure. Uh, Delighted to be here. Thank you very much for having thank me. Thank you. And uh, keep an eye out. I've got a few more people that I'll be delving into their career path, hopefully giving you insights and tips of where to go in your future career in this fantastic industry. This is Joma and I'll see you soon.
Hello, welcome back to the TV studio at, here at Super Week. And it's the first time for me here, so I'm really proud and happy to be there. And today we are going to talk about analytics and ethics. And I'm super lucky because I'm joined here by two wonderful persons that both spoke today actually at uh, Super Week. And we have Tim Wilson, that is the co-host actually of the Analytics Power of our podcast. And actually, I hope to say your name super good, which is, uh, I wrote it just to be sure, Shoban Solberg. Perfect, which is the like founder of Race, an agency, okay, in, in Greece, if I'm not, not yeah, wrong. I'm okay, in Greece. Perfect. Yeah. So um, ethic for me is quite an important subject. And actually, I think for my world generation, sustainability and ethics are two buzzwords all over the world. And I'm wondering if actually is a word that can be applied also to analytics. And we spoke about that last year <laughs> with Tim. So maybe if you want to go first and I think <laughs> to share with you. <laughs> Whether ethics can be applied to analytics? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I think they... I think they should be, but I think it's really easy to feel other forces kind of kind of pull us in other directions. And I mean, yeah, they absolutely should be, but we see on and on and on again unethical behavior. And I don't know how intentionally that has happened and how much it's just somebody took one step, one step, and next thing you knew they were in too far. But I think it can be applied to analytics. It should be. Okay, that's great. And actually, it's also my feeling, so it's nice, it's not a no. And uh, when we were like, I think that is also something that cannot be applied to what you said today. And we were discussing that before also with <laughs> about a phrase you said. Actually, I search for what ethics means, and it says that actually is a moral principles that govern a person's behavior. So I think is really near to what you said. Actually, you said, actually, you were speaking about GDPR, and you said, it is like, we need to follow what the majority consider best practices. And one of the things you said that we need to be clear, you need to be fair, <laughs> and now I need to be really careful. Don't be a manipulative shithead. <laughs> so can you please explain us a bit more and think, like, share with us? Yeah, it's, um, you summed it up really well. I think ultimately ethics and data need to work together. I don't think we really have a choice, and especially because generations coming after us and the newer generations in are really demanding it. So it's not, it's not a choice anymore. It's not a can we, it is we have to get it together. And then privacy helps that push, right? Because privacy, it's, it's not about all the rules and regulations. It's just telling us to play fair. And a lot of ethics is that. A lot of ethics is just thinking through how it's going to affect others and having some respect for the people's data we're working with or the users or the behaviors. So I think that we're currently in a, in, a, in a place where it's going to be really nice for us to see how that really pushes it even more because of privacy and because of changes and because there's been a push within the data and analytics field to try and include ethics and be more aware of it. I think that's a really good effect that just kind of pushed us into the right direction. Um, and I'm really excited to see where it's gonna take us. Okay, it's very great. Actually, you said something, just to be fair. No, again, sorry for that, but uh, I think that what I feel also, I'm working in the analytics environment, is like people are not trying to be fair, but to find ways to, to actually not really be fair and find ways to grab your data also if you said no. And I, I want to understand if you feel the same and if there are also some things that you are doing not to have this behavior being done by, by the, the clients or the people you work with. Yeah, I, I see it a lot um, because I still play in measurement quite a bit, and this is, especially clients, right? Is there just a way to get around this? Can we just do this anyway? I'm sure you see this sometimes <laughs> too. And it has gotten to the point when I have to say, I'm sorry, we can't work together. If what you want me to do okay. is to find a way for you to not um, respect your customer's data or your user's data. Well, and you had, I mean, one of, the, it's a little small example, but you said if, if you're, if you want a white paper, you're like, why? How is, it, how is it fair to say your name, your email address, your phone number, your company, your role? 
Like, what's where's where's the fair exactly. trade there? I think when you said earlier, you said earlier, like the, it's going to require us to think as opposed to just blindly pursue more data. Because I think that's that's the challenge. We somehow got conditioned when digital rolled out, when digital became a thing, that we have all this data, and it was just like, great. So let's just get all the data. And I agree. I think it's a good thing that there are lots of forces saying, no, we've got to be. We've got to be fair. We've got to be disciplined. We've got to think about what we can do, where it's going to go, how we're going to use it. All makes total sense. I worry that the, the, the train has left the station. There's still this massive train of we, gotta, we just got to figure out how to keep getting the data. And that becomes treated as the, the, the end in of, a, of itself. And, it, and it's easy to say, yeah, but that's not right. Like We shouldn't be just getting all the data just because we can. Yes, somehow, yes. Sorry. Yeah. No, but it is, it's definitely, you know, I've had these conversations actually just in the past two days with people here where they're saying, we get the point. But like you said, people are still trying to figure out workarounds. And I think it's coming down to not just telling people we need to change. It's a whole, it's a mindset change that needs to yes. happen. And that's a lot harder, right? Because change is slow coming. And imagine having to change everyone's behavior around data. I mean, I got into data, and you definitely did get into data during the times when everyone was like, just collect it all and we'll see what yeah, happens. You definitely, you're like, yeah, and you were definitely <laughs> in data before I was. Exactly. Not me, but Sorry, easy. Sorry, but I got into data very late, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a whole career before data. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, and I, it's just one of those things, because it's so slow, and we need to now change that whole attitude. I mean, we're taking away people's playgrounds. I was saying this in the, in the talk earlier that we were having so much fun with all that data. <laughs> like, that's the truth, right? I mean, it was just giving us so many possibilities to play with it, find solutions, try and figure it out. And now suddenly you're saying, oh, no more. So how can we change that attitude and say, okay, that playground we had, we're actually making it better by giving you an extra challenge. Um, but you know, everyone needs to start thinking like that. It's not, we're not there yet. <laughs> that is nice, it's a nice mindset actually. For me, it's like finding solution. And here at Super Week is nice because you have all these new opportunity, server side, just mentioning Gentis, for example, or other. Last year, it was like pods about personal data being selling to the major players. So it's really nice, the, the, all this stuff. And actually, I think it's also our mindset that need to be changed a bit because you hear people just say, oh, this bullshit of privacy, I don't want to hear that anymore. And sometimes I, I get a bit like su surprised because I think that we need the ones to tell the clients, okay, you're collecting email addresses and you ask your, your clients if they want to be tracked and at the end, they said no and you're still collecting emails. So it's like, I think that somehow it's also our like we need to be the first to tell and and I don't know really mm, engage the cons customers to understand that uh, what they need to do and if I don't I don't know if you have ever had this kind of conversation with them how you handle it or if you will ever handle it how you would like to <laughs> to do that because it could be interesting actually some some suggestions <laughs> um, you know I think that the 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 kind of against privacy thing, in some ways it's fair, right? Because privacy hasn't put a really great name out there for themselves. They've really ruined the user experience. They have, the end users are really feeling the brunt of it. And you know, there's a lot of like consent fatigue and all of this. So am I surprised that there's this fight against privacy? Not really. And I don't think it's a fight against the ethics or the, the idea of privacy. I think it's just the way it was implemented. Um, and then when obviously when people say, and then you have to take the other side of the picture, right? The people that are trying to decide what you can track or not track, that's usually a legal team or a DPO. Do you know anything about what we're doing? Yes. <laughs> okay, so like having to explain that to them as well, it just takes someone in our field and measurement data to be able to step up and say, hey, we know the law and now this is how we can deal with it or not deal with it, but it takes, you know, it, it takes someone with that extra motivation and drive in data to say, wait, why and how? And we're going to explain it to you so you understand what we're doing. I don't know what your take is on that. 
I mean, I, yeah, I agree. But I feel like it, I also can't blame the privacy world because it's like the, the industry wasn't self-policing. And I don't, I don't think analytics was as much the problem of not self-policing as digital marketing. Like I, it took me a while to realize, I'm like, why are we freaking out about this? And a lot of times it's actually the, the marketers who wanna do the retargeting and they wanna just have that individual level stuff. And I, I almost feel like they've, they've said, well, that clearly we need it. And then it's been dumped to the analytics team to figure out how to keep tracking it. Um, because it is clunky, but it's also because it was spiraling out of control. I mean, and now we're having with, you know, data breaches every 12 seconds. And so it's <laughs> like, yeah, once that data, once you've generated a piece of data and it is somewhere, there's so much sloppiness under there and under, under the hood. So, but I, I tried, I am kind of the, I don't really want to talk to clients about privacy because it's going to go, it so often goes down the path or the, maybe even the people I'm talking to them with of how do we work around? How do we store this here? And we can yes. expand seven days. And then I wind up maybe, you know, calling, you've got, you're doing manipulative bullshit you know, sort of thing. <laughs> so I think, so I, I, I feel like that fundamental shift to what is ethical would, would be really, really helpful. And, but even that you could, if you talk to a company and you say, could we just do what's ethical and right? They'd say, but my competitors aren't going to be ethical. So yes. I'm going to lose my competitive advantage, which I don't know that that's, that's true. It's just, it's a very, very hard ship to steer when it's, when it's reframing it from how do we lose as little as possible to really what do we need and how do we use it appropriately. And it, I, know, I know it hurts. It hurts to delete yeah. data to say, I don't really need that. It hurts to not collect the data. I, I get that basic desire for it, but I also don't have a whole lot of tolerance for you know, thought leaders standing up and saying, more data, of course we just want more <laughs> data. Like that's not the, that's not the, uh, I'm necessarily referring to any sessions that have occurred. It's super weak. Uh, <laughs> but because that gets treated as like, that's the, that's the goal. Now let's talk about all the ways we can get more data. And it's like, uh, why? Like that's not, that's it, gonna be more than you can handle. Why don't we flip it around and say, what do we wanna do? What's the minimum amount of data that we can use to do it? And if that got published on the front page of the New York Times that we were using this data to do this thing, would that be a big PR black eye? Or would the world say, why did you put that on the front page? That's not interesting. Yeah. But it's, I think that to your point you know, of getting less data and, and, um, and the competitive advantage, I think that the normal people, the people that are going to the website, everyone, they very clearly already said that if we can trust you, meaning we trust what you're doing with our data, we're going to give you our business. And that, so I think that a lot of it's also being driven by the public. So that competitive advantage won't be around anymore. I have seen clients who have made it very clear that they are being very privacy conscious, very clear consent banners, very thing, written in a way that anyone can understand and they have gained so much out of that. So I think that it's gonna slowly turn as well. It also depends obviously where you are. It depends America, UK, Europe, there's very different you know, areas. But I think slowly that will become the competitive advantage. But I, I don't really know the answer to this. You, one of you may know, but the, the consent banners where it's like you have two choices, which is one is to accept all, or the other is to like look at your settings. And like that irritates me like every time and I'm like is that that can't be like a legislated thing every site that does that I'm like you were this is like making me go through four clicks to unsubscribe from your email like I want you to be the transparent and, it, and see like is the world going to end if you say option one default is only track I, I'm going to opt into the the minimum for site functionality and maybe you give another button, allow everything, and just see how bad it is. Like there's this, there is this fear that we're oh, going we're going to, down constant, okay. you know, constant battle <laughs> optimization. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, I, constant battle optimization could be a fun field to be in. It's actually not compliant what you're explaining. Yeah. So, it needs to be 
allow or reject. Those are they have to be there. But it you have to have one also okay. on the country, like maybe US is non I don't know. Yeah, but US okay. there are no okay. consent banners, the okay, California perfect. and pretty much driving everything is not actually required. Well does now. reject have to be and if if they're not tracking by default and then it's allow or manage my preferences, then in theory if I just close the banner I've Rejected everything? No, exactly. Depends. If I dance right. You're maybe. supposed to okay. consider that that means rejecting anything. Um, but <laughs> we can to be go fair, I rolled out a consent <laughs> banner on a little site once. This is another thing you talked about. And I realized that I rolled it out. I did everything from the instructions and I was absolutely still tracking after. So I was like, <laughs> removing the consent banner or uh, keeping the consent banner and ignoring what they've said. I was like, I don't know what I did wrong. I'll just take the consent banner off uh, and still track. This is the question everyone asks me. It's like, why is it still tracking? What did I do wrong? And I don't think people realize actually how hard it can be it's to not track someone until they tell you you can. It's a bit annoying. Yeah. You really yeah. have to make sure all your settings are set up correctly yeah. in your tag manager, etc. It's not that easy. This is why 90% of them still do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's quite complicated not to do it. Actually, it's quite tricky also to implement all this stuff. So uh, I understand that could be in, like complicated at all. And actually, you said a couple of things that are really interesting for me. So you said that the majority of users, like person, people in general, are really happy if the consent or the privacy is really clear and et cetera. So I was thinking, it's not just us, but also maybe the user that has, that needs to have some kind of mindset or knowledge of what cookies or privacy is or not. Because also in your speech, you also said that also from our perspective, we have two different souls. So why I need to implement privacy, but I don't want my data to be shared with everyone. So it's tricky. What do you think? I don't know if I understand my question. Or yeah, no, okay. I, it's a little tricky, right? Because the user does need to understand and there is a lack of understanding I send from the public. And it's easy for people like us to forget that, yeah. that because we know how the data works. We understand privacy to, an, you know, to, to a, like a little bit. And then you have everyone else that just has these consent banners over and over again. And if you go to you know, dinner with your friends and they find out what you do, this is what they're asking. Oh my God, what is it with these banners? I don't understand. What are cookies? What are they talking about? Why are the fines there? Um, I think that we do need to take the responsibility to empower the users to understand, but we also need to realize that we shouldn't be expecting them to understand all the nuances, that we just need to be like, you know, state simply, we're going to track you. There will be third-party data tracking you. If you don't want it, click reject all. If you do, here. You can always change your settings later on. If you set up your consent banner correctly and you work with a consent management platform, you'd be surprised how many people change it after a while with your company, really? like a brand. People will learn how to trust you. So it's just, you, it's hard to communicate clearly because how do you communicate to somebody that doesn't understand cookies? So, you, you know, you probably have a lot better ideas on how to communicate this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, because I'm the one who's concise and uh, really clear by, by nature. Um, I mean, uh, but that's a good point. Like the, the, I go in and tend to look at the settings and I'm like, okay, over time I've learned what all of these are, and then you hear the experts because they are, you know, it's the it's the curse of knowledge where you're so immer immersed in it and think, of course people understand the difference between necessary and advertising. <laughs> and it's like, are you kidding me? Like, have you ever, like, are you, have you had a communication with, like, the general public about anything that requires depth of, I mean, it's, it's the same for all of us. If it's not our particular field, like, it's just, it's very, very, confusing, but it, it does seem like if it's yes or no, and it's, and it's simple, and it's, a, it's an all in or an all out, and then if there's, if it's okay to then say, if you said no, nothing, but okay, you're gonna have to maybe repeat no, nothing every time you come, or maybe there's one more button. Like it does feel like there's, there, there should be solutions that are kind of a, a proper, user experience that includes, if I can track enough of you to periodically prompt you, you know, hey, for this reason, can I get your permission 
to also do this other thing. Here's where it's going to provide benefit. I mean, Astra uses the example of going to like a clothing site and like it would be nice if it remembered my, my gender and my size when I come back. And if you put that in front of it, do you want us to remember that? And there can be a little banner across the top that says, That's nice. we're remembering your gender and your size. You can click X and, and wipe that out. Like a very, very narrow, like that feels like the building trust. Say it's literally just the, the little things that benefit you. So it feels like. No, I, I, I really like that idea. And they do have this, um, you know, in, when you're being taught in the privacy world how to show people uh, what you're doing with their data, they have this concept of just-in-time notices, and that's exactly what that addresses. So instead of going to a privacy notice and reading everything, you're saying, uh, you know, email address, and then there's a little, like, info button or a little banner or whatever that says, this is why we need this, phone number, this is why we need this. It can be for things like gender or size. Sign up with an account, and we will be able to personalize these experiences. But I love how you're saying that because it makes the general public understand this is what we're doing. And then they gain that trust in you and they feel that you are treating their data with respect and you're treating them with respect. You're giving them the choice back. And that's essentially what's ethical to do with data and, and with, you know, for everything. And then we just need to learn how to treat it that way. <laughs> back end. <Yeah. laughs> so I think that we are almost finished and I'm really happy to do that. I think that we can also say that maybe we can try a bit more to be more toward customers. So as Tim said, like trying to find ways to make them understand how we can be more ethical in a way. So maybe they are also more happy to share their data. So just one last thing with a yes or no answer. So like is it possible for you in the future to be and to handle data in an ethical way? Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> nice. Uh, Vivi, thanks a lot. Uh, again, happy to be there. And we will see in a while with women and analytics. So be there. It will be really nice. Thanks a lot. I had to talk about um, the IAB's TCF Transparency and Consent Framework. Um, the main reason why I, I chose that is because I didn't want to talk about Google Analytics. <laughs> Certainly not to this audience as the Austrian um, uh, supervisory authority started you know, saying things about international data transfers and things like that and I imagined more would come. Um, so I, I want to talk a bit about the IAB, but then I want to kind of paint a picture of what's coming next as well. Um, as I think if there's one actor that is going to experience potentially creative destruction is probably the IAB because of ads, uh, but we'll also have to see um, how this goes. Um, so bear with me if you have any questions. I'm around with two young kids walking around me as well usually because I'm an outlier. I have my own company. Um, I work for different institutions. I'm extremely boring. I always do the same thing, talk about the same subject and just keep moving forward. I did add in um, <clears throat> my, my, um, my resume because I'm seeing more people do that and I think it's an interesting thing is I have never worked for a GAFAM. Do you guys know what a GAFAM is? What GAFAMs are? What they are? What is the acronym? What does it stand for? Yes, so it's the French version of big tech. Google, Amazon, um, Facebook. Oh, there we go. 
Um, uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. Apple, of course, that we love and adore, and Microsoft. Um, <clears throat> so I, I do different things. I actually started in, in web analytics uh, quite a while ago. <laughs> Um, when I was still young and very thin and maybe better looking, but it doesn't really matter. We like old age. Um, sold my company in Belgium, moved to Spain, and then started listening to this thing called GDPR. So there were two women, Nady Kroos, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, the commission starting to talk about reforming the data protection directive of 1995. And this ended up in the GDPR that started to be enforced in 2018. When I m moved to, to Spain, I started working for the commission in Brussels. You know, this is kind of how life is. It's always a bit weird. So starting to work on ethics and now also working on um, the uh, platform economy. So that's kind of interesting. And then, uh, as a more official title, having my own company, I actually am a DPO, Data Protection Officer for a CDP, Customer Data Platform, called MParticle, based out of the US, amongst other things. So I am basically a free bird. I say what I want, I say what I think, and I try to educate both sides of the aisle, the people who love data and the people who love the law to make sure we all go in the right direction building our societies that are increasingly digitified. So I hope this makes sense. So um, same slide also as a couple of years ago. It's always the same thing. I'm very boring, as I said. It just evolves with time. Is um, I make sure that what is promised within contracts of tools of companies actually aligns with the data flows. So you people are extremely creative with data. I bet you don't really like to talk to lawyers all that much because they don't really understand what you're up to. But it's important to make sure that as risk is evolving with respect to obligations around personal data, that these promises inside the contracts actually run parallel with the data flows. If they don't, that's actually the biggest risk. If they don't, <clears throat> what also happens, and I spend my time um, talking to product people to make sure that, well, maybe we promise certain things in the contracts, but we do more. So implementing what's called mitigation measures. So saying, well, you can do this, but let's do it in this way, or let's delete the data, or let's uh, transform the data one way or another to make sure that we minimize risk for um, the companies. This means that I work a lot with certainly my friends at security, and think also a lot about privacy engineering, which is often today about default settings. How do we collect data by default? And things have really changed over the last couple of years. You can, you can really bitch about the GDPR, and I understand that. But it used to be all on and all floodgates were open for collection. This is not the case anymore. So default settings have changed. What has changed as well is this idea of privacy by design, granularity of uh, systems that sit behind the data processing operations where choices are more granular than what they used to be. It's not a take it or leave it stance anymore. It's about making sure that through the entire ecosystem, how the data is promised that it will be processed actually happens through the entire system to make sure we support um, the obligations. Um, I've also seen that in the last couple of years, I've really been um, focusing on this B2B and B2C side of the equation. So typically you have a data subject, people, they do stuff with a company, that company uses, for example, agencies like MediaMonth to, to do stuff with their data and they use the cloud. I typically don't really work on the people side or on the cloud provider side. Also because when it comes to cloud with international data transfers, it's kind of a big question mark to see how this is going to evolve. So I kind of stay away from that, but really help in terms of B2C, B2B, um, between these different entities to make sure that all these data flows according to what is promised and what is as compliant as possible. Um, so as I said, last year I talked about the IAB's TCF. Again, because I didn't really want to talk about um, Google Analytics. 
But um, I want to talk again about the IAB's TCF because they had their annual leadership meeting not very long ago. And um, the, the, the presentation from the CEO of the IAB was shared on Measure Slack. I don't know if you guys follow Measure Slack. I, I like the privacy channel. <laughs> Um, and so I, I read it and I saw some repercussions also by certain privacy professionals who actually follow this story. Um, and it was interesting to see that, well, basically three points came out of the presentation of the CEO of the IAB this year. So we're talking about a month ago. First of all, um, I'm used to being called a privacy Taliban. Um, it's the first time I'm being called an extremist which was kind of interesting, but it's fine. So a lot of mentions of privacy extremists. You might have heard about this association called NOIB, none of your business. So clearly it was them. Nobody likes NOIB. I support NOIB. I give money to NOIB, so you know, that's me. Um, but they were also classified as political opportunists, which was kind of interesting because, well, I see also companies using privacy as an opportunity to compete. So are they the only ones that are seeing an opportunity there? Not totally sure, but he also attacked our industry, so the industry of the IAB, um, from saying that it was attacked not only from the external side, but also from within. And this is where he pointed towards Apple, bad Apple. And this is what we're seeing also is how the hell can Apple say that they are privacy compliant or that it's a USP for them if they also get fined, for example, in France for not doing the right thing? Um, I would answer to that. Doing the right thing in privacy is darn hard. Everything is also dynamic, as Julien also showed this morning. So you don't catch everything. But if you don't have a culture in place to say, oh, that's a problem, we're going to get fined, we'll fix it. Well, things will never evolve. So you do have a kind of an ethical choice to say, I'm not going to listen, I don't want to hear, and I, I won't speak about it. Or say, okay, we didn't catch that, and we'll do something about it. So personally, I use Apple products. I will never buy an Android phone, that's for sure. Do I consider them to be perfect? No. Is anybody perfect? No. Are the companies I work for privacy compliant or GDPR compliant? I wouldn't know because there's no certification for it. Well, there is, but nobody's been through it for the moment. There was one in October that came out, so we're working on this. But saying that we are perfect with privacy today is thinking about it as if, as if it was a tick box exercise. It's not. Because, well, your data processing operations are evolving as well. So this is about collaboration. The last point also um, the IAB's CEO talked about was that it was kind of a rally and crawl, call and an opportunity um, for healthy competition. So we should all rise up because there are extremists, you know, that are political opportunists and want to destroy our business. And it was interesting because he was talking about positive sum, so this idea that the cake might be bigger for everybody and not zero sum. You know, we have to share that, that, that wealth between different actors. It was really interesting because that's a fundamental principle of privacy by design. The fact that we all collaborate together is about creating positive sums. It's not about grabbing market share. It's about making sure that as the cake evolves with digitalization, we do the right thing and we share equally. And so not certain companies who have a lot of market share in certain sectors. Um, so why did he talk about this? Well, there's a ruling from the Belgium um, uh, supervisory authority. It's not totally clear where it is for now because it's still also at the European Court of Justice. So it's kind of a big mess from a legal perspective. But I think generally speaking, the IAB is nervous and it makes totally sense that they are. And I want to talk about why this nervousness is probably justified, but also what we can do about this because 
acting as if you know this comes from political extremists is maybe not the best of options. So what does the CEO of the um, IAB call for? Well, he calls for a rising up of the industry to battle these political extremists. And um, it reminded me of a tweet that I saw not, not very long ago from one of my friends who said, well, basically you do the right thing when you've tried everything that doesn't work and try to avoid basically being compliant. So what I learned from this is, okay, I'm not totally sure that the CEO of the IAB has understood that there's potentially a problem there. Um, but he's certainly calling the industry, the ad industry to rise up and you know, go against the floods of privacy Taliban's. So seeing that, um, next day I get an email because I get emails from associations as, as a DPO, as a privacy specialist, where basically I get invited, never ask for the information, get invited to hear more about the IAB, DAA, and things like that, the ad industry in Canada. Um, so I, I think Canada is an interesting country for different reasons. Um, <clears throat> but it, it was pretty surprising that suddenly, you know, it, it, it came in my mailbox the next day. There's no opt-out link. There's no possibility to say, hey, I'm not interested, you know, would you mind? Um, but, okay, apparently we should listen to the IAB Canada and what they have to say. Um, so I want to talk a bit about Canada because, well, it's, it's next to the United States. Um, it's kind of a friendly country when you think about it in terms of privacy. They're, you know, they're pro-business, but not totally. It's, it's kind of these ethical countries that sit in between. Australia is a bit the same thing. Anglo-Saxon influenced, they would like to do the right thing, but probably from a privacy perspective, they don't have the right legal basis to make this work. And so this is what I want to talk about is, I want to, to talk about Canada. So I don't want to blame them, but I want you to think about, maybe help me think about how Canada is enforcing, or potentially not, certain data uses. And um, I took an example, again, from Measure Slack um, that was posted from um, my Canadian friend, Stefan Hamel. And he actually uh, shared information about Home Depot who didn't uh, get consent before sending data <coughs> to uh, Facebook. And I think the case is super interesting because when you see the result of that um, uh, analysis by the supervisory authority in Canada, what they're basically saying in these three bullet points is you need to pull the plug. Not good. We don't agree with what you've done, and I'll explain the case, so don't worry about it. But basically, it's not good. You should not be doing that. And so, when you think about it, it's like Canada feels a bit like a dog that barks but doesn't have teeth like the GDPR. And so my, when I was writing this, my daughter was next to me, so she said, es un perro la, la, ladrador poco mordedor. So barking but no, no biting. And this is true. It's, it's what Canada can do with their privacy legislations today. So where does this come from? No, let me maybe speculate a bit. <clears throat> Let's imagine this happened in Europe or in the United States, so not Canada. If this would have been the GDPR, well, probably it wouldn't just be about pulling the plug. It would be about, hey, here's a couple of million fines. What would have been part of this as well is, and by the way, everything you collected before, you're going to delete because you're going to clean up your mess. That's a cost. And maybe notification to data subjects, if you want to think about it in terms of data breaches or things like that, don't have to go there. But at least when you compare Canadian ruling, pull the plug, with European GDPR, delete, fines, and things like that, the risk is totally different. So it means that data teams 
in countries like Canada, like Australia, will probably be more bullish about what they can do because the risk will be different. So you can say, okay, well, maybe that's also the same thing as the United States. Well, this is also something I want to talk about as legislations around privacy are changing, not at the federal level, but in states. So you might have heard about the California Consumer Protection Act, which is becoming a CPRA, Colorado, Connecticut, Virginia, Utah, are starting to talk about opt-out obligations. So the right for consumers to say, I do not want this. And the thing is, as the US runs under common law as well, if you write in your statements that you're going to respect that, and you don't, you're not just open to fines or potential deletion obligations, but also class actions. And this is something we shouldn't forget about the United States, is while the GDPR is rather clear with high fines, those fines can actually skyrocket if they become class actions in the United States. So Canada is an interesting experience um, for, um, I think, data ventures. This is how US state legislation looks today. Um, so there has never been more bills introduced as in 2021-2022. Um, some bills have passed. It's, it's really a, 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 a big headache, but this will continue. This will continue, and it's a bit as if we're seeing the reverse of the GDPR. The GDPR came there to say all European countries, same legislation, same logic. Because we had a directive in 1995, each state, each country did it differently. I remember talking about potential risk for Croatia. Somebody said, well, it's going to be 700 euros, who cares? And true, you know, so stuff happened in Croatia that you couldn't do in France and it didn't create a coherent single market. So we went towards this idea of a regulation. The United States is going the, other, the opposite direction. And more so than just that, they are also creating different types of uses of words for data treatments, which are going to create issues, I think, for everybody moving forward. So this is how the US looks like. If you're still not convinced that privacy is evolving, this is a global view. So over 160 countries in the world have privacy legislation, are enforcing. It's something we see daily, and it's not just data breaches. We're not talking about data breaches anymore. We're talking about how the data is actually being used how um, fundamental right to privacy for the laws that think in that way are respecting the way that data is being used in these countries. Um, certainly Africa has moved a lot in the last couple of um, months together with Asia. We're seeing also international data transfers between Africa and Asia being adequate, so working well. So the patterns that we talk about when we complain about Schrems too and say, hey, between the US and Europe, I can't transfer data as I used to. It's very nice, but there's other data transfers becoming stronger on the global level. So it's not just about Europe and the United States. So let's go back to our story. What happened to Home Depot? De Home Depot asked when people checked out, do you want the e-receipt? So I see this at Decathlon when I check out, same thing, do you want the e-receipt, you want to print it or do you want your, your email? I typically print because I don't trust what happens with the data flows behind. So we're talking about Canadian legislation, the data that's involved is email, is that personal information, you bet your ass it is. The law is Pipeda and the program they use for it is Meta Platforms Offline Conversions. Note, I never talk about Google Analytics because I already wrote about it years ago, so. If we take a closer look at the data flows, what happened is that once a customer said, yes, I would like an e-receipt sent to my email, that data <coughs> was shared with Meta, 
and they verified if the user had a Facebook account. They compared that to the person's in-store purchases to measure and report on the effectiveness of ads and more could be done for business purposes, blah, 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 targeted advertising and things like that. So a typical rule of thumb when it comes to data processing operations is, would you imagine that happening when you ask for an e-receipt? Um, I think my grandmother would freak out or anybody would freak out. You're like, what the hell? I never asked for this. So if you think about just that paragraph in terms of privacy obligations, well, if you send that personal data or that personal information to Meta more than just for the receipt, you are basically, what you would need under the GDPR is a lawful basis. Why are you doing that? Under which choices, conditions are you actually doing that? And then it's not just the fact that you kind of send it to Meta, it's Meta does other things. Suddenly there's another purpose. It's not just the purpose of sending you the receipt, it's about, well, uh, do you have a Facebook account? What kind of purchases did you do? Reporting on ad effectiveness. And then what's interesting as well is that basically Meta mingles this with other types of data to report on how well your campaigns were um, under um, uh, using the Facebook platform. So even under American legislation, Facebook here wouldn't even act as a service provider. So in that little paragraph that I shared, you already have like five, six points where you can say, this is an infraction of certainly the GDPR on so many levels. But you have to tear it apart. You have to tear apart these data flows, these purposes. What am I trying to do? What did I promise to my customers? How is the data moving between my company and a third party? And for which reasons am I doing this? So it goes further. The justifications of Home Depot are really interesting. Each email address Home Depot shared with Meta was encoded, so it could not be read by individuals at Facebook. That's wonderful. It's like, I, okay, so employees at Facebook could not read the email address. It does not make that data flow lawful or acceptable. You still sent it. Um, Home Depot said that it relied on implied consent and that it said it in its privacy statement. And we are talking about de-identified information for internal business purposes such as marketing, blah, blah, blah. And we may use it for blah, 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 blah. And you're like, is that really a justification for what happened there? This is like when you start really to delve into the data, you're like, this doesn't make sense. What does come up here are a couple of words. Implied consent is an interesting one, but certainly when we talk about de-identified information, it's something that's used so often. It is, the data is anonymous. Personal or privacy legislation does not apply. It's magic. It's magic, but, well, I think the supervisory authorities have started to understand that, well, we, we are going beyond the magic because this idea of the identification, anonymization has different issues. Um, so this is something I share a lot with the engineering teams. Anybody that's onboarded, you engineer, you know, he wants to do things with data or she, um, I start by sending that. Here are 10 myths about anonymization. And if we have a conversation in terms of product analytics about the fact that you think the data is anonymous, I will, sh I will first go through these 10 points with you just to make sure that we agree. So it wouldn't work on the GDPR. Certainly this idea of implied consent is, is, is not even part of any kind of legislation. You need a lawful basis. And this is also something that is slightly complicated in other people's minds who don't use the GDPR. If you use personal data, you need a lawful basis. And there are six of them in the GDPR. There is more than just consent. 
And the data would have been used for contract, actually, if you asked for this e-receipt. And you also need to define a purpose. It is the hardest thing to do in privacy and in data analytics as well. Defining the purpose for which you are collecting and processing the data. Um, so, you share it. It's really worth a read. It's summed up here. So, pseudonymization is not anonymization. Encryption is not anonymization. We, I think we all know that by now, but still. So, you can go down the, the, um, the list. Um, so, that's kind of one of the first privacy whitewashings I've seen through the years. The data is anonymous, privacy law doesn't apply. So, any engineer that talks to me in that way, we're like, okay, we're going to have a follow-up meeting because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Next justification for Home Depot is the fact that Meta employed an automated process and that they wanted to avoid what's called consent fatigue. I get that. We all want to avoid consent fatigue. But if you think about it, the receipt on the GDPR would have been contract. You don't need to ask for consent. So there are certain things you need to think about when you do, you know, or even justify certain things. And in this case, I also want to talk a bit about this idea of automated process um, that I'll, I'll um, um, hone into um, in the next slides. But this idea that the consumer consented is by kind of privacy whitewashing number two, because typically the question is, what do you consent for? So please explain to me the purpose, 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 use that term. It's really worth exploring to understand why the data was being used. So what can we learn from this? Well, the way the laws are structured or built up varies. Canada, US, China, Russia, um, or, or even um, Latin America, they don't work in the same way. The consequence is that the enforcement and the notion of risk is also not the same. Um, how enforcement is accepted will also be different. If you have a supervisory authority, like in Canada, that says, Home Depot, bad, pull the plug, what do you say at Home Depot? You try to justify, it's the identified, blah, 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 not good, pull the plug. Okay, I'll pull the plug. If you send a fine of a couple of hundred million, I'm not sure the company will say, okay, we'll pay the fine. So this is also, I think, an issue under the GDPR is this idea that if I find Meta for almost 400 million euros, doesn't it make sense that they litigate against it? Wouldn't you, any company, say, I'm not just going to pay out, I'm actually going to go to courts and drag this along to make sure that it gets lower and I buy time? So maybe Canada is not that wrong after all. The thing is, um, so, a Home Depot was, was fully cooperative. They said, yeah, fine, no problem, we'll do that. Um, so it happens a lot. Companies saying, we're so sorry, we won't do it again. <laughs> Follow-up question is, how do you make sure? And it's a bit the same as the presentation that Julian did this morning. He's automatizing things and making sure and governance and things like that. But how do you make sure this works? And when I listened this morning, I thought, it's funny, because I set up processes for privacy that I know work. But then somebody moves, people change, the, 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 the business changes, and my process breaks down. So what do you do as privacy officer? You audit. Every six months, you go back and you say, how is that process working? So yeah, saying that you're sorry is nice, but it's probably not good enough. Um, so that was kind of the easy part. Now I'm going to go really fast over the, the hard part. If you think about it from a high-level perspective, all these global privacy legislations, 
there are two families. There is opt-in, you need a lawful basis, you need a purpose. GDPR, um, China is going in the same direction. A lot of countries are, are basically following suit. And the other one is opt-out, and that is US. US is focused, and Anglo-Saxon companies, generally speaking, on, well, data to support businesses. Opt-in laws are about accountability and this idea of fundamental rights. And the way these laws have been created are very, very different. So I always compare it to La Sagrada Familia from Gaudi in Barcelona. This is how laws in Europe work. Slowly but surely being built up, never finished. <laughs> America is slightly different. I, I rely on external legal counsel to understand what's going on because I can't find it. But basically the CCPA came out through a ballot proposition. It's not the commission that says and goes through and da 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 and everybody makes comments. It's people deciding to put money, collect signatures, and decide to push a ballot. So the way the law is created is extremely different. So I don't know if you know, but US privacy law has always been very sectoral. You might, may, might, might have heard about COPPA, Children Online Privacy Protection Act, HIPAA for health, VPPA, Fair Credit Act, and things like that. Europe is horizontal, everything the same thing. But what's happening now with California and their ballot propositions is that they're starting to think about rights and they're starting to think about opt out of certain things and Colorado has followed and Connecticut has followed and Virginia and Utah. So suddenly this aggregated market that you saw in the United States isn't there anymore because rights will be different depending on where people actually live. So. What is the data used for? What should you opt out in the United States? And this is where you want to bang your head against the wall. Virginia, Colorado, and Connecticut is about targeted advertising sale and profiling. Utah is about targeted advertising sale of data and not profiling. And then Canada, blah, blah, uh, California, sorry, talks about sale and sharing, and then talks also about global privacy controls. I have a slide about that, but I'll just push it through because it, I don't have enough time. What is Europe working on? Well, I don't know if you remember e-privacy. Yeah. Uh, it's somewhere there <laughs> inside it. <laughs> it's still in conversations. But if you think there's just the GDPR and e-privacy, it's not the case. There's more coming. Um, the DSA, the DMA, and things like that have been pushed through. So it's not just about Europe. It's not just about cookies. I think, honestly, what's coming up next year, or at least this year, is mobile SDKs. So let's start maybe making sure we're doing the right thing. Attorney General in California, CNIL in France, they're pretty much aligned, two weeks separate. They're actually doing the same thing. So SDKs and mobile, I think, is something we should start looking at. Um, other things that are also coming up, um, this idea that, well, maybe there's an issue with competition for certain market leaders. And having seen the evolution of digital analytics, web analytics through the years, I would say that that was anti-competitive behavior to, to the market share Google Analytics has today. But let's see, this can drag on pretty long. There will be discussions also about Section 230, which is um, the content on platforms, who is responsible. China is also coming up, and obviously everybody is thinking about how Elon Musk is going to sink in the idea that the bird will fly in Europe. But we'll see. Last but not least, um, if you think about automated decision-making, as Home Depot did, there's an article in, in the GDPR 22 and where you have the right to say, no, I don't want that. So people that ask for e-receipts from Home Depot in Canada should be able to say, 
I don't want you to share my data with Facebook because I just want the e-receipt. But the law doesn't work that way. But if you're thinking about <clears throat> um, automated decision-making, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, start here. Where does your data come from? What's your lawful basis? What's your purpose? If it's personal data or information. Artificial intelligence brings more than just that. And it's interesting because it brings back challenges also of intellectual property. So this was an article about um, uh, a startup using Getty Images, where basically they, they had been scraping. Um, but what's really different between Europe and the United States is that privacy lawyers in the US are often, first of all, IP lawyers. So it's kind of the feeling that everything turns into circles and we come back to the same thing. But it's going to be interesting to understand, certainly if you're doing things automatically, where your data comes from. So it's the fact that your, the explainability of where that data comes from is going to be part of your data stack at some point if you use AI. So think about that moving forward. And well, I think data governance is going to be the sexiest job for the next years. Who knows what the picture is from? Sorry, and green. Thank you very much for your attention. speak about two things I'm really passionate about. First one is smart and beautiful woman and second one is modern data stack. So I want to recognize women of Superweek and also recognize Zoli and Superweek team for supporting us, for giving stage and empowering us along the way. So what I did I pulled data, what was available on Superweek website since 2014 and analyzed how many women speakers were on stage and compared to, like made a ratio compared to total unique speakers. And this is where you can see how the number was growing. Then we have a little bit of a bump during the COVID times. And now we are still growing again, but what I want to say is we can do better. And <laughs> I mean, this number does not, doesn't correspond uh, visitors, but we kind of get a sense of how things are moving. And I want to say that I appreciate Zoli and the team for getting us on stage and empowering ladies. So yeah, kudos to um, Super Big Team. And you know what? I saw that we need to recognize women who've been consistent with Super Week, being on a stage every year, coming over here. And I want to hold first Women of Analytics Award. Like we can change the name for, not, for, last, uh, for the next year, but let's recognize those women who've been doing their best, rocking the stage and sharing their wisdom. So the bronze goes to Astrid. <laughs> Last four years, Astrid was on a stage sharing her wisdom. And I have a small present for you, Astrid. Here it is. <laughs> no, it's small, but you didn't think. 
the silver goes to Krista. She's not here. Krista has been working super big stage uh, since 2017. She missed one year. Yeah, hey, Krista. <laughs> You, you get, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I know it's not the best timing, but here's a small present for you. Oh, and thank yeah, you. thank you for being here, Van Glaise and Analytics. And you know, I guess everybody have been watching your videos, so you're doing a great job. Thank you for empowering women and, and everybody in analytics. Thank yeah. you. That's very kind. <laughs> We also have one more person deserving the silver. Maria was evangelized. <laughs> Maria was on a stage uh, since 2017, and she missed just one year not making a uh, talk, so she was on a stage six times. And the gold goes to Her Majesty. <laughs> Data Privacy Queen. Thank you for the well, Aurela was on the stage eight times. And I want to say that this recognition really matters to community overall and to ladies because um, we're outnumbered. And like we need uh, to show the next generation the role model and empower ladies in analytics and tech and data. And one of the reasons why we're outnumbered, I personally believe, is because Millennial generation of women were raised around the notion that you are rather, rather smart or beautiful. And I'm here not to blame the society. Moreover, and I truly agree with this. And it's not like a person cannot be smart and beautiful simultaneously. It's more about how people's brain work. So it ties back to, the, to how other people perceive other people. Like, it's, you cannot send too many signals to people's Kroger brain, the most basic brain. Just people are gonna be confused. So it's easier for people to perceive you if you already know what, it's, what you want people, first of all, to perceive about you. And um, I also observed that this can be a tricky, tricky um, thing about our brain because we tend to focus firstly on one things and what i observed in data engineers when they tend to choose a data next data solution in their stack they tend to focus on one value like over indexing on one value and not consider the other dimensions of the solutions that can potentially cause problems and actually harm so the, the easy example could be that uh, when data engineers onboard some solution, they can fix, uh, they, they can focus on how easily, seamlessly it fits within their existing environment and like um, stack ecosystem, but they can overlook other things like privacy or sometimes it could be cost or efficiency, things of that nature. And I want to talk about it because for the last um, 18 months, I was building a data engineering solution called Method Data. And what it does, it observes um, clients' cloud and understand how the data is moving, how the data is performing. And we do that just by ingesting cloud logs and metadata. So we're basically like shadowing everything that is happening in the cloud. So we have this knowledge how other tools are performing in your cloud. So it's really fascinating. And I'm gonna share five things to consider before you onboarding your next data stack solution. So 
the first one I want to start is kind of an obvious one, and it's compatibility with your existing um, system and infrastructure. So there is a case one of our clients shared. So they have Tableau for data visualization, and they were hosting Tableau on their own server, their own uh, like on-premise servers. And there is, was a person entitled like DevOps to uh, keep keep to keep maintaining, to update it on time, and things of that nature. And they decided they wanted kind of reduce the cost on you know uh, uh, reduce the cost on that. And <laughs> Salesforce owner of Tableau um, made them a proposition to move everything they have on their server to the cloud. Salesforce 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 cloud. I'm sorry. So what's happened, they signed the contract, everything seems fine until they actually started to move um, 500 dashboards. And guess what happened? There is, was no single button to do that seamlessly. And they have to do everything manually. So as a result, as you can guess, the deadlines of the project are quite pushed. Additional cost implied. Um, and, and the downside also is like 99% chance that there are gonna be data loss issues and some data integrity issues, like 99%. So, and also I believe that his boss, like the bosses are unhappy with this at all because they kind of paying a double price for this. So yeah, please keep in mind that you need kind of to run small tests before you agreed on something, this is, would be a good practice. The second one is data security and compliance. Please make sure that new tool is compliant with data privacy regulations in your industry and in your region. That helps a lot. Like it's not novel anymore, but still for some reason neglected. I'm not gonna give you a lecture why it's important, um, rather than talk to your common sense. So again, it's all tied back to my current experience. Um, we're building this solution like in heart with a privacy. That's why we don't touch client's data, we don't ask for any permissions, neither read it or edit it, God forbid. But we have a well-funded competitor that requests edit permissions to client's data. Edit. Like that competitors assess data quality. Why should, why should they have this edit permissions? And this, this means they not just can scan and query your data, they can actually delete it or insert some new rows for you. That's it's an evil practice. And one thing that I really want you to remember about my presentation is the tools that do not ingest data, I'm sorry, do not, it's not ingest, insert. Insert data in your storage must not have added permissions, period. It's not supposed to be that way. And if some solutions have read access, you should really reevaluate re if they cre create enough value <laughs> for your business so they have these kind of explicit rights. And it's, it's just a simple data hygiene, I should say like this. The second point about data privacy and security, reading pri product pri uh, privacy policies never hurt. <laughs> Even if you're using open source, believe me folks, I'm gonna pull a case here. So this is dbt. Can you please raise your hands how many of you are familiar with dbt? What is the tool? Okay, fantastic, I love you folks. So this is like a super fancy startup. They're doing great, they are so, like, so powerful tool. They are literally beasts. But what is important to understand their 
enterprise, like their business model is open source and they have a cloud version, which is a paid version. And this is how they've been growing since launch in 2017 to early 2022. So as you can guess, if the product has an open source solution, uh, open source version, majority of their users are free users, right? So let's assume, we don't know that precisely, let's assume they have 80% of their users using uh, dbt for free And this is how much money they raise. How they gonna justify this amount of money invested and four billion at four billion valuation, just think of it, four billions. And investors uh, kind of expected them to build a real business which generates revenue. Like they really expected them, they like 100% expect that, that from DBT. And I did some guesswork. This is a screenshot from DBT Open Source Privacy Policy. Let's read it together. We may query, transform, process, and otherwise access your data. Valid. They, turn, they, they insert the data. Okay. We may also retain a copy of your data for a reasonable period of time. I got a question. What is it reasonable? I mean, for me, 30 seconds is enough. I mean, that's this. <laughs> oh, I hear this nasty, nasty jokes. Okay, so folks, what I want to highlight, they literally, it literally means that they can sell their clients' data to hedge funds. I'm not saying they're doing it. No, I'm not. But what I'm trying to emphasize, they have the legal rights and technical ability to do so. And this, like, when you onboard a new solution, I mean, in DBT case, that could be a revenue stream for them and some hidden price or cost for you and your company. Third point is scalability and performance. And I mean, we can talk long enough how systems should be scalable, how the pipelines should scale, no matter how, how much data you expect. Um, but this is what struck me with Adam's talk, uh, Adam from Amplitude. So basically, you need to think forward when you onboard a solution, you need to understand what's, what's gonna happen next. I mean, today there are so many solutions that can be implemented I mean, in a case of marketing and product data, there could be a layer that segment can fulfill. So you can send this data both to Google Analytics and, and Amplitude and there are gonna be no conflict. But to do so, you need to think what are the future, future tasks and how you're gonna scale it. Like what data you're gonna be collecting next time. So. In here, I really encourage to think twice before you onboard in any solution, if that solution can support you on your future plans and projects, because you don't want to be in a situation when you're doing like three or five different ETLs because they don't have enough of connectors. The fourth point, make sure that business will benefit from this new solution. I mean, sometimes it could, be, it could look like a new shiny toy, uh, which, which is worse to try. But if you won't get the buy-in from business, and if you won't cover uh, like goals or business need, this still won't stick, period. I saw the cases when new marketer was saying that they need to switch to other cloud. And it's not like he needs it, it just data engineers need to market 
the solution they're using. So basically, data engineers need to learn how to tie business problems, their problems, if there are any, and how this new solution kind of connect those dots and help that to understand for business users because otherwise there is no one gonna explain and educate your business users. So yes, you have to learn how to be marketers for yourself, solutions you use, and things you solve with your company. And the fifth one, the last one, but my favorite one, is, is, is total cost of ownership. And so again, talking about my current venture, what we build at Mess Hat, um, so we build a privacy-focused data observability for lot platform. And what we do, essentially, we catch data integrity issues uh, in real time. And in doing so, we do not ingest any data. We just ingest cloud native logs and metadata. And basically, we, not basically, we do not see clients data. We know nothing about it. And it has a nice side effect. <coughs> Mass had, since Mass had doesn't query the data, it doesn't increase cloud cost for our clients. It's free of charge. And when I see a fancy solution that has like 10,000 followers on LinkedIn, a number of LinkedIn top voices mentioning this brand and bragging, oh, how nice it is. But I know that this solution runs SQL queries against their clients' data to see the anomalies. I also understand that this solution increased clients' cloud cost approximately as much as it cost for their clients a year. So let's say if the solution, the baseline costs like 60K a year, so it also means it increases clients' cloud cost around 60K a year more. So in the end of the day, solution doesn't cost you just 60K, it costs you 120K a year. And are you really generating as much value as you spend on it? It's questionable. So I really encourage you to understand how much money it's really cost you. And you know what also bugs me? Because when the new vendor comes in, they charge you for the implementation. Like you, they charge you for the onboarding. You know, there is those onboarding fees. And, but nobody thinks how much it costs you to onboard. Like nobody thinks how, what is the learning period for data engineers? Maybe the cost implied? No, really, you have to think of that as well. And maybe next time when you were gonna be negotiating with some new vendor, you're gonna pull it as well. But folks, listen, maybe we can cross it out because we are still implementing your solution and trying to extract value from it as well. So to wrap up, consider the compatibility. It's, it's worth doing it and double checking. Check permissions rigorously. Learn how, what data privacy regulations for your industry and regions. Scalability. Think big. Consider business cases. You need, you need to learn how to market your job and value from the solutions you use. The cost of total ownership matters. Cloud is growing quarter to quarter, so I'm not gonna educate you how expensive it is. Yeah, but you have to think of it as well. And yeah, if, so we also started to do our Slack channel where we share how to tackle data integrity issues in a really sustainable way, how to reduce cloud costs and things of that nature. So you're more than welcome to join. Thank you.
Tkachova. 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 I'm sorry about that. Tkachova. Three, two. Action, sorry. Action. Hi. Hi again. And welcome back to the Super Week TV studio. This time we are dealing with something that is quite nice, which we are speaking about women in analytics. It's a subject that is quite uh, on stream right now. And we are here with a couple, not couple, three amazing girls, two of them already speak at Super Weeks. And I'm gonna present them to you. So the first one on my right side is a uh, uh, sorry, I have problems. Juliana Jackson, yes. right? Then we have Elena Nazi, and both of them work for Media Monks. And last but not least, we have Yulia Tkachova, sorry, that's my bad. That was so much fun. <laughs> Which is the C uh, CEO of Masterhead, right? Masterhead. Masterhead. Yes. Thanks a lot. So, uh, sorry for my um, wrong pronunciation, but it's so nice to have you here. And uh, actually, um, there are a couple of questions I I'm gonna ask you, of course. But one of the things that pick up my interest is was two things mainly. One on your both of your presentation. So you work for you're an ambassador for women in tech, right? Well, yeah, women tech makers. Okay, so maybe we can speak about that at the end, sure. so, or we can like share that. Sure. And apart from that, your presentation, unfortunately, I wasn't there on Monday but you presented how the women and the population of women <laughs> increased in the super week, right? <laughs> so it was really nice, I wasn't there, so it's interesting how it increased. And right now I really want to focus on each one of you. I think that all of you have different stories. So it would be nice to understand a bit how you get into this analytics world and why. So if you want to begin, like, Oh yeah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me up, Fosca. So um, starting with uh, how I get into the uh, analytics. So I started my career in a company uh, which uh, built the analytic project, um, products and I started as a product manager. So it was uh, quite a joinery and um, the time has came and I just move out to my company. But the reason why I started first, first hand doing the analytics because I have a marketing background and also uh, I have a master's in mathematics and statistics. And so it was just a perfect fit for me to kick off my career in um, analytics, being a product manager, because I kind of understood both sides, uh, what a tech is doing and what marketers are wanting, uh, uh, what marketers needing. And um, so once I get there, I'm not sure that I was looking particularly to join, you know, analytics field or industry, but definitely, uh, in a way, <laughs> in a way, I fall in love with this. Nice. Yes. Yeah, so it just, um, it's always interesting. It's always fun because it, as I see it, it was connected to people and some, and some data. And it's fascinating how it's you know developing year over year. So uh, I don't know if it answers your question, but I'm totally enjoying what I'm doing. Uh, it uh, ties back to my background, and I totally allow it. Yeah, I think it answered perfectly, and actually tied to your presentation a yeah. bit, right? So you can also present. Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty similar. <laughs> in the past because I also come from a uh, product and marketing background. I kind of got seduced by the world <laughs> of analytics because um, I started hanging out at measure camps. Oh, yes. All the school nerds that, you know, uh, are, in the, are in the field. And I think in general, like, people in analytics don't come from a specific analytics background like some do because now there's more schools and colleges that teach the discipline of digital analytics of web analytics the majority of the people that are headlining conferences like this or measure camps are coming from you know music technical writing and so on i come from sales that's my first job i was selling internet over the phone <laughs> it's like a normal romanian would do and uh yeah i just uh, transitioned to analytics actually uh, as you know having the job title of a digital analyst actually last year in November where I joined Media Monks and it's been fun and yeah I mean that's that's it okay. 
Me? Uh, it was all thanks to my professor. A complete <laughs> accident that I ended up in analytics. I was studying computer engineering and I needed to make my thesis. And my professor suggested that I started working at this company who did analytics. And I had no idea what that was about. Okay. Because as Juliana said, at the time, there were no courses about analytics or data science. It was completely new. And I felt that in Italy, we kind of were pioneers because I couldn't find a lot of mentorship or uh, you know, material to, um, um, to use to learn. And uh, I was lucky enough to have amazing mentors that I will always be grateful to. And they immediately um, showed me how the analytics work can impact the business. And that's when I thought, yes, I like programming. I have a lot of fun with it. It feels like Sudoku to me, you know? <laughs> uh, I, it, it's fun, but it's even more interesting and fulfilling to see that you have an impact on something. And they were so smart and I'm so grateful that at the beginning they told me, well, you can choose to do the programming because in the same agency, the programmers wanted me, wanted yeah. to steal me. But think about it, Elena, you might like more to actually be able to speak to the sea level and uh, to give a real uh, impact instead of saying only in the back hand, uh, all in doing operative work, okay. which is actually fine and beautiful for, for people yeah. who like it, but I really like to see the impact in such an immediate way. So that's how. Actually, I have a question on that because of course you're uh, an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that the word of engineers is like male. <laughs> when you go to a faculty, like we are both Italian, so we know that we are going to engineer and let's just say just men everywhere. So it's like also, that connects to another question I would like to ask all of you. So do you, did you find difficult that path? So did you find it difficult to, to like find your place in the business and compare to your male, like, I don't know, co-workers and colleagues and so, so on? It's going to be a yes and no. OK. Um, part of the no is that you don't really realize that you are being challenged and you have difficulties because we were born women. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, the difficulty arises. It was always there. You were always doubted. And I think especially in my country, there's more of a... Um, uh, well, th this issue is more present. So when uh, um, I had the opportunity to work in the Netherlands uh, for the first time, I realized that it could be possible not to have people interrupt you all the time while you were speaking, that it was <laughs> possible for people to ac actually be silent and be interested in what you're saying, like you're actually super smart and they want to learn from you. And that was so new that that's when I realized that I did have difficulties, but I didn't suffer from them. Okay. But it's a nice feeling. Feedback, I think also for the male community, maybe it's nice sometimes to oh. let us speak more. <laughs> we have so. interesting <laughs> things to say. Yeah, exactly. And what about you girls for your experience in the, like? I mean, so I have two sides of that answer. I'm gonna try to stay on point. Uh, I also facilitate this um, workshop called I'm Remarkable, which is a workshop meant for women. Uh, in technology or in analytics, but also for people from underrepresented groups. And um, I, I, I uh, facilitate this workshop because I want people to feel okay with self-promotion. So I think for me, I'm pretty, like, I really don't care that much about how the, my male counterparts are seeing me. It can be seen, it's nice, it's yeah, so nice. I, to be fair, in the analytics community, I haven't yet dealt with uh, I don't know, assholes that are treating <laughs> less because, uh, you know, I have a vagina. But uh, can I say that online? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you already it's, said that. I, it's too late, yeah. <laughs> yep. No, but I, I think the analytics community is super uh, positive and non-toxic. Yep. And I think uh, it's developing more into, uh, 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 I guess, appreciating women that come and do their thing. And I think it can be hard because you come with a chip on your shoulder, but I had to deal more with that uh, male uh, alpha thing when I was working in product versus uh, working in, uh, in the analytics space. I think people here, 
I think the more that they are in the industry are looking more to mentor women and help them and support them versus trying to put them down. And uh, for instance, my, uh, my manager, Julia, uh, Julian, phew, he's amazing. Like he's yes. so supportive and he has been supportive and uplifts you, you know what okay. I mean? So like, I don't feel it, but I know it's there. And sadly, it doesn't stop with women or start with women. It's also a thing with, uh, you know, race, with underrepresented yeah. groups. And I don't think only women have to deal with it. It's also the underrepresented groups and that they have the same kind of like situation, you know, when they're, when they're dealing with this. And that should be something that, you know, it's requires important. yeah more uh, conversation, but you can share now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so also from a CEO perspective, because there are not a lot of women. Right? Like, um, CEO perspective, not a lot of women. I never said it. Like from the CEO perspective, I'm okay. I'm I'm thinking of it like how can we help as the ladies, how we can empower them because I'm also I have a daughter, like she looks up at me. I but I don't have a choice. Yeah. So and and uh, the values that we have in our family is that we're equal, we're equal responsible for the kids. And I mean, I'm not waiting for my husband, you know, to do like there is no gender related test. <sighs> tasks yep. within our household. So um, I guess, and, and obviously I'm coming from a uh, generation and my parents were not living the life like I live it. Uh, so I guess, of course, being a female CEO is hard because, you know, talking to investors and VCs, they, it, it's privileged world. They, they want to see a strong, male who will execute and yeah with ladies it's not that straightforward but there are lots of studies that show that CEO female CEO performs well and startups with female CEO, CEOs have higher chances to survive yeah because maybe you know ladies can take care of money and not you know doing like this <laughs> like sometimes it's, music yes exactly <laughs> yes. and I, I mean I'm 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 trying to say it's funny. that for me, um, I don't see that as a challenge. Uh, it's more like being an example, a role model, and empower every girl around me. I'm like, when I'm talking to ladies, I always highlight in their power side, like you did this such an amazing job, you're doing this great, this great. I'm always getting this feedback that sometimes people get really inspired when I'm next to them, and, and this is what we're supposed to do. This is the role models we set, not just to our community, but yeah. for next generations. And I mean, I, I view it like this. I, I, don't, I don't view that anything like that stops us to, to doing so. Yep, I love that. So yeah. we are all here, we are all women. So we really ask all the women that are seeing us to come to Super Week next year, just a parenthesis. So we really want you there. 100% safe space. <laughs> So we really want this percentage, like that maybe we can reach the half and half of men and women in the next, I'm not sure. next year, but no, Elena, Elena's yeah. gonna come and speak next year, right, Elena? Absolutely. There yeah. Close yeah. Actually, yes, we have exactly. a commitment to <laughs> Exactly, wow. see, there you go. <laughs> so we are uh, already a bunch of girls more speaking, which is great, but it's really nice, the conversation, because you really have different kind of experience. Yeah. You're also different kind of person, and it's, it's really nice how you dealt with the situation and so on. So uh, I don't know if there is something also that you can advise other girls or maybe, yes, women that are in this path that want to be, I don't know, more involved or, um, I don't know, grow in their position because I, I see and I feel that there are a lot of women that just say, okay, I'm just do my work. There are other people, I'm not so good, I'm not, I don't feel... I have something. Okay, perfect, go for it. First, what I tell to everyone, it's not always related to gender, but this is really good. Done is better than perfect. If you hesitate to do it, like if you hesitate to give a talk or no, to reach out to give a talk or no, just do it. Yeah. You, you, and, and, and you know what, the same happened to me. Like I hesitated was I should reach out to Zoli and, and, you know, and do the talk. And I was like, am I smart enough to do the talk? Hell I am. Yes, I have something to share. 
And this is what I guess in, in female communities like in we need to recognize that we deserve this and we need to empower ladies around us to do so. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I need to thank actually as well because both Zoli and Joshua trust in me and I'm here today speaking yeah. with you. So it's really, thanks and a lot. You're doing a great job. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, so go on, other tips or whatever, something that I came to your mind. I have something in mind. Um, I think that if you want to really push your career forward, you have to, in fact, push forward. <laughs> and what I mean is, if you're competent and silent, you will be ignored. Don't be silent, use your voice, shout the answer. Uh, you have a voice, then use it. I mean, what is it gonna happen when you make a mistake? So what, if somebody makes fun of you because you're making a mistake, you own it, you throw it back on their faces, and it's your mistake, and it's your biggest opportunity to learn. I mean, yeah, it's risky. I mean, I can understand how it feels risky. I am scared all the time. Oh, yes. It's not like I'm super courageous and brave. But uh, I do it anyways. Uh, you're scared, do it anyways. Yes. Uh, we're not getting out of the life, you know, alive. Everything is risky. If you think making a mistake is risky, wait until they give you the bill for not trying. Yeah. That's risky too. That's a nice word. Actually, <laughs> if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't work. <laughs> just to sting a bit. Yeah, and I guess for me to just like to cover what they already said, achievements don't speak for themselves. They oh. don't. Yes, they don't. that's. Mm -hmm. the, I always say that. And uh, if it's based on facts, it's not bragging. It's not bragging if it's based on facts. <laughs> and I also want to add something. I think what I would like. Um, Two things I want to say. Uh, one thing is that I would like for the females to be more supportive of the females right. because exactly. I think males and I, and I know this is not the purpose of this convo, but I want to be honest because that's everyone that follows me knows that I'm going to be like that. Um, I think males are really doing efforts to support women, but females need to do the same because I feel like most of the times the females are not as supportive of their female counterparts. And that's a conversation that needs to happen. And I know I'm probably gonna get canceled because of this, but that's the truth. Um, and secondly, I'm in an amazing group called Women Tech Makers. It's a group, um, it's an initiative by Google. And it's a great community of uh, female uh, ambassadors or memberships, like I'm an ambassador. And what teaches, uh, what, what I learned from this community is that, uh, you know, you can go there, it's a safe space, but there's a lot of opportunities like speaking gigs, like certifications, like code uh, boot camps. So uh, on the 16th of April, they're gonna open up again for ambassadors. So if you're watching this, you should apply. You guys should apply. You're, I'm gonna chase you to apply. <laughs> and apply, get into this program, and Google, is, and Google doesn't pay my bills, but they're doing a great job to promote women, to help them put, the, put them out there. But, I would love again to see more support from us to each other Absolutely. versus looking to be saved because we're not going to be saved. We are going to save ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for pushing me. I must say, like, she's completely 100% right. And uh, this morning I made an interview because Juliana pushed me too. It's Thanks, important Juliana. to help each other too. I love women and I would push all of you, you know, like all the time. <laughs> like, I, I don't feel, I think we, we sometimes as women feel threatened by other women. And, yes. it, and it shouldn't be like that because every woman is unique in what they can do. Sure, I would like to look like, uh, I don't know, tell me somebody, a model that's skinny and looks Julia like... Roberts. No. No, okay. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> Sophia Loren. I would love to look like Sophia Loren, but okay. I'm gonna die at night because I don't look like Sophia Loren. No, I'm gonna have my steak and go to sleep happy. You know? <laughs> so like, you don't need to compare yourself with other women. You should applaud them. And I think, and I love in our industry, people like, um, like I love Krista, I love Elsa Ertz, because they're trailblazing for other people to come and support, and uh, I love that. So be more like them, and uh, don't feel threatened by uh, other women, because we're not, we're not enemies. Oh, that's, that's yeah. absolutely We're here all together? Yeah, we're all, we're all you know, we if it was just for want me, the same like, thing. All of the women were, were here. Unless but... we're fighting for men, <laughs> that's another story. But... <laughs> No, that's, that's nice, that's fair. Uh, I really appreci appreciate that. I also, what I feel sometimes here in Super Week, there are really few women, I, I'm also one of them, that don't ask questions. So uh, it's like, 
Yeah, right? Yeah, I was uh, actually yesterday when Sima gave his talk, I have a brilliant question and I just hesitated to ask him this in public. And this is exactly what he was telling during his session, like you have to stand up, you have to answer the, uh, to ask the questions. And I, what I did, I just reached out to him, um, yeah, uh, you know, by the bar. I didn't do that in the audience. Yeah, yeah but the, it's that little step forward, I think, and right? And it felt safe to you, and I think that's fine, because for some people, you, when you're trying to do something, you want to do something that's most real to what you think is real. So that's fine, you know? But it also helps the community, you know, asking questions, yeah. showing, like, this is, you know, a whole train, like, you do the same, Posca look at me, does the same. And we, we just need to be, how do you say, more brave, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I deal with that a lot, <laughs> as you know, as everyone knows here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> saw me cry yesterday, so. Okay, yeah. that's nice. We have a couple of minutes left. I have one question that is important for me, like, uh, do you think that actually we are going to a world that is more inclusive for women? Do you think we are reaching this step and how we can help this happen? Because also we had another talk, if I don't, I'm not wrong, I wasn't there, but they speak about the fact that also based on salaries, if we need to match the salaries, it will take ages. Like, is it? Yeah, Maria mentioned it. Yeah. Like 270 years because of the COVID. It just was a big drawback. Wow. There is a study that shows it to match uh, men's salaries, we yeah. would need to... So the objective here is there is a way we can boost that or other people are, can help us, I, I mean male ones, that can help us reach that because we are, we are not able to, I think, to, de to do that and deal with that just on our own. We are yeah. a population, we are a world. So if, I don't know if you have any ideas, brainstorming and... I guess disclosure of salaries will help. Yeah, transparency, of course. Nice. Like, it should be a barometer, you know, for the job and not for the person that takes the job. At the same time, you know, because I'm a business person, I know you'll get this, uh, there has to be a salary based on skills, because, you know, that's true. But in life, you don't have what you want, you have what you negotiate. <laughs> so just ask for, if you think you have to be paid better, just ask for it. Yeah, and I guess ladies negotiate less. Yeah, that's yeah. very true. You don't get what you need, you get what you work for. Yeah, or and what you ask for. Or what do you ask for? Yeah, no, 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 I didn't mean yeah. work for in the sense that we have to work harder. Yeah. But that, again, as I said before, push yourself push forward, you. make it clear that if you want my work, which has a high value, right? I, I can drive a value, I can drive a revenue for you. And if you don't give me what I want, then something that you don't like will happen to you. Not like a physical threat, of course, <laughs> but you, know, you may need to make it clear that you have standards. Yeah. And, you know, we need to do it as a group because, of course, if 70% of females out of fear they neglect their standards, they neglect their boundaries, then it's going to be so much harder for the other smaller percentage to do so. Okay. For sure. If you want to add something, yes, because I, I saw, saw that you, you were to, speaking, yeah. we have just one... No, no, not, not actually. I just have a good story when I was um, getting my first job. Um, so I, I got the offer and uh, my husband wanted me to negotiate and I just couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And he, he just grabbed my phone and wrote in an email, and he negotiated it like, is it like this? And I mean, from my name, but he did it for me, yeah. because I just couldn't do that. So yeah, it's a good advice, just do it. Like, try to negotiate whatever you want. That's it. Yeah. That's nice. Oh, that's a good one. So I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here and have these wonderful women with me. <laughs> so really, thanks a lot, it's nice. And I really hope that we can help us out to reach what we want because women are strong, are wonderful and powerful. So stick with us and come to Super Week next year. Yes. Bye. Yes. Yay.
Yes, welcome back to Super Week TV. My name is Jamar Reyes from the brand leadership community and I've been given the special honour to interview some of the brightest minds in the analytics industry and to talk about their career journey, the important learnings and the value of their relationships in community. And in this segment, I have a very special guest, uh, met over a game of Mario Kart. Uh, I lost by that much. I still think you were, you were, you were gaming me, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I have uh, James Cole all the way from uh, the United States of America, uh, Hungary, uh, coming over the way to Hungary. Um, he is the Associate Director for Digital Me Measurement Solutions at SEER Interactive. Welcome. It's so good to be sitting with you again, not with uh, Super Mario Kart this time. Um, welcome to Hungary. Welcome to Europe. How, what are your impressions of, uh, of Super Week? This is your first time here, right? Yeah, it is. Thank you. And uh, it's been incredible. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to, to go to a lot of conferences so far in my, my short career, less than 10 years, but um, I've been to uh, over a dozen conferences, and, and this one's special. Um, there's obviously, you know, the setting itself, being out in Europe as an American is interesting in and of itself. Um, but I think there's uh, something to say about the, the level of speakers that we have, the, the people being here for five days is incredible. Um, you're able to learn and, and meet people on a kind of different level. Mm. So it's, it's really, it's a, it's a little bit different, something special. Is there any one particular thing that you're gonna remember about Super Week? 2023 that sticks out there's definitely a lot of a lot of fun moments uh playing mario kart was a lot of fun <laughs> it <does. laughs> um it, it it's really great to just um meet a lot of the the faces and the names that i um look up to learn from um and you know use in my day-to-day -day and and use for my, my team actually uses a lot as well. So it's really special and cool to get to meet a lot of these people, get to hear what they're working on um, and, and get feedback from them about my problems and the challenges that, that my team faces as well. So that's, I mean, it's not, not one particular thing, but I would say that's a very special piece that I'll remember. Yeah, so I mean, I'd like to dig in your career path um, and, and you know, from the time you started working, you know, professionally leaving high school mm. or, or college, but it just give us a quick, Introduction to to your current role and what what you're doing at Sierra Interactive. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I'll start with my current role and then I'll I'll go back to the beginning and just speak a little bit because uh, there's a little bit of an interesting story I think. But um, so I am the associate director of measurement digital measurement solutions at Sierra. And basically, what that means is I help make sure my team and I help make sure that our clients have accurate, actionable data that they're collecting. So we help them strategize, build, implement, QA, everything. So when under, you talk data, it's not just web data, it's is it all sources, basically? Web and app primarily. Okay. Um, but we do we do some offline stuff as well. Um, so like, you know, uh, a, a CRM back into a web system as well. So yeah, yeah I'm uh, fortunate enough to, to manage a couple teams, about four teams, um, and they do various aspects of that. So one helps the greater organization, make sure that our clients that maybe don't have direct digital measurement solution services still are able to measure some of the core things that, that we need to at SEER to make sure we can prove our value and help make sure that they're successful. Um, another team that works with enterprise clients specifically, and then another team that works uh, is developers, so they'll help come into projects for specific needs, and then another team that um, provides just Google Analytics 360 services for the license-only clients. Yeah, wow. Okay, that's, uh, you got, it sounds like you got a lot on your plate there and you've, you're pretty much covering the whole data gamut of uh, solutions for your clients, right? So, so it must be uh, a bit of tribal management there, I would imagine, in terms of keeping everyone in line. So, so tell us about from the beginning, you know, even, you know, is there something even from childhood that, that inspired you or, or signs that saw that you had a knack, interest or love for, for data or data, depending on how we want to call it, um, that you found it at, at an early age uh, or early start in your career? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So I definitely think I've I always had an interest and I'm definitely not, you know, a, a super heavy stats or maths person. But I was always interested in it, so I just had a, a, an interest in it. I think my, my father was actually an entrepreneur growing up, so that was actually a driving force more so than, let's say, necessarily math or analytics in and of itself. So, um, you know, he was solving challenges in his day-to-day -day for his business. 
And I think that was what actually helped spur me down the path. Um, but going into my path a little bit, um, I, I always kind of knew I wanted to get into business, but wasn't quite sure where and what that looked like. Um, so I went to a, a university, a college in Philadelphia called Drexel, and they have what's called a five-year business program. So essentially in year one and five, they're kind of just normal school years where you have like nine months of school, three months off. But the middle three years, um, you have a six-month period of classes and six-month period of what's called co-op, which essentially is just working up to 40 hours a week, so working a full-time job. So through that experience, what I learned, I, I worked at first at Estee Lauder in a production facility, so making makeup and overseeing um, that process. So that was really interesting because I got to work with people of all walks of life, from high school all the way through like retirees. Um, of many different backgrounds and, and some people that didn't speak English. So it was really formative, I think, in the way that I uh, started building my leadership style at that age. Okay, so was that a manufacturing uh, role? Yeah, it was Yeah, it was literally just managing um, production lines of yeah. makeup. So they would literally come in and, and we would instruct them and, and make sure everything was set up and yeah. um, you know, pick this box up put the stamp on it, put it back down. That was, that was what they were doing. That, that, that's why you were totally comfortable when you're getting makeup put on before this segment. Right? <laughs> exactly, like, exactly. He's, he's at ease here. He's not yeah, totally freaking yeah. out about that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then from there, uh, I, I went and worked on the mercantile exchange floor, um, so trading commodities. Um, some of my, my family works on the floor, so I was fortunate wow, to, okay. to do an internship there in New York City. Well, that's a different type of data, a financial data, right? So, yeah. But it's, there must be some similar crossovers with with predictive analysis and stuff like that. Well, predictions are super important in that yeah. game, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, so that was very interesting. You've ever seen the movie like Trading Places? Eddie yeah, Murphy. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's that that like big pit where they're they're yelling and stuff like that. That's that's actually where I went and worked every day. And, and um, living in New York City was incredible. So I did that for six months. Um, and then my last co-op, I worked at uh, Goldman Sachs in private wealth management in Philadelphia. Um, and that was, that was very formative, very important for many. I mean, I learned a lot, but the biggest takeaway was that um, I didn't want to actually work in finance. And mm -hmm. I really just dreaded, by the, end, by the middle of that, that co-op, I dreaded um, working there. It just wasn't fun. There was just something energizing about yeah, it. You have me. to live and breathe it. I mean, you've probably met the people there. They really lived and, and breathed. Yep. I, I also worked in an investment bank for two years in the content division, and it was like, that's enough to, for me to know. <laughs> Same thing. I don't necessarily want to do this role, and the people that are there, they live and breathe in the same way that we live and breathe analytics data exactly, marketing yeah. now, right? Exactly. So there was there was four interns, four of us, four co-ops, and you know the first weekend we're all like, "This is great, high five in." They paid us ridiculous, you know, especially you know at that time in college it was a ridiculous amount of money. You know, a month later, three out of the four of us were like, "How much longer do we have of this?" Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, the the, the, the takeaway was that I, I realized. Um, it wasn't the path that I wanted to go down mm -hmm. and um, was fortunate enough to be able to pivot from that. Yep. Um, and, and that's how, through my network and the community at, at my college and the people that I knew, mm -hmm. um, I got another kind of like off the record um, internship, just a regular internship like outside of my school um, at a marketing agency. And I had a mentor help me recognize and kind of see the landscape and understand that there's in-house and agency. Um, and that eventually led me down the path again through my network. I got coffee with somebody towards my, the end of my time at university. Mm. And um, he said, you know, sounds interesting. Like, you might want to check out Sear, like where I work. Mm. Um, so within, you know, a week after that, I studied. I, I Googled what is Google Analytics. I took the GAIQ, yeah. went and interviewed and um, was fortunate enough to, to, to apparently do well enough to get a job and um, worked at Sear as an associate. Um, graduated to a senior associate, so that's essentially executing work day to day and yep. just doing a lot of the, the, the setup and implementation, QA, all that sort of stuff. And then I was promoted to an account manager, eventually a senior account manager. And those are basically the quarterbacks of our projects. So they'll work with clients. So a quarterback things. for our non-American football players is the, the, the game maker, right? Yes, or, yes, exactly. One that throws exactly. the ball and in exactly. the Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. Kind of devising the strategy, kind yeah. of like looking at what's on the field. Yeah, yeah like, you know, handing the ball off. Yeah, yeah throwing yeah. it, exactly. Kind in, of. in Europe, football is, is a round ball. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly, so. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's super interesting because like, you know, I suppose one of the messages is that your career path is really figuring out what you don't want to do, but 
taking learnings along the way. So working in a, in a production line, you know, there's a fair of, uh, amount of structured thinking, you would think, in terms of you know, batch processes and the mm -hmm. fact that you need all components. Uh, and then to go into finance where you're dealing with, with data or data, just to be inclusive to everyone in the world, um, which is also relevant. I, you know, I've done both. I worked at IBM in the distribution section, uh, you know, moving boxes and, mm -hmm. and shipping, doing stock take and all that kind of... I actually realised how much I loved that. It was, it was the funnest job, right? And then to go into um, uh, Saxo Bank Finance and do that. Same thing. A couple of years, it was like, this is super exciting, super interesting, but, hey, this is really not for me yeah. kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but when you start dealing, and I think probably the, the similar passion is, you know, you are really judging or, or what do you call it, the reporting on the user experience on a website and that whole customer journey. I th it sounds like a lot of those elements of the jobs that you tried probably primed more what you're doing now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. And I, I left out two other, a couple other jo smaller jobs, but uh, I also worked in, in retail a while. So I worked at Lids, the hat, hat store, if you've ever seen them. No. And uh, Journeys, which is a, a shoe company. They're actually owned by the same corporation. So but, in retail, in, well. in, in, the, in a shop? Yeah, in, the, yeah. in a mall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and you know what, we uh, was talking to Maria earlier on, and, and you know, these type of um, service roles, hospitality roles, um, and if, certainly in my time, I've worked with a lot of people in a lot of companies and seen a lot of high-performing graduates that haven't had any work experience come into the workplace and just melt down because mm. the, the, the skills that you develop in dealing with customers face-to-face, -face, thinking on your feet, yeah. um, knowing how to structure a solution uh, while the world is burning but still have a smile on your face, all right? I mean, that, that's, that's a, uh, like a, a skill set that you don't pull out of a book. So, yeah. so it, and, and I think, you know, this is, as you t casually tore me to shreds at Mario Kart, you know, the other day, I thought, you know, you're a bit of a player here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway we, went, we don't have to talk too much about Mario Kart anymore, yeah. but it was, a, it was a great way. This is what Super Week is about, right? Yeah. You know, just meeting people um, serendipitously. Um, so what would you say... And we will go in a bit of uh, the Nintendo side of things, and I, I like this question. You know, how would you, a, a self-evaluation, how would you describe what your main superpowers are? So if we look at superpowers are as um, what you're good at slash what you love to do, because innately what mm. you love doing is what you're good at um, and sometimes what you're known for. Uh, you're the go-to person for you know, fill in the blanks from there, what would they be? Yeah, well, if I'm answering, honestly, what I love to do is I, I love to cook. So yeah. I, would, I would do that, yes. um, but I do that in my free time. But um, at work, what, what I think I'm good at, um, and it's actually a part of my personal life too, um, I think, I like to think I'm, I'm a good communicator and effectively able to bring parties together and kind of set, see a vision and help lay out the plan for that vision. Yeah. Um, so I'm definitely, I, I'm not on the, I'm not very good at necessarily coming up with grandiose ideas or innovation, like thinking outside of the box and like turning that or creating a net new solution. I am very good at, this is kind of separate, I guess, from the first thing, but I'm very good at um, optimizing a process and understanding some of the missing pieces and developing process around that. So yeah. that's, I think that's, that's probably more where my, my skill sets are. Yeah, and look, I mean, we're here, we're surrounded with a lot of people who are the grandiose thinkers and, and idea developers. Mm -hmm. And uh, a gentleman that everyone has mentioned today, a guy that I work very closely with, uh, Steen Rasmus, and everyone's mentioned his talks, but he's, he's one of these grandiose idea guys that comes up with great innovative solutions and um, solutions, but also new ideas, new ways to do things, new ways of looking at things. Uh, often when we do work together on events or, or uh, courses or stuff like that, I'm probably the more like you kind of thing. Mm. If it's like, okay, how do we take that idea and make it... Because an idea itself uh, is just hot air until it's executed, mm. right? So, so this is the... And when you've got a lot of great ideas, I think uh, that's, that's a great skill to have. Do you have uh, a good range of people with those great ideas in your in your community or circle? Yeah, world. definitely. Um, very fortunate to have a, a, a lot of uh, incredible thinkers, teammates at SEER. Um, so a couple that I'll note here is uh, our founder and CEO, Will Reynolds, is a, a big, big person in the SEO world. Um, but he's, he's so much more than SEO. He's really, uh, over the last five to six years, 
um, really focused on just expanding and going beyond search engine optimization and thinking about how we can he can use we can use other data sets to help inform our not just SEO problems, challenges, but really just business problems. So there's a lot that, that um, he pushes the envelope there. So he's an incredible thinker. Um, there's a bunch of people on my team um, that, that work kind of day to day with clients and that come up with new ideas, no, new ways to look at things, all sorts of things like that. So um, you know, there's a bunch of people in, in the R&D side, Tracy McDonald, and there's people on, so I, I mentioned earlier, I'm Associate Director of Digital Measurement Solutions, which is kind of one half of analytics and insights at SEER. The other half is strategy and analytics, which is kind of a, a, weird, a weird name and a little bit of a misnomer, but they focus on basically using data, the, mm. using the data that we help collect, um, as well as other data sets. So there's a bunch of smart people over there that bring data together in unique ways and help our clients use that data to help inform strategies and make decisions as well. Mm. Yeah, we, we're carving through this uh, in terms of <laughs> some really good questions and I'm, I'm almost, uh, we're running out of time, but uh, I'm going to go straight to, um, yeah, we, I wanted to ask if you want to quickly answer um, some of the big challenges that you've seen uh, and, and how have you, have you dealt with them? So, I mean, there, there's many challenges I could get into. I think um, one of them is, you know, the, the played out one, but over the last two, two and a half years, there's been a lot of shifts in the labor market. So as a manager of a team, um, it's been, we've had really good retention, especially as an agency, like well above industry standard um, for the, the eight years that I've been at SEER. What's industry standard in the US? Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, it's probably, uh, our, SEER was running at about like 80, 85% team retention um, prior to the pandemic. Yeah, so, per, per year. Yeah, per yeah. year, so we, which we felt is very good. And, and historically, like that's where we were at. Um, Post-pandemic, that number dipped. Um, now, it wasn't 50%, but it wasn't 85, 80, 85% either, um, which, again, there was many years of data that suggested that was where we were at, and that's dipped since then. So um, trying to understand that, and the ch a challenging part of it was, you know, we're, we're losing teammates that have historical knowledge, um, the ability to do things, and we're in the office. So there was an education element, there's a knowledge sharing, communication, that overnight quickly disappeared, and then those team members that knew how to do things or knew the process of things are no longer with us. Mm. So it's kind of reset and um, helped us kind of, now it's, it's put a lot more emphasis and importance on standard operating procedures, documentation, um, which is both very strange because we're not like a very red tape sort of organization, mm -hmm. but we've recognized we, we need these things to make sure that our team is successful as well. So that's been a big challenge. Um, and then, you know, the elephant in the room, we, we have a lot of clients on, on Google Analytics. So yep. moving to GA4 has been a lot of fun um, for a variety of reasons, but there's definitely uh, challenges in, the, in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're learning GA4 alongside of our clients some days yep. um, and, and trying to make the, the best use of it. So that's definitely been um, helping our clients get ready. I think the tool aspect is one piece of it. The technical side, like we're, we're more than capable of doing that, right? I think that's the easier part, what's actually more hard, is helping our clients in the organizational adoption of the mm. tool. The, the people element um, is generally more challenging. The change management mm. requires um, planning as well. So it's not just uh, getting it stood up and implemented is really the first piece of many more to come. Mm. So last question I really want to, um, uh, I've been asking everyone, community, what, how, what's the value of community to your career and I suppose mm. uh, your fellow peers either in your company or even outside your company? That is a, a very cl uh, close question to our heart at SEER. Um, so we actually, we were founded by my founder earlier, I mentioned Will, back in 2000, 2001. He quit his job because his job would not let him come in an hour early and leave an hour early um, on Wednesdays to go volunteer at the, the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. So he quit and eventually that led to him starting the company that he's in, or he started today. So SEER at its core has an emphasis on community. So one of our pillars, one of the things that we focus on is not just doing well for ourselves, not just doing well for our clients, but we have an emphasis and really wanna impact the communities that we work in. So philanthropy and volunteering is a very big thing for us. 
Um, we track all of our time. We have we actually have a community manager at SEER, yeah. um, and she focuses wow. solely on ensuring that we have opportunities. They're easy for us to use. We have a platform for it all mm. now. It's a new role. She's only been on the scene less than a year. Um, so in, in short, I think... Would love to talk to her, by the way. I, <laughs> I, great, I already... A community I was, person I, Don't worry, I was going to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it's a big deal for us. And we just went through, literally, not even six months ago, a rebrand. Um, and one of our taglines now is, you know, setting fire to assumptions and building communities out of the ashes. So that is literally like I have, we have slides with that tagline on them. It's on our website now. Wow. Um, and as a part of that, one of the big uh, efforts for us is that we, we donate $30 million to uh, philanthropic organizations um, by, I think it's 2030, something like that. So we're really focused on giving back both in you know, our volunteering and our time, um, as well as giving in, in ways from our, our, our organization too. Wow, so look, from, from an annoying guy that beat me in uh, Mario Kart, to a guy that was saying, uh, when is uh, Sear International coming to Europe? <laughs> it's been a real pleasure getting to know you even more uh, in, in, in this environment. And uh, I really hope you enjoy the rest of your time here in, in Europe, in Hungary. Yeah. Uh, and hope to see you back again. So awesome. thanks again for your time, James. Yep, this is Joma from uh, Brand Leadership Community signing off for Super Week TV. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and we've got more coming up uh, tomorrow as well. Thank you and we'll see you soon. the new wild west of analytics that's the title that's the title y'all uh, y'all remember this it, the funny thing is I'm not from the west I'm, I'm from the southeast I'm from Atlanta um, and so I have no connection to wild west anything um, really just southeastern barbecue and that's about it but 10 years ago uh, y'all remember this that was my favorite cactus. No, do y'all have a favorite cactus? From back before the analytics industry? That's good. As <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know. Um, but the idea is 10, 12, 15 years ago, things were just kind of blossoming. Everything was unstructured. Uh, it was the Wild West. That's the metaphor. The metaphor is it was unstructured. It's the Wild West. So there you go. There it is. Thank you. Metaphors. Metaphors. Um, and over the years, you know, through tag management systems, through uh, getting rid of web trends and core metrics and migrating to Google, Adobe, um, we have Amplitude, uh, which, is, which is on the scene now. Uh, there has been a lot of change, and I, I think, you know, I can say that we're at a point where we can call the analytics industry relatively matured. And I know that's like a, a dirty word, saying that we are a matured industry, because a lot of times we're up here saying, well, where's the value? You know, uh, like Ibrahim's presentation, how do we calculate the value? And the thing is, like, we have built our industry up so much that now we're kind of 
pulling back a little bit. We're seeing regulation through privacy. We're seeing um, standardization across a lot of tools architecturally. Uh, and yet, we're still talking about a lot of the same stuff that we were 10 years ago. So to me, I'm like, this is a relatively matured industry. It doesn't feel like it, again, but it is. <laughs> so like I said, we've, we've got a lot of stuff with privacy. <laughs> caught, me, caught me looking. And by the way, if you don't like this presentation, you can follow along in this little flip book. There's no narrative to it, but it's uh, fun to keep track of in the bottom uh, <laughs> right-hand corner. Um, we got event-based analytics tools. You know, we've migrated to a consistent architecture. And basically, what we've done is we have built <laughs> up, oh yeah. And in the, in the Wild West, you need an ice pick. It's basically the tool that you keep getting sold, but you don't really need, but you want to check the box. Um, that's a long thing. You might want to take a picture of this one because it's the only one with a description on it. <laughs> um, but the gist of it is, we are, we are structured. And to me, that's kind of boring. And that's why I said you're either going to love this or you hate this. Um, because you either find this boring, um, you know, the structure of analytics, or you love it. Having structure is viable. Having structure is not a bad thing. But having structure also means we work within certain bounds, right? Um, sometimes it can limit certain types of innovation. Not all innovation, but certain types of innovation. For instance, I can make a lot of money off of privacy. Um, you know, keeping people out of analytics jail. Uh, <laughs> you can also make a lot of money on implementing tools. But I feel like year, year in, year out, we're gonna come back and tell the same stories where, you know, we're trying to break down silos or we're just trying to get somebody take me seriously kind of conversation. Um, and I think that is a product of, of this structure. So how do, we, how do we look at this differently? If you want to, if you don't want to, that's cool too. But how do we look at this differently? How do we create a blank canvas and work with a blank canvas? So we have those possibilities that we had 15 years ago when we were breaking into stuff and we were just breaking, breaking things and building this industry. One option <laughs> is to work within the structure. And there is still innovation within the structure. Um, for instance, you know, there's this smaller, uh, and this structure is the smaller side of, of business in that um, we're often seen as a, a you know, we've, we've heard people talk about analytics being a cost center. Um, and there's opportunity for us to make the work that we do a lot faster. For instance, with implementation, um, you know, I see there's a lot of opportunity with automating data layers, um, the creation of data layers. Uh, I don't think anything is particularly doing it incredibly well at the moment. And so when we're talking about innovation within our current structure, it's there. But this whole presentation is called Finding the Wild West, so let's, let's talk about what we think, what I think is next. So the West also has trees and water and mountains, at least Western US. <laughs> but, the, uh, but what we want to be able to do is build, uh, build something else. And how do, we, how do we change the way that we think about analytics so we're not bound to the structures uh, that we're currently living in. And not necessarily getting around privacy, not necessarily not using analytics tools. But we've got this big bank called media where they just kind of throw money at stuff. And one really interesting thing that they throw money at is display advertising. <laughs> Programmatic. I, I mean, 
I, you know, I, I hear a lot of laughs. I'm sure we all kind of have the same opinion about this, but um, a remarkable amount of that, a, a non-negligible amount of the money that's spent is spent on fraud and bots. Is anyone surprised by that? What percent do you think it is? I, I'm just, this is broad strokes. That's a good one. <laughs> seen that? You can guess any number pretty much, and we've, we've, we've seen it. 127. 127%, absolutely. It's the same bot over and over. Um, so, so we've seen 60%, 20%, 99%, 95%. I mean, it depends on how you invest. Um, and we all knew, we all know that. Um, there is, there are flaws in how uh, we spend money on stuff like display. Um, the future of analytics, in my opinion, is not in necessarily taking that money from media and making it go to work, um, which that's part of it. But it's in bot identification and human identification. In long term, what we're gonna find is that human identification is gonna provide a lot more value to our business uh, than how we're operating at the moment, which is just kind of focusing on what we can't track, focusing on um, everything that, that you know, we're bound to um, and kind of boxed in. Um, and sorry, I haven't slept in 36 hours, so <laughs> if I drone a little bit, it's because of that. <laughs> but, but basically, current, uh, current tools are, have this sign over, the, uh, over this bar that says humans only. So you look at tools like Double Verify, IAS, um, Integral Ad Sciences, um, that look at basically server log string matching. So like they look at IP address, they look at user agent, stuff like that, to determine whether or not the traffic that's viewing the ad is human or non-human. Um, the, the great thing is, for people who like committing fraud, is that's really easy to fake. And the challenge that we're running into is there's kind of this industrial complex, right? The ad platforms need the fraud to fulfill their buys. The agencies need to fulfill their buys. The client needs to tell a success story to grow their team and maintain their budget. And all of this adds up to this, and, and obviously the fraudster wants money. Um, all of this adds up to uh, uh, this industrial, almost industrial complex where, uh, where everyone is, is enabling each other. Um, it's the, uh, I'm at a loss for words because I'm so tired, I'm dizzy. <laughs> it's, a, it's symbiotic, right? They all need each other. And there's very little incentive uh, at the moment to do anything about it because they can push a button and say, oh, Double Verify is already doing it. But as analysts, we know that there's more to it than just IP address. There's more to it than just user agent because I can buy a list of 70,000 residential IP addresses, run through them, hit sites that I've created, probably by a bot, and increment thousands of impressions and collect money. So we have to look at behavior. And it's only getting harder um, to detect bots. You know, we think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when you used to get that friend invite on, on Facebook on someone you clearly did not know. Do you think the bots have gotten dumber? I mean, have they gotten simpler, or have they gotten more complicated? And only this year, we're starting to talk about it. We have Lucas's session coming up, um, I think, on Wednesday. Um, and and this, is, this is where we get into the meat of where we're going as an industry. Um, because we're hitting critical mass with this fraud. 
And I think it can go a lot further than just media. And the story that we're telling is basically every dollar that's spent, or euro, I you know we're in the EU, <laughs> you're getting $3 worth of value. Because we can reduce the bot volume from about 99% to something that's not that, closer to 20 to 30%. There's always going to be inherent fraud. But looking ahead, as we see technology like chat GPT, um, and as AI progresses, we have to assume that the methodologies that bots use will become more and more complex. So when we think about a new frontier in the new Wild West, what we want to think about isn't detecting bots, isn't necessarily detecting fraud, it's detecting humans and human signals. Because right now, tools brag about how good they are at identifying a user and stitching together sessions. But really, I mean, are those are stitching together sessions to, to complete a full picture of a user. But is that actually a user? Is that actually a person? I mean, in the last 15 years of my career, um, you know, we see bot attacks, but we haven't factored in the kind of latent impact that it has on, my, on our websites. We just kind of accept it. We just kind of have to assume that everyone's a human unless it comes from a browser named Body McBotface. <laughs> so how do we leverage technology? <laughs> you liked it. I saw that. <laughs> how do we leverage emerging technology to detect humans and classify humans. And I think Tim Berners-Lee uh, talked about having a personal identifier that you carry around with yourself. Tim Berners-Lee is the, uh, um, he invented the World Wide Web, so, you know, seems pretty smart. Um, <laughs> but basically the idea is you control who you give your identity to. You control um, whether you want to identify yourself as a human, as a person, with whatever information you choose to give. And I think over the next 10 years, 15 years, we might see people, or we might see browsers, move in that same direction, where you carry around your own packaged identification, and you're controlling what you give up to websites. But I also believe that that's going to tighten up how a user is defined and how a human is defined. And so when we run tests, when we talk about sessions, when we talk about users, it's going to mean more than just whatever a cookie is defined. It's going to actually have data behind it showing that we are targeting humans. Anyway, that's my tired spiel. Um, <laughs> you can follow me at Gymalytics on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I use that name a lot. And, um, are there any questions or comments? I'm sure I didn't make some people what happy. What going to be right now is a huge round of applause. Stop. Stop. Hi. It's really a pleasure to be here for the first time on stage. Um, yeah, you might think that I'll be convincing you that G4 is or will be better than Universal Analytics, but I believe and I hope that we all agree on that. It's just work in progress, sort of, <laughs> so we're getting there. Um, but it's not, um, in my experience, it's not the first migration sort of migration to the upgraded uh, version of the tool. I've been here for a while in measurement, so I did the previous sort of migration. It wasn't a true migration in that sense from Universal Analytics uh, 2 to Analytics 3. So Universal Analytics, but was, that was super easy, right? We just changed the snippet and we didn't even change the interface or like, we just started using new features. It was fun. And I think, and what I see is that clients tend to hope for similarly smoothless transition to G4, while G4 is a completely new product. And um, it would be easier. So I did that migration from two to three, and then also some migrations from Adobe Analytics to 
to universe analytics. And in that sense, I'd say that migrating to GE4 is similar to this migration from completely different platform to Google Analytics. And if clients consider this migration in that sense, like changing the platforms at all, they might maybe not shift their expectations from Universe Analytics to GE4 and everything would, went, uh, would, would go smoother. So, um, I don't want you to tell, I don't, why, I, will, I will not explain why it's going to be better, it will be, um, but I want to share some thoughts and some ideas uh, based on the experience that I've got and um, highlight some of the features and opportunities lying um, with the migration to G4. And I actually uh, have something in common with Adam, the, the previous speaker. I might at some point tell you that you don't, ha you don't have to collect data in Google Analytics. Um, so, yeah, we might not need all the data that you're sending to Google Analytics and even to Google Ads. Uh, you might not even need that too, um, as long as you know what the job is, what you want to accomplish with the data that you're collecting. But with Universal Analytics, it was easy in previous versions of Analytics. We just collected everything. Uh, the lucky ones with 360 uh, got the data in uh, BigQuery, and then you just had to you know, utilize the data. With the changing privacy landscape and with the uh, increasing costs of uh, querying the data, using the data, processing the data, it's really getting more and more challenging. So you might want to consider, again, um, and maybe spend some more time on that, why this data, why you should shape your data collection more. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's me. This is how I imagine myself setting up analytics uh, years ago uh, when I worked for the agency and then for, on the client side. Um, I was literally brainstorming what data I can put in the tool. What else can be useful? Uh, what purposes uh, can be potentially in future um, uh, that might need any of the data that I can come up with um, in the data architecture? So I had this all well thought through, the ideas, the segmentation, the concepts, the tracking, and then the other teams using my data, data. like who cares, whatever, let's take it, let's use it. So today I want to start with sharing two, I used my advice from Maria and I, I will stop the GIF so you don't wet, go wet mad because of the move on the screen. Uh, I want to share two conversations with one with um, the agency and one with the account manager of a client. Recent conversations. Something that I wouldn't maybe expect very much. Um, so the first one was when we gathered the feedback from the funded program uh, for supporting the migration to G4 and the agency was the partner involved in the program. And we asked them, I asked specifically what challenges you see, what problems you face when migrating to GE4, uh, specifically about reporting. So I asked, because I already knew about some challenges, right? Like quotas in Data Studio, Looker Studio, um, like missing dimensions in BigQuery, um, cardinality in, in standard reports, and all this stuff. And they said, oh, we don't experience problems with reporting because we focus on implementation first. Oh, that's nice. You're going to have a surprise. And you start setting up dashboards. Um, and there was just a minute after we shared, as a Google shared the feedback with them, they really need to hire someone who will link the dots, like the measurement dot and the business dot. So there's any connection between these two. I believe, I really have the feeling that I've been talking, and like not me only, like we've been talking about that for years already, but it seems that there was no enough incentive to actually focus on shaping the data and shaping the measurement because of, it was cheap and it was easy. The other case is different. On the other end of the scale, uh, there was an advertiser who wanted to implement value-based bidding. For anyone who, for, for people who don't know what value-based bidding is, when you measure, you track conversions, you add value to the conversion, then you send this value of the conversion to an advertising platform for bidding purposes. So the algorithm knows which conversion is better than others and to bid uh, for, for that. 
And this customer um, came up with a super advanced uh, model uh, and very accurate value of the customer, predicted value of the customer. The thing was um, uh, the proper value was known only after seven days, but they had like partial knowledge about the value um, in the, over the span of seven days. So they updated the conversion every day. Uh, for the span of seven days. And they also knew that um, even though the algorithm in the platform said um, uh, the targeted uh, return on ad spend should be around 80% if they start with uh, this value-based bidding, they said it, um, so it was 50%, they set it to 80% because they knew the truth behind. So they knew the grand truth, they knew their truth, the business truth, and they wanted to set everything as accurate as possible just the algorithm and the platform wasn't ready for that because the platform had different data, the algorithm had different data, and as a result, the campaigns dropped. Ick. To zero, no, nada. The target was simply too high. The, the data was uh, updated so often, the algorithm could not learn on the data. So it was the granularity of data and the, the, the accuracy of the data uh, was not fit for the algorithm. All right, so the core part. <laughs> I want to tell you about three areas to consider um, when implementing uh, G4 and how you can uh, use the features. So the first thing is, the first area is reduce which I understand as reduction by design. So you re reduce the scope of data that you collect by focusing on what matters. And what matters is what has a, a business justification, uh, what can be supported by the business case. Uh, to explain that more, I uh, took a nice framework. I borrowed it from the educational uh, curriculum, um, which <laughs> Again, it will be probably similar to other concepts that you know about setting goals and indicators and so on and so forth. But work, backward planning, it basically means that you set up the goal and then only then you set up a, a bunch of methods and forms of um, assessment. So you start with goals, easy, but not that much. So um, you focus on what matters, so what has a business case. Um, and the thing is, Having a user scoring is not a business case. Right? That's, that's the thing that I observe quite often, uh, how, how advertisers, how companies do it wrong. So the business case is if you want to increase return on ad spend, if you want to increase uh, user experience on the page, if you want to uh, increase sales of specific group of products, um, and so on and so forth. Not a user scoring, not a user segmentation, uh, not a product scoring. A business case, easy. <laughs> then the second part is what, and this is where you come up with um, the user scoring or whatever other metric or dimension you want to collect. So you can create data buckets, uh, this, uh, this decide on sources that you want to use, and con consider any legal con um, constraints, limitations that you might have. It's I know it's super high level. But it's important to actually group these data sets and decide on that because this will heavily impact the third step that is the most technical, but fortunately uh, there's an end to, uh, to the list that I want to show you. So once you decide why you want the data and why the information and what data display, uh, explains the, or delivers the information, you should uh, decide how you want to get it. And there's a bunch of ways to, to get the data, but every method has its pros and cons, depending on what do you want to see and how you want to use the data. And the audience, who's the audience? Whether it's, so you can choose a first, it's not a, like, it's not all on the list, right? It's just examples. But you can decide whether you want to see the data in the user interface, where you can see also modeled data which is nice, but user interface, honestly, it has its limitations. But then you have exploration and reports in exploration, but not every exploration tem template uh, supports um, model, model data. So you might miss this part. 
Looker Studio, a recent outrage on Looker Studio uh, about uh, quotas being um, uh, applied to, to the API and impacting uh, dashboards. So there is a, a list of best practice now being published here and there about how to optimize your dashboards. The, the, the quota will not be increased. Okay, you need to optimize your dashboards. If you're planning to use it, to use Looker Studio with the um, native integration with uh, G4, but there are other ways. You can put data in BigQuery and then in Looker Studio. So you need to decide whether you need to see all data, but aggregated, but including model data, or you need granular data in BigQuery, um, but BigQuery, again, is missing some dimensions, some attribution, and other challenges. Some of that is on the roadmap, so bear with us. But then if you need to put, if you really need to put some data, offline data into analytics, you can consider using data import, but this is implication on uh, audiences. Um, so you can consider instead of using data import, a measurement protocol, but again, measurement protocol is different compared to universal analytics. It is not designed to um, replicate or uh, work as a standalone solution to, to track, but it's uh, designed to augment whatever you collected before with the GDAG or SDK. And finally, you really don't have to put all the data in Google Analytics. You can send the data directly to your database for, pur for purposes, for analysis that doesn't requ require the processing of um, Google Analytics. You can then keep your data in different data sets just using matching the data, um, joining using the key. Yeah, and well, when migrating to G4, please, please always do a proof of concept uh, so you don't add, uh, end, end up like um, some of our clients uh, who successfully migrated to G4 but unfortunately cannot replicate dashboards because the data structure is different and there are different limitations or specifics of uh, data channels, uh, sources uh, that they hadn't considered uh, before. Um, so G4 is in place and working, but the dashboards is a huge burden now because they need to actually rethink the whole data um, of, uh, architecture or reporting uh, in, in a broader sense than just Google Analytics. Um, it grows to a, a company-wide project. All right. So the, the second, um, ju jumping <laughs> to the second area, um, control. Um, it's more technically more about uh, um, resources that uh, we've got um, that I want to highlight. Um, because the control, uh, I'd like to understand it as um, being able to understand what is collected and um, how this can be managed, uh, deleted uh, or altered. So first of all, there's a, a fresh, freshly recently published article in Help Center, um, Data Controls in Google Analytics 4. Uh, this is an all-in-one document uh, that um, explains um, what controls uh, Google Analytics offers uh, when it comes to protecting uh, the data security and confidentiality. Uh, what you can find there? Uh, you will find details on the um, things like data, like client ID, advertising um, identifiers, transaction ID, IP address, and many more. You will find information how Google Analytics supports this feature, this data, uh, how it uses that, how the same data is supported by server-side setup, uh, how this may alter or impact the collection, and if the data is altered, how this impact will impact uh, your measurement, what implications this can have. But there's much more than that. Um, there is also um, uh, more explanation on constant modes um, and its impact measurement protocol, Google signals, if you switch it off, how this will um, impact the data, but also the details of uh, data retention and deletion. I know it's like, you can find it in Help Center, so everyone can find it but it's new, you might have not seen it yet. Um, I encourage you to have a look. Uh, it's a nice document to share in, within your company, with uh, your clients. So yeah, there's more than that, uh, a long, uh, old resource, but again, 
just highlighting that we, if we're talking about control, you should be really aware of what's collected so you can find also a long list of cookies, Google cookies that are being used. All right. Um, and why is that? Because if, when you rely on just products um, that will deliver you a certain feature like constant mode, if you implement constant mode, uh, this will impact how tags behave. If user does not give a consent, data is not sent to the servers, um, but it is. Um, and if the user gives consent, um, nothing changes. Everything is sent to the server. But the thing is that if the data, um, if, this pro if the consent mode is properly uh, implemented, uh, it does not surface the individual the, uh, the data in the interface. Uh, it sends um, anonymized data to the server, and anonymized meaning the ID is redacted. <laughs> um, but it does not, the, the, the small line in the help center, it does not impact customer provided data. So if you're sending user, sending user ID, custom dimension like username, Karolina Wrzask, it will get sent to BigQuery. Uh, so, um, and it's working as intended. I like, it's my best favorite fa phrase <laughs> in my new job. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, sending um, PII to BigQuery for unconsented users working as intended, but you can limit that. Don't make photos of that. <laughs> you can redact the data, and there are custom tags uh, in the gallery that you can uh, just download to your container and adjust for your needs. It might also become or might not become a feature on the roadmap. I cannot tell you that because I had no approval from the marketing team. Uh, for my deck, <laughs> so uh, before it becomes or not becomes the feature on the roadmap, you can use a custom tag to redact any PII. Like you use the format for email address or phone number or any other PII that uh, you can identify by formatting to redact that even for unconsented users. Otherwise, it will end up in your BigQuery. All right. So uh, you probably know the service IGTM. So ownership of data or controlling data is much easier if, you, um, if you're controlling that from the server side than from the, uh, from the client side. And for anyone who's not very familiar with the server side, uh, just a quick explanation. Uh, if you're setting up a client side measurement, uh, you have your page and you've got a snippet on the page and you're sending the data directly to the third party servers. Facebook, Google Analytics, Google Ads other servers. If you're setting up a server side um, a tagging, uh, then you have the middleman. So you're sending, it's a simplification, but you're sending one stream of data to, your, to the container on your server, and then you can redact the data, modify, uh, and reach, um, and at least you can see what is then sent in the request to the end servers. The two uh, most popular use cases for that is uh, one is for privacy, so you can redact data that you don't want to see uh, being sent to the servers, uh, but you can also uh, implement privacy solutions, a like constant mode, for, uh, so that your tags that you implement in the server-side container are aware of the uh, user consent and can adjust the behavior. Uh, or enhanced conversions uh, for modeling. I really don't want to go into the details of that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's for privacy. Uh, second one is for data, first party data activation, and here's the part. You don't have to send all the data to, uh, to analytics. You can really, like, if you'd like to analyze product or the content, um, unless you can find a reasonable uh, explanation why you need this data for your marketing purposes, uh, you can really send this to the database for analysis. And then if needed, you just, you can segment the data, process it, clean it up, um, a label, and then send the labels back to analytics. So then you can later utilize it for different uh, marketing purposes and uh, utilize the integrations with the marketing platform. But you don't have to necessarily send the granular data, every bit and piece of data to Google Analytics. And there's the, the solution that I would like to um, tell you more uh, about is um, enriching uh, the data 
uh, dynamically with uh, sensitive data. Like you'd like to um, bid to value, so to the value-based bidding project, uh, but uh, conversion value is not enough. You'd like to bid to profit because you have different profit, uh, the margins, the margins uh, per product. So you'd like to do that, but it's a sensitive data, so you really don't want to um, surface it in the data layer or in the front end, in the, in the browser, so you can enrich uh, your, your stream of data in the server side. But the challenge is that it, it should be dynamic, but the setup um, in server-side GTM already allows that. And I want to um, share a pr project that you can um, test yourself. Uh, there's a documentation I will share in a moment um, uh, called Soteria. And the idea is to use the server-side GTM um, and a custom tag that will look up the, the data, the dynamic data, like profit margin that you have got in your, in um, a Firestore, and will enrich uh, the data that is then streamed to either analytics to to ads. Again, a little simplification, but you can um, you can find that in the GitHub uh, repository, GitHub.com, Google slash GPS area. Uh, that's uh, that's a project that was nicely documented by my colleagues um, from the team. Uh, okay, but if you say, all right, so I'd like to do that, but I really don't have the dynamic data in Firestore, uh, then there's another project, slash Google slash CSV to Firestore, uh, will allow you to test the same solution, but first um, sending, using, using the CSV uh, to feed the data to Firestore. And some launches uh, to this SGTM. Uh, the data reduction and data augmentation will be easier at some point, um, as it's on the roadmap for this year um, for, for SGTM user interface, um, together with um, enabling Google Signals uh, for the SGTM setup, which is not supported now. Um, yeah, and the streamlined deployment with Cloud Run, which is already a recommended way to implement the service side. All right, uh, so I want to end up with Optimize, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just a few words on how you can get better data at lower cost. Some are, again, super simple, but you know, I cannot share any secret things with you, so you can read it yourself in the health center. Uh, but uh, referring to what I said before, so don't send everything to Google Analytics, because if you're sending super cardinal, uh, super high cardinality data, like, oh, we've got user ID feature, but we really like to have user ID in our custom dimension, uh, so we'll be sending that. Or, yeah, we've got client ID in, in BigQuery, um, but we want, we've always been sending that in custom dimension, and we're just mapping our migration, mapping the implementation from Universal Analytics to G4, so we'll be sending that in a custom dimension, like, you know, migration one-to-one, -one, and you will end up with other rows in reports, because even if you're not surfacing, if you're not selecting this card, high cardinality dimensions in your reports, it's in the back end and um, it affects the tables and the data um, that you um, show in your reports. So this will increase the cardinality feature uh, issue. <laughs> not a feature yet. Um, you use predefined uh, dimensions for um, like user ID, client ID, uh, for data collection. Um, and if you really need uh, high cardinality that's dimensions, that's fine. But uh, again, please consider uh, the scope of data that you're collecting. Um, for uh, 360 clients, uh, there's a feature, advanced feature available. Uh, right now it's automated data sets, expanded data, and uh, this feature uh, will allow you to see all data, so we've not, no, we've, uh, this should reduce or remove at all the, the other row, um, but only in the uh, reports that are heavily used by the users. I cannot tell you what this means. There is a number behind, but you know. Um, uh, 
and uh, there will be a feature, this feature on a roadmap that you can toggle on the expanded data set. So then you will be able to uh, enable it uh, yourself. And yeah, you can use data from BigQuery, just um, not every information is available in BigQuery. Um, so I told you that you, can, you don't have to send everything to Google Analytics, but you can also not be sending everything to BigQuery. So if uh, all accounts, even the free accounts, have the uh, native integration with BigQuery, but you can exclude events that you don't, have, that you don't need in BigQuery. So uh, one of my clients actually excluded session start. They said, okay, it's automatically collected and we don't need it in BigQuery, so we're removing it. And this can decrease the cost of querying the data set um, and um, yeah, maybe there's, there, there are other events that you don't really need there, but uh, you, you'd like to have them in the standard reports. And a few words on how to optimize querying um, the BigQuery data set. Uh, so the feedback that we've got from the clients is that the costs of using BigQuery for the G4 data set um, increased like four, five, 10, 14 times compared to universal analytics. That's what I said before. It was cheap and easy to collect everything. And every, uh, how queries were created in the companies, how queries in, in, for, for the GA data was created. Like every new person that came to the company queried the BigQuery themselves. So there were multiple queries using the same data again and again, querying the whole set, um, yeah, using wildcard, whatever, it's cheap. Who cares? Um, so there was no governance. The word, I, I heard this word several times today, so there was no governance uh, over that. So now they're um, recreating dashboards, recreating uh, the approach to, to using the data. So a few words on the recommendations. So review the data that you really need in BigQuery and uh, the data that you really need out of BigQuery, I mean, as an output of the query. Flatten the table for complex jobs. Do not query um, the original table every time you need anything from that, from that because um, you know there are nested values and it's really much cheaper if you flatten the table first and then start querying, especially if you have a querying plan or any governance over that. Uh, about wildcard, uh, because if, if you don't have it, BigQuery will cache the, um, the data if you're using wildcards, like for dates or whatever, uh, it will not use that. So the costs, again, it will increase. And try approximation methods. Uh, there's a link that you cannot click, obviously. I will not share the deck, uh, but you can easily find that. Uh, I like the name, it's hyperloglog++. So I highly encourage you to use that. It, it uses less uh, memory and it costs less to use that. It's pretty accurate and uh, there's a, a help center article. All right, so ooh, a quick sum up. Reduce, control, optimize. Reduce by design, control data flow and optimize for volume. Yeah, <laughs> and we're getting there for you know, being better than universal analytics, but in the meantime, and that now will be the, my favorite. Thank you. I get excited, so if I swear a lot, it's because I'm in a good mood. Um, I hope that's okay. Also, um, I mean, those of you that have been here before, as, as you just heard, I've been here a lot, so I will try to not make it too implicit. Um, I, I, I always speak from the, from the perspective of trying to share what I'm thinking. So I have n absolutely no ambition of giving you any answers. If you're here for answers, you should go out in the bar and get drunk. <laughs> I'm here for questions, because this is what I thrive on, and I think it's inspiring when I listen to a talk to hear what other people are thinking, and then discuss it afterwards. So that's what I'm trying to do with this half hour. I'm just going to try and ins inspire all of us for a conversation afterwards on what data should be. Um, if it's your first time, also know that I actually don't work in analytics anymore. I did for 15 years, but I kind of got to the point a few years ago where I had to do something else. So I left and did something else, and I thought I had gotten away from data, <laughs> and I did blockchain. 
And I know that's a no-go word. And I realized afterwards, ah, fuck, man, this is also data. <laughs> it's just data in another wrapping. So, so the talk is from the perspective of being a little bit outside of where I, where I was for 15 years, looking in, and then taking a little bit of what I've learned over in that little box and applied over in this little box of analytics and, and data. And with that, I hope I can inspire. So far, so good? Cool. So let's, uh, hey! I know, I, oh, come on, I'm the first person after coffee break. <laughs> I hope we, I can get you awake again. So, yeah, here's a quick summary. Um, I don't know what's interesting. I'm from up north, but now I live in the middle, uh, in the mountains, uh, and really enjoy it. So if my English became a little bit Germanized, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's because of nearly 10 years now in, in Switzerland. Um, and I mean, I've been doing this since the, since the Middle Ages or something. <laughs> so yeah, that's something we can talk about in the bar. Let's, uh, let's dive in. And this stuff, you know, is about absolutely zero way of coming to me afterwards and say, I tried it and it didn't work and, you know, forget about it. <laughs> okay. Um, also, what I really don't want to talk about is anything related to any kind of product. I think other people could do that much better than I can. Um, I will really try and avoid any kind of jargon. And as I said in my opening, I have no answers. I have only questions. Um, so, I thought we should start with the conclusion. Again, then you can always go to the bar <laughs> if it's boring. Um, first of all, I'm an economist. The first thing you learn when you study economics is not about money, it's about utility. What is utility? It's the amount of benefit you get from doing something, right? <laughs> you can trade utility, you can swap it, you can maximize it, um, but it has no economic value. It has a perceived value, and the point of that is that you cannot actually compare it between people, because one person can have more utility from doing something than another person doing the same thing, which is kind of interesting. But what I've realized over this long period is that we should actually look at data as non-fungible objects of value. What does that mean? It means that every little piece of data that we normally just stream or aggregate could actually be treated as an object with attributes, and we could put it in a taxonomy so that it can be used, and I'll get back to that, um, and then we could assign value to it. Number two, I really think that one of the areas where we are not good yet in the analytics um, use of data is that we <clears throat> excuse me, implicitly trust the data that we see. Why is it that we're not taking tools that we would use in many other parts of where data is created and use them in analytics to make sure that we can trust the data? Why, why are we not making sure that that stream of data that goes into whatever tool has been streamed in a way where it could not be manipulated? That the sales figures are the actual sales figures. That the marketing data is the actual marketing data. And I mean, especially if you get to a point where you start sharing that data between multiple parties, all parties should be able to trust that that data is correct. So trust should be decentralized, because every time we centralize something, there's a risk that that party can do something with the data. Decentralization is a very simple way to increase the chance that you can trust it. And then, and maybe the most important point for me is that control over the data should be delegated. We, as users or entities, should not accept that the, the control of data is in the hands of others. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right to be forgotten on the GDPR. Yes, you can ask someone to delete the data, and then you have to believe that they actually do it. Wouldn't it be much better if I was able to cancel that key, stop that key, retract my permission to use the data by basically disabling a key that I had generated, and that way, I didn't have to trust someone else to stop using the data. I would know that they could not use the data anymore. 
So I think what's missing, and I'll come back to a point about why I think it's important, we need something that creates a taxonomy around these data objects. Because if we don't have it, we cannot really take it from over here and use it over here. If you've listened to the talks over the last couple of years, you've seen a couple of talks that started to sort of slowly go in this direction and say, you know, if we put data into pods, personal data objects, or other places in a structured way that we could, again, have a taxonomy for, the data would be much more valuable because it could be reused and shared easily. So, I also like to look back a little bit. I mean, this is already <laughs> a long time ago. I, 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 you know that feeling when you're just in a stream of thought and you just put that something down really fast and quick? I, I wrote that thing there. And it basically says that we should do these things that I just summarized in those three topics. We should focus on how data plays a role between people and brands. This is why we're having this conversation in this conference, an analytics conference where we look at marketing data primarily, right? And we talk about how we can use marketing data to drive a better conversation between users and brands. There are many, 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 many other use cases, but that's the most common one, I think, in this room, right? Understand all that stuff. What is the aspiration of that person? Do they have a situational behavior that's different from their normal behavior? We should be able to do that, but it requires that we have the granular full data sets. There's no way we can have those if we don't do this stuff, because otherwise it will always be in silos that are discrete. And yes, we can do some modeling on how that silo inf has influence over that silo or that silo. But to really do it, we should have a much more coherent data set. So what did the manifesto suggest? That people can be represented by a piece of data. And I've seen many words used for it. I tried to summarize it here as graphs or vectors or even avatars. Um, and on the other side of that equation, I think the key point for me now is that brands can't really trust third parties, vendors, to do this for them. In, uh, in the blockchain space, we, in DeFi, we talk a lot about rented liquidity. That you pay people for lending out funds as liquidity that are necessary to get DeFi to run. <coughs> if you take that and push it into an analytics document, it would be that brands need to stop renting audiences from third party vendors. Why? Because they're paying a tax every year to reach the same people that they talked to last year. Through cookies, right? We're buying audiences. Those audiences contain the same people year after year after year. That is rendered audience access. It is totally ridiculous for anybody that you already had a dialogue with. So I think we are moving towards something where brands will be much stronger and better and this is what our roles are as analytics people, building something that gives them zero-party data, data that they own, data that is in direct contact with the users. So I saw, this is not the exact quote, you can ask ChatGPT and find the correct quote, but <laughs> marketing is a tax collected by relevant brands from unengaged consumers. Right? <laughs> Why is it that a lot of the brands that we know and we all buy spend roughly 50% of what we pay for, for that product on marketing? So it's a tax on convincing ourselves to buy the freaking product. It's kind of ridiculous. So I think we're getting there, but slowly. And I wanted to show some thoughts about what we can do. I highlighted private here. Why? Because, I mean, <laughs> Aurelie left the room, right? So, <laughs> that, no, that's good because then I can speak more freely. <laughs> I was fighting with Aurelie for many years. 
because I was over on the other extreme where I said, let's just do you know, Cambridge Analytica stuff. Let's just model everything about everybody. And then I realized, hey, wait a second. Maybe it would be nice if I had control over that myself. And I turned around and I realized, okay, we actually have to build something where we have control. And I don't think anybody would like to live in, in a part of the world where you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of cameras already monitor what I do and give me a social score that decides whether I can go to a certain school or not, I get a certain job or not. This is reality in parts of the world today, right? Is that a good thing? Please? It's not really the data that's making that decision, right? No, it's an AI. It's a mo <laughs> And you already, so the point, that, the point is that it's actually not a human being evil, it's a machine being, I don't know, able to have powers <laughs> to make that happen, right? And that being accepted. You actually, uh, you're foreseeing a point I wanted to make in the conclusion, which is that we are getting to a point where these data objects, so I'll tell it now because it fits with your question, um, these data objects should be able to talk to each other. That's where we're headed, right? We're headed to a place where we will be represented by objects of data, and those objects of data, we should be able to choose whether they can talk to other objects of data or other services, and then conclusions would happen from that. But I think we have a very good example here where we should be able to withdraw from that and say, no, I don't want to enter my data into that. There was another question, please. Yeah. Um, every machine that collects data is programmed by someone. So someone took a decision or a rule to collect the data. And I think we should be aware of that. It's a fair point up until now. But I think for me, the scary part is that now machines are starting to write code. I know that's fine. But still, there is a decision that someone starts it. Yes. And, decides on it. and, keeps, it and keeps it running. Keeps it running. Yes. So let's not dive into that rabbit hole. But you are right. It's a good point. Yeah. Okay, um, so as I already, again, opened with, I, I really want us to start thinking of data objects or data pieces as something that carries an amount of value. And we shouldn't just give that away. I mean, you've all seen this, right? What is the average value of the data that Google collects from one user per year? I think I've seen $200 estimated. So we are giving Google $200 worth of data every year in exchange for the free use of Gmail, essentially. Is that a good deal for us? Maybe, maybe not. I'm just arguing that we should be aware of that. And the bottom line is, but I already have control. We have GDPR. I can't withdraw my consent. I can't ask to be forgotten. Yeah, except there's something called inferred data. And what is inferred data? It's basically, okay, we have the data for all these people in the room, and with that data, we have a very good ability to predict how Zolly will behave, who's not in the room, without Zolly's data. That's inferred data. So I can withdraw my consent, but I cannot withdraw something that would stop that model from being very good at predicting the behavior, even without my data. The Cambridge Analytica case was interesting because it said, you know, the average person's Block, uh, sorry, um, Facebook data, what was it, a couple of hundred people, gave the model a better ability to predict a single person's behavior than the data coming from that single person. The, the cluster that you're in is a better data set for predicting behavior than your own data is. And one of the points I want to get to is, this is where we need to distinguish between data types. Because some data is static. Once it's shared, it's shared forever. Other data pieces are, sta uh, are sorry, variable over time, temporary. And my preferences, for example, would change over time. So the right to be forgotten, sorry, I really think needs an update. I think we really need actually an update to GDPR because it was written at a time where inferred data was not as powerful as it is now. So yeah, we can ask to be forgotten, but it has absolutely no effect in reality. Okay, so let's dive into that. 
that I just talked about. I made this little thing here with examples. Explicitly stated data, something like my national ID, or I put email under dynamic because you know I can change my email address. That's fairly straightforward. Um, I've seen many times the argument that you know mobile phone number, for example, is a better identifier than email for finding unique users because people have less phone numbers than the number of email addresses that they use. Um, implicit could be location. And inferred could be purchase intent based on my behavior, for example. Explicit could be blood type, right? Doesn't change. Once I share that information, I cannot retract it. That vendor, that entity would know my blood type. Even if I say, oh, you should forget that. Yeah, sure, but they have trained the model already, so that's not really relevant. Right? Okay, so this is a little bit of a super high level attempt at saying here's some categorization principle that we could use for data types. And why should we do that? I think I hinted that already because we have this crazy system where this is necessary for these to talk to me. And those that have seen my talks for over the last couple of years, I've argued this very strongly for a while now that this should be much more of a direct conversation, right, with these principles used. So you get the point, right? With explicit data, I can withdraw my consent, but it's kind of too late. A, I have to trust that it actually gets deleted, and B, it has very little effect if they already trained a model using that data set. They don't need the actual data set anymore. Okay. And on the other side, again, the implicit data and the inferred data, yeah, that's where the power, really, I think the power is, and I think this is where we see a lot of development, right? That these models get stronger and stronger and stronger at, at figuring out insights that we are not, maybe not even aware of ourselves. Predicting the risk of getting disease, right? Longevity, health, all that stuff from inferred data. So, as I said, I think we need something better. I think we need a new GDPR. All right? But it goes much deeper than this. Because what's happening over on the other side, as I said, if data becomes objects of value that we could transact around and say, you know, in exchange for sharing my data, I get compensated, not just with the use of a free tool, but maybe with a discount on the product, for example. What's that called? That's called cashback or coupons or member clubs, all that stuff. One of the problems is that money used to be anonymous. It used to be so that I could transact without sharing my data. I could walk anonymously into a store, buy a product with cash, and walk out again. That's more, more or less impossible now, right? Have you looked at your purchase history in, 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 in Google? They generate a freaking graph of everything you buy where you receive a receipt into your Gmail. Funny enough, there's no API for extracting that data. <laughs> I wonder why. This is a problem, I think. I think it's a problem. I think we've been lured into something that's not good for us, necessarily. The transactional history is known, and it's even worse if we start paying with, with, uh, with crypto or with tokens that can be traced completely. You can see the entire history of everything that wallet did. So now, in that scenario, I'm not just sharing information with the firm I'm buying from about that transaction, if I did that. I'm sharing information about everything I did from that wallet with that entity. And I'm giving them really valuable information about my shopping behaviors, money flows, and I'm sharing it with intermediaries. So what should we do? We should take ownership of data as users, as people, and as brands. It's the same thing, zero-party data. We should start to think about transacting the data, compensating for it, 
and we need to create much stronger data control mechanisms. So that takes trust, control, and then insights from the data. So a couple of quick ones because, again, time is running and I want to have time for questions. Um, this is not something I want to dive into in the talk, but this is how decentralization of trust works. You can look into that afterwards. Um, what are we gaining from doing that? I was lazy, so I wrote the headlines and then I got ChatGPT to write the text for me because I wanted to test how good it is at it. So you can judge my slide from basically telling me after the talk if you think it was good at it or not. Decentralization means a better way of trusting. That means data cannot be tampered with, as I've talked about. It helps us have real-time data capture. I mean, there are other ways to do that. We can stream data into data warehouses. Um, so that's maybe not the strong, the strong argument. But interoperability is a synonym for taxonomy in my world. This is what I mean with a taxonomy. It means it's possible to create a way where data can be shared. And with privacy and encryption, et cetera, we can make it secure. So that is here. Last year, I dived into how key pairs work. So I thought I would assume that you knew that already, or you can watch the talk from last year. But it gives us this. It gives us access control. It gives us control of the sharing. And it allows us to authenticate that. And I think that's a really key point here. I mean, these are fairly simple and basic, but this is the key. It means. I can authenticate it with what's called a self-sovereign ID. And I think you're seeing an explosion of that where IDs get disintermediated from vendors. What do I mean with that? IDs used to be something you got as part of a sign-up process. Right? You, you, you create a Google account for Gmail. You, in a way, get assigned an ID that allow you to authenticate with Google for, for use with your Gmail. And then later on, they added more services, and they just locked us in so we never think about it, that we actually authenticate with that ID every time we use Maps or any other service. I think what we'll see is that we'll see that move away from the service provider, so it's a self-standing ID that I can choose to use to authenticate. Plus, it's a weak ID because it's not been checked that I am that person. I can create a random name Google ID, right? So with a digital signature, someone probably checked that I am actually that person. And therefore, when I authenticate something with that signature, it's much more powerful. <clears throat> so again, in headlines, I dived in last year. You can see the deep, the deep explanations there. We have two innovations that have happened in the last couple of years that really change how we can think in analytics. One is what's called ZK Schnack, which is basically an ability to prove if something is right or wrong without sharing the actual information. So the good example could be if you have a site that requires people to be a certain age, you can actually get them to prove that they have a certain age without revealing their actual age. The proof would just say, yes, you are above that age, but you haven't stated your actual age. And it's mind-bending when you start to dive into the full understanding of what that allows us to do. And then the other one is uh, homomorphic encryption, which is, I think, really powerful used on analytics data. What it means is that we can manipulate data, again, without revealing the actual data. We can manipulate on top of encrypted data. We can do calculations on encrypted data. What it means essentially is that I could be a brand and I could have a huge cube of data. I could share that data with a third party while it's still encrypted. The third party could do some really sophisticated data science on my data set, but not see the actual data. I'm not sharing the PII. I'm not sharing my sales data per product or something like that. I'm sharing a piece of data that they can do sophisticated data analysis on while encrypted. That's homomorphic encryption. 
Yes, please. Do we have the mic? Sorry. Is it on? Is it on? Thanks. Um, if the data is encrypted, doesn't that pose challenges, especially when context <laughs> is super important when it comes to analysis? John, it's not the answer to everything at all. Okay. <laughs> but in some cases, I'm sure we've all run into those examples where they say, this data, we cannot share it. There's no way this data leaves this house right, or this entity. I think that's the good example, where, where we can do stuff that we couldn't do before because we can allow it to be pushed outside. But definitely not for everything. Uh, here's a schematic of how it works. Basically what I just outlined. Someone over here could create keys, choose to share it with someone over here, get some results back, and then the keys could be killed. <coughs> All right, um, short on time, so let's get to conclusions. <coughs> so far, so good? Hooray! Hey, let's do some conclusions. So I've talked about decentralization as a means to create trust, interoperability as a mechanism to kill the silos, if you go way back in the history of Super Week, you can find a talk I did many years ago called Kill the Silos. I actually bought killthesilos.com for that talk. <laughs> yes, I don't think it's live anymore. Interoperability. Privacy, obviously, because we need to protect it and we need to be able to control it and, for example, retract permissions. And tokenization for me is the way to create value around data objects that allow them to be transactional. So, I don't write code anymore, but I geeked out a little bit and thought it was fun to say, if data is utility, then data objects can be transacted. If not, data and data holders will just reap all the benefits. Why? Only transact manually. What if, to your point from before, what if we wanted to share these objects in a way where they could start to talk to other <laughs> objects and we could create intermediary objects that could talk to other objects? I know that's abstract but it's really fun to dive into that rabbit hole. So what we need is event level encrypted and objectified data streams split so that we have control over the keys, can go on a blockchain. We cannot store the actual data on a chain because we would never be able to comply with data minimization principles that require data to be destructed when someone wants it. Therefore, we have to split it and say we put the keys or the hashed value or something like that on chain and we put everything else in a decentralized data storage. That's the control layer. And then a transactional layer that allow micro value to be transacted. So I want to do this. This is just my little geek out <laughs> end slide. Let's do something that combines identity with personal information, protected by privacy and secure, with standardization, with transparency, with consent management, and with a mechanism to say that it's accurate. So we could even create you know, a meter layer of data where we say this is the data stream, but over here we have another stream on chain that proves that this data stream was to be trusted. It's a little bit like GTM tracking itself with GA, right? Every time someone loads a GTM container, I'm pretty sure Google runs a GA profile to understand that GTM was invoked. I don't know if that analogy works, but I like it. Thank you.